pursuit of profits remains a daunting task for investors. Markets are caught in a perfect storm of lingering inflation, recession fears, and preparing for the next move from the Federal Reserve. We are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. The collapse of U.S. regional banks and the fall of European lenders raising alarms about the stability of financial systems. The uncertainty about the economy is the greatest that I can remember. Will the summer forecast bring more gloom and volatility, or will we see brighter skies for the global economy and financial markets? As investors look for answers amid the turbulence, we'll analyze and debate where value, growth, protection, and stable returns can be achieved. Bloomberg has convened the biggest names in investing to share unique strategies, expert insight, and crucial data Get ready for vital perspectives from decision makers across global finance, economics, banking, and technology. This is Bloomberg Invest.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Invest. And whether you're joining us here in person or virtually, we are so, so excited to have you today. Now we're here at Bloomberg's world headquarters in Manhattan to bring you conversation with some of the most influential, dynamic, and innovative voices in all of finance. And what a critical time to have all of you here. The Fed officials have raised the central bank's benchmark rate to above 5% just earlier this month and signaled that they're ready to potentially pause the rapid, rapid tightening campaign they started just about a year ago. And at the same time, investors are sitting here waiting to see if there's another shoe to drop after a wave of bank failures and issues in markets from the US to the UK and abroad. Over the next two days, we'll explore how investors can rethink their strategies across all different asset classes, and we'll dive deeper into challenges and opportunities that all of those asset classes possess. Now, let's just take a, take a quick look while we're talking about markets at equity indices. We're looking at a fairly green day on a year where that's mostly up in the S&P, and people are thinking about what this means for not just the United States, but across the globe. Very little red on the screen today. But again, this is all as we are waiting to see if there is a further leg down in a recession. And before we get started, we want to get started with a couple of announcements. First, we want to acknowledge our US presenting sponsor, that is Invesco QQQ. Our presenting sponsors, Allspring Global Investments, Neom, Principal Asset Management, and our participating sponsors, Southern Company, the Glenthro Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. <laughs> we can grab one later. <laughs> and for our virtual attendees, if you experience any issues with our audio or video quality, try to refresh your browser or use the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screens for support. If you're in the audience with us at Bloomberg today, you will find Wi-Fi information on your badges. And whether you're virtual or in person, we want to hear from you today. So please take out your phones and scan this QR code. We'll be doing live polling throughout the presentations. You can write in questions for our speakers, and we'll do our best to get to them. To access both of these features, you'll scan the QR codes on your screen now, or you can type in on your browser meet.ps slash Bloomberg Invest. We'll flash this throughout the day as well so you can get on top of the opportunity to engage. I'll give you a moment to get to that as we get to our first poll. So scan the QR code again and click the polling icon just at the bottom of the right screen. You'll toggle back and forth between Q&A and polling by just going to the bottom of that screen and clicking on the icons. So now to our poll. This is going to be a recurring theme <laughs> throughout the presentations and it's who is leading the race for the 2024 presidential elections. That's President Biden, Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, or please no, not this again, which is an overwhelming response <laughs> at the moment. Uh, cast your votes now and we'll reveal the results. If you're active on social media and want to follow today's coverage, you can find us under the hashtag Bloomberg Invest. Our handle on Twitter is at Bloomberg Live, on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. And if you have a Bloomberg terminal, look for today's conversations using Live Go. Now, we can take a look at the poll results again. I think you know, we all know where this is headed. <laughs> but we're going to get started now with a large name in finance. We are going to be speaking first to Stanley Druckenmiller. He is the Duquesne Family Office Chairman and CEO. Now we know that Mr. Druckenmiller has had his predictions for a hard landing. We also know that Duquesne has never lost money <laughs> in a single year. So please welcome to the stage Mr. Stanley Druckenmiller. <laughs> Now, I actually want to start with you not with the presidential elections. We'll get there. <laughs> but I do want to start with you on the US debt limit. Because this is something where we're out of the clear on the surface, but you have been very, very clear. You recently revived a presentation you did 10 years ago with students at USC. And you've told them that the economic storm that's brewing from US spending is worse than you had imagined. Uh, I also want to bring up on the screen some of the charts that you showed them, kind of the pace of entitlement spending uh, in the United States. 
I want to ask you, what are the consequences now that we're kind of past the initial pains in Washington? What is the country and the economy and investors, what are they ignoring? Thanks, Shanali. Nice to be here. Um, <clears throat> I don't think the entitlement situation is something you should be trading on in the next three to six months. Um, what I've been focused on actually for over a decade is the long-term picture and the long-term implications. So the last thing you should do is run out of this conference after I say something about entitlements and think there's a trade to be made on it. Uh, that's, not, that's not the situation. Look, I, I need to go back a, a little bit, but um, way back in the 90s, um, somebody sent me a paper outlining how the birth rate in the 50s was so high and it had shrunk and that we we're going to have this demographic storm hit sometime in the 2020s. And you could pretty much map it because the, the demographics are public information. This was on top of the fact that since Medicare and Medicaid joined Social Security as entitlements in the 60s, the senior share of uh, government spending had, had already grown dramatically, say from 30 to 58 percent of outlays during that time. And I was concerned way back then when that sometime in the 2020s, sort of the, like the pig and the python, when, when the baby boomers became seniors, um, already with, with them a high percentage of government spending, your growth of seniors would be dramatic, and by the time I was looking at it, the, the birth rate for the current generation was below two. So you're going to have this huge increase in seniors at the same time that you had a reduction in workers. And the way our system works, you take the taxes of current workers to pay for seniors. Um, it really looked bad to me in around 2011 or 2012, um, so much so that I thought I'd go out and see if I could move the needle on this issue. I was really successful. The only thing Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton agreed on was that you shouldn't touch entitlements. In other words, nobody listened to me. Um, it's, um, it was a tough situation then, and looking out, it was really scary. But when you just use the term worse than I ever imagined, what I didn't know is the next 10 years, um, we were just going to have a pro proliferation of government debt even outside of, uh, outside of entitlements. And then when COVID hit, it was just sort of the cherry on top. It's, it's hard to believe, looking back during those 10 years with interest rates near zero, you had two big economic booms, um, one going into 18 under Donald Trump, supposedly a Republican, uh, supposedly with a party that cared a lot about spending. And with 3.5% unemployment, we had something unprecedented. We had a trillion dollar deficit. Usually when the economy is roaring, tax revenues go up and the deficit shrinks. Um, we then had a post-COVID boom in 2021, um, which was also accompanied by wild um, increases in, in tech and in tech stock prices, so much so that we had capital gains $600 billion above the average capital gains for a year. We sold $100 billion in spectrum sales. Um, we had 10% nominal growth because of inflation. So you might ask yourself, since the last tech boom in 99, under a Democrat administration, by the way, um, we had a surplus. How big was the surplus with all these anomalies in 21? Again, I'm led my own question. We had over a trillion dollar deficit. We didn't even get to less than 5% of GDP. So what I was worried about 10 years ago, you now have an enormous amount of debt on top of it. The zero interest rates kind of suppressed um, what I would say is the concern about this. Obviously, you have a lot of debt. You're not paying any interest on it. Who cares? But now once the inflation hit, interest rates are going to go up. So the punchline, I'm rambling on here more than I wanted to. The punch, the punchline is, if you take the current situation um, and you ask yourself, well, I should actually say something else. The current, the debt went from, say, um, 
20 trillion to 30, I'm sorry, 15 trillion to 31 trillion over that time. That debt, and this is important because most people don't understand it, um, assumes there'll never be another Medicare or Social Security payment made. That's 200 right. trillion is the present value as you've calculated for the students. Not me, credible people, Larry Kotlikoff and others. So if you assume we're never going to have another Social Security or Medicare payment, the, the debt is 31 trillion. But if you did your accounting like any corporation and you assume those payments are going to be made, yeah, the present value is probably around $200 trillion. So, you know, I should also say that the, the big title of this presentation was, is U.S. exceptionalism at risk? Is it? Yeah, I think it is. Um, America is an amazing country with an amazing system. And if you look at the innovation in this country, just look at what's happened since 1980. We led in the, in the PC revolution. Uh, we led the development of the internet. We led the development of cloud. We led the development of mobile. Maybe it's not good that we led in crypto. Who knows? Um, and we're obviously leading in, in generative AI. So we've been the leader throughout, but we've also been the reserve currency. And we've been eating so much seed corn presently that I worry about the future. If, if you were to take, economists have this, only economists could come up with this term, it's called fiscal gap. What is fiscal gap? That's how much you would have to raise taxes today to guarantee the benefits you've promised seniors in the future. It's 7.7% .7 of GDP. What does 7.7% .7 of GDP mean? To actually pay for the entitlements we promise in the future, you'd have to raise all taxes 40% today forever, or cut all spending 36% today forever. So what what I'm looking at here is this stuff is borrowing from the future. You're going to crowd out private investment. You're going to crowd out the kind of investment that made us a leader on all those kind of things. But again, this is a long-term worry. But, but the statement by both parties that entitlements are off the table, it's like 70% of the federal budget and rising. And now that interest rates have come up, it's a fantasy. In fact, it's a lie. We are definitely going to cut entitlements. It's just a matter of we're going to cut them today or in the future. And the longer we wait, the more it piles up. A year or two ago, um, or right now, the interest expense is about 1% or 2% of GDP. It's about 6% of outlays. The CBO's estimate, not mine, interest expense is 27% of outlays by 2050. And just entitlements and interest expense just those two things alone, no defense, no running the government, no money for the disadvantaged, will be 117% of taxes by 2050, and it'll be more than all taxes by 2040. But again, for investors in the room, this is just stuff to worry about in the long term. I like to think in the long term, but for trading, it doesn't impact your, your original question. The way you put it to the students, it's the tsunami that is 10 foot out on the horizon. But you know, the other the other thing here is, you know, it's I think it's pretty safe to say you've been pretty critical of fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, the question here, and I want to put up one more chart on the history of bubbles that you showed the students as well. Because the question I have for you there is do you believe that there are still many shoes to drop as the central bank stays tight? Uh, that's my central case. Uh, um, I deal in the world of, of risk reward. There's a 500 year history of uh, asset bubbles well documented in a book that you had some issues with, The Price of Time. Uh, and basically, it documents, and I had already known this about the last 100 years, but it's going on for 500 years. Every time you've had a significant asset bubble, economic trouble lay ahead. But yeah, when you had 11 years of free money, um, People do stupid things. All you have to do is look it up there. But the stupidest is somebody paid $80 billion for Dogecoin, which was invented as a joke. I mean, that can only happen in the world of free money. It also f suppressed people worrying about the kind of stuff I just talked about two or three minutes ago, because you keep rates at zero. But the fact that 
This was arguably the most disruptive economic period we've had since the late 1800s. And there were no bankruptcies. Apparently, they've started in the last few weeks. Tells me there's a lot of stuff under the hood when you go from this kind of environment, the biggest, broadest asset bubble ever, and then you jack rates up 500 basis points in a year. I think the probabilities would suggest that Silicon Valley banks, Bed Bath & Beyond, they're probably the tip of the iceberg. Nothing's a guarantee. I've been wrong a lot. I've been right a few times. But um, yeah, I, our central case is there's more shoes to drop, particularly in addition to the asset markets economically. What are you most worried about? We'll definitely get to the opportunities and the fat pitches that you see on the horizon. But uh, before we even get there, what starts to sink? Um, I could see corporate profits down 20 to 30 percent. Normally, I would say 40 or 50 in a hard landing. But this recession is so anticipated, I don't think a lot of corporations are going to be caught with their pants down, which is how normally you lose a lot of money as you're not prepared for something that happens. Um, commercial real estate, you know, I'm not informing anybody in this room of something I don't know, but office is a problem. It would have been a problem anyway, but, but change of lifestyle in COVID makes it an even bigger problem. Financing rates going up make it a problem. I'm worried about credit tightening the next six to nine months. Obviously, the banks um, are going into an economic period that if, in fact, we get a recession, their balance sheets are already impaired, not from where they usually lose money, which is loans, um, from the fact that the Fed convinced them that they're going to keep rates to zero until 24. Uh, so they bought a bunch of treasuries yielding 1 or 2%, and now they're carrying them at 5 So, th So their balance sheets are impaired. But if we get in a recession, uh, then the real losses comes, which is stuff like credit cards, commercial real estate, that kind of stuff. So those would be my, my worries. Um, you ask me my worries. That's different than my predictions. I Well, the predictions. You've been talking I about. I am so tired of being a bear and being labeled a bear. <laughs> 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 But to the bearish point of view, we haven't seen it. We have not seen that hard landing yet. And there's going to be many people after you today that are predicting a soft landing. And so to the extent you still believe that a hard landing is ahead of us, when does it come? What does it look like? Do we see it anymore? Yeah. Um, a lot of people, because we haven't had an economic decline start yet, have changed their forecasts from a hard landing to soft landing, and a lot of others have changed it from soft landing to no landing. I haven't changed mine at all. The fact that it hasn't happened yet doesn't change the probability, if it does happen, of the depth of it. I mean, basically, $10 trillion, $5 trillion monetary, $5 trillion fiscal was put in during COVID. What has happened is, that created this giant, giant stock of liquidity. I think Jamie Dimon said a couple years ago there were two and a half trillion excess demand deposits. Um, we've been working that liquidity off slowly. That liquidity interruption, liquidity shrink was interrupted when Bank of Japan uh, changed YCC. They went in and they bought $400 billion worth of bonds to defend their bond market. Very odd situation. They raised rates, but then liquidity exploded on it. And then, obviously, the debt ceiling. Um, Secretary Yellen drew down the TGA, that's basically the Treasury Savings Account, from $700 billion to practically nothing last week. That also ended up in non-issuance of government debt. So that was a big boost to liquidity. All that is set to change now. Um, Actually, the TGA is going to go the other way. She's already stated she wants to build it back up to normal levels. So you're going to have probably about $800 billion in treasuries issued between now and year end. The Fed will be continuing on with QT. You've got the student loan thing, which I think has kept consumption up. That's all changing in September. They're going to have to actually, God forbid, in the United States, somebody actually pays interest on a loan. Um, so. <laughs> To me, the probabilities haven't changed. It's been pushed out relative expectations. But in no way does the fact that it hasn't started yet 
change the probability of whether it's going to be hard or soft. I would actually argue, since it's taken so long, the Fed has ended up with a higher terminal rate. And in fact, inflation gets stickier the longer it stays in the system, that it increases, not decreases, the probability of a hard landing. By the way, after the uh, 87 crash, I was convinced we are going to have depression. So <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've been wrong before. And if I'm wrong on this, I'll, I'll adjust. But I have to weigh the probabilities and do what I do with my process. And right now, that's where we are. And when? Uh, I have been, I think September is the first time when I was sort of a boom, afraid of booming economy inflation guy too. I'm more worried about um, growth than I am about inflation. And originally I was fourth quarter of 23. I temporarily maybe lost my mind or maybe I was right um, when the Silicon Valley thing happened and got anecdotals and stuff that is traditionally led like trucks and retail, move that up to now. I think I'm probably wrong, and I'm going to go back to the end of 23. But the real answer is I don't know. So um, recession or no recession, though, one thing that's interesting, and you included, a lot of people are very encouraged by certain areas of the market, particularly the AI boom. There, and there, there's always stuff to do. We had a hard landing in 74, 75, and chemicals and oils and that stuff did great. I'm sorry, go ahead and answer your question. Well, do you think question. that all of AI makes it through this recession, or do you think that some areas of the market, particularly in AI, start to look like they're in bubble territory? Well, <laughs> all of AI is not going to make it through whether we have a recession or not, because they haven't separated the wheat from the traf chaff yet. But I do believe, um, unlike crypto, I think AI is real. It's probably it could be as transformative as the internet. It, it's a huge thing. And I, I think I've argued publicly that if staples can go up in price in a recession, why can't a company like NVIDIA, if they go up, if they go up, if their orders and earnings go up 70% in a hard landing, which is what I think would probably happen, it's not clear that me that NVIDIA goes down despite the lofty valuation level. History has proved if you do, if you have very good earnings in a recession and they're sustainable, if they're not, the market somehow figures it out, those stocks will do just fine. So um, we have some longs, we have some shorts, and uh, the AIs have sort of dominated the long portfolio for five or six months. How do you think about going short in this market? Uh, our shorts have been fine this year, except my index shorts, which have been a disaster. Um, but we always short the same way. I, I just try and look at the current situation, and then I try and think of a situation 12 to 18 months from now based on my forecast. And I think if I think the security prices are going to be less, um, then I short them. Uh, frankly, I'm not sure I've ever made money if I took back the last 40 years, I'm afraid to look. Um, I've never had a down year, but I'm not sure I've made money in shorts. I like it. It's fun, but uh, you can get your head handed to you. And uh, it's a game that really only professionals, and the math's against you. If you're, if you're dead wrong on a large on a $200 million investment, because I was short 12 stocks, they all went bankrupt, every one of them. Don't try that at home. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to that, to that point, when you look at the AI kind of boom here, are there lessons to be learned from the dot-com bubble? Yeah, uh, there, are lessons, there are definitely lessons to be learned. Don't get emotional. Don't get crazy. But I will, I will say this about the AI. NVIDIA bottomed in October in the low 100s. It's true it's 380 or 390. It's in nosebleed territory. If this is a secular move, if this, is, if this thing is real, you just don't have 10-month moves. That's not how it works. Even the dot-com bubble lasted two, two and a half years. For many, of the, for many of the guts of the internet, it lasted four years, the Cisco's, the Sun Micros. So could NVIDIA go down 
materially in the short term from any point, yes. But I would be, I would be surprised if I'm right on AI and the impact on it. I mean, it's already making the top coders seven to eight times, seven to eight times more productive than they were five months ago. If it's as big as I think it is, um, NVIDIA is something we're going to want to own for at least two or three years, not for 10 months, and maybe longer. Certainly the topic du jour. There's another thing that a lot of investors are talking about. It's the promise of China. This idea, and you know, it's time to get your global view here because so many people rely on you for, for the macro perspective. The view here is that the GDP in China will expand faster than the United States, and a lot of investors are kind of shaking off geopolitical tensions on the back of that theory. Do you see the same promise that the China bulls are seeing? I do not. Um, I was in love with China with a bunch of people that act like crazy New Yorkers, um, building new businesses in a dynamic economy. Um, but he has proved he's not a capitalist. He's definitely not a monopolist. There's only room for one monopolist in China in his mind, that's him. Anybody that gets their heads stuck up. And I honestly think he either, either doesn't understand why China grew and succeeded the way they did, or frankly, he doesn't care because in terms of staying in power. But I would be looking out 10 or 15 years, I just don't see it. I, unless there's a change in power there at the top, uh, I think that's going to be a very undynamic economy. Uh, it's not so much the geopolitical concerns. I will say this, that if I'm right, it makes me more fearful of military action because that's when dictators become more dangerous is when they've got to divert attention from the immediate problem. So what they're doing now is very stimulative. We're expecting a sugar high and some kind of robust growth there maybe for six to nine months. But looking out, I'm, I, don't, I do not look at them as, as a big challenger to the United States in terms of economic power and growth. There's equally been a lot of investor questions about the future of Japan as well. How do you think about the opportunity set and how to invest? <laughs> when I went to Soros, Japan like set me off like a rocket ship because I, I shorted the Nikki at the top and I had everything and then I think every trade I made like five years later on I've lost money in Japan. It's been the biggest value trap in history. But I will say right now I, I haven't check this, but it, it, it's by far been the, the deepest breadth and the best market uh, this year. Yeah, our market's up, I think you said 12%, but it's like seven stocks and everything else is not even up. That's not the case in Japan. The breadth is tremendous there. You have a couple things going on that is stated. So you put all that together, um, for now you have a dynamic market, but given my record trading Japan now uh, the last 15 years, you do the opposite of what I say. <laughs> Back to the United States, I promised you politics. So we're, we're oh gonna God. get there. Uh, you know, because the fiscal will overtake uh, the, the monetary pretty soon as well, especially as we look forward to a 2024 election cycle in the United States. And when you look at the wide range of Republican hopefuls uh, who are either challenging or may challenge Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, Chris Christie, Mike Pence, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, Glenn Youngkin, who has your money and who has your vote? Um, I love Tim Scott. I'd like him to be the next president. Whether he has the name recognition, whether he's too nice a guy for this fight, I don't know. But um, I'm not really into dividers. I'd like to see the country united. And I think um, from that party, he's the one that could probably most accomplish that. Um, I'm kind of excited about Chris Christie taking on Donald Trump. The others kind of like dance around the subject. They don't even use his name. I think somebody needs to hit him in the mouth with the way he hits people in the mouth. And Chris Christie could be very good at that. I was very disappointed the way he handled the 2016 people in the mouth. And Chris Christie could be very good at that. I was very disappointed the way he handled the 2016 thing. Um, for those who don't know it on national television, I said that Donald Trump had the um, economic understanding of a kindergarten of the U.S. economy. 
on national television with John Kasich, and then I came out a year later and said I overestimated his economic standing. So just, <laughs> just, just so you were not, oh, no. But anyway, um, he, he did a great job in Florida, if, if you look at the record. Um, he's very smart. Um, not that broad in terms of the people around him. He'd have to build that going in. Um, but despite his intelligence, it seems like his calculus is to go after the Trump voters. I don't think the Trump voters care about policy. I don't think they can be moved. And by going after the Trump voters, he's alienating the other 30 to 40 percent of the pie, particularly women and others that um, care a lot about the social issues. He's not my, he's not my favorite, but um, frankly, if he ran against Joe Biden, I vote for him enthusiastically. I wonder, you define yourself as an independent as well. Is there anybody in the, and you voted for Democrats in the past, is there anyone in the Democratic Party that excites you? Well, I'd love it if Gina Raimondo would run, but apparently we're going to put an 80-year-old who's going on 100 up on the ticket. I, I don't understand what the Democrats are doing. I voted for two Democrats out of the last five elections. I'm not like some partisan crazy person, but what are they doing? Uh, Kenny is a little nuts, but mark my words, he's going to scare this guy because when people go to the polls, particularly a year from now, because Joe is a moving puck, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if, if Bobby Kennedy doesn't get more support than any of us could imagine. You know, Democrat or Republican, the kind of trajectory you pointed at at the very beginning of this, higher spending no matter what. It, no matter what scenario we're in, in the next couple of years in the United States, do you think investors will be facing much higher taxes? Event, it's either that or, you know, 30 or 40 percent inflation, which I don't think is going to happen. So before I let you go, I know you won't perfectly answer me on this with a lot of specificity. You've been I saying... I didn't know I had any perfect answer. <laughs> Well, what is the fat pitch? You've been saying that you have been kind of cautious when it comes to markets. At what point do you start to get in and you start to have a conviction trade that is much bigger? I think my record is as much knowing not when to play as when to play. And because I deal in five or six different asset classes, I've had the luxury, if there's uncertainty in equities, Usually that's a good time for bonds and currencies are doing crazy things when the world's blowing up, so there's a lot of volatility there. And I, I would love to answer your question, but this is the most complicated, non-roadmap, unanalyzable situation I've ever seen in terms of having a lot of confidence in an economic prediction going forward. So I honestly, and I hate not to answer your question. I honestly don't see a fat pitch right now. What I do think is I don't want to blow my cash and be in, a, be in a horrible mental state being down 8%, making a big bet on something that I didn't have amazing conviction on when I think the roadmap is going to be good. So um, you talked to me about this interview in January. I probably wouldn't have accepted it if I knew that I was going to be as messed up in the head <laughs> as I am right now in June. But uh... So welcome, everyone. And thank you very much, Adina, for spending time with us today. Sure it's a hard act to follow. Yeah, it really was. <laughs> but you can do it. If anybody you can we do can it. We can only can rely on Stan to tell us what's on his mind. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so um, let me start with the most basic thing. I, I actually, as I mentioned to you, looked you up on Wikipedia today. And it said NASDAQ is a uh, securities exchange, which I guess it is, but I think you have a larger vision. Tell me what you see NASDAQ as being today. Sure. Well, NASDAQ is a securities exchange, but that is, and that is our foundation. But today we really are a technology company that serves the global capital markets. So we have our own exchanges, and it's a very technology-driven part of our business. 
Uh, but we also then have really deepened our relationships across corporates, investors, market participants, and other exchanges with technology. So we provide the technology to 130 other exchanges around the world. We serve about 5,000 asset managers and asset owners with insights and intelligence to help them make smart asset allocation decisions. We also provide corporates with a lot of tools that enable them to be better public, public companies. And then we have our anti-financial crime suite that really supports the banks and brokers around the world. So today we've really taken that foundation and really extended and expanded our relationships with our clients um, through technology. So goodness knows tech is the byword right now for just about every company. And a lot of those asset managers and corporates and financial institutions have a fair amount of technology themselves. So what do they do and what do you do? What do you add to what they already are doing or want to do? Right, well, I think that it's really important to recognize that uh, workflows, you know, the world has become a lot more complicated. And therefore, we have to find ways to enable them to do their jobs better, more efficiently, as well as to give them better access to insights to, uh, and that's really a ways to enable them to do their jobs better, more efficiently, as well as to give them better access to insights to, uh, and that's really a data part, a data play. So to have, allow them to have better data, better work performance, what's their management team, you know, how have they done, how do I make sure that I'm, can, I'm able to allocate um, assets into that strategy. So that's called investment, NASDAQ investment. Um, and then on top of that, we then provide those asset owners with portfolio management tools that allow them to manage their portfolios very dynamically. So it's a, it's, that's just one example. I think, as you know, in the anti-fin crime suite, we have a complete end-to-end -end solution to manage fraud and AML detection, investigation, and reporting for banks. And then, of course, within the exchange business, we provide our core technology to exchanges all over the world. Yeah, and I want to get to the financial crimes issue because it's a very big issue that you're, you're very active in. But before that, uh, how much of what you're providing, NASDAQ is providing, is, if I can put it this way, the pipeline, the connectivity, and how much of it is the add-on the, of the analytics? Well, I think certainly within the exchange business itself, it's connectivity and then, of course, the interaction of those orders within our exchange business. Within our workflow tools and analytics tools, it's a lot of intelligence. So it's really what we do with certainly both with NASDAQ Investment and with Verifin is they're both cloud-based tools. We pool data together across thousands of institutions, and we then are able to run very, very advanced algorithms and analytics on, on them, both for asset allocation decisions in one, one use case, and then for anti-financial crime management. And so we are very tech forward it's all very modern technology, and we are now running AI algorithms. I'm really focused on that in our anti-financial crime suite and starting to figure out how to leverage that over in our other, in our other businesses as well. Because I think a lot of financial institutions have invested an awful lot in technology, particularly the big money center banks. How much of your business is with some of the smaller banks and financial institutions as opposed to the big guys who do it in-house? Well, I, actually, more and more of the big banks are looking for outside technology partners, which obviously accrues to our benefit. But, but with, with Verifin, we started, and that's our anti-financial crime technology, we started with the smallest banks, actually. You know, in a way, you have to fold than others is that they then pooled the data. So instead of just looking at that one bank's transactions, they pull that data into 25, a pool of 2,500 banks now, where they're able to look at you know, patterns of behavior across all of the banks. I mean, criminals don't just bank in one bank. So mm -hmm. they leave little data crumbs across the system, and Verifin is, we think, the best in the world in being able to root out those criminals through their algorithms. We now are going up to the largest banks. So the largest banks have used traditional on-prem technology solutions from outside firms, or they've built their own capabilities, but they're realizing that the problem is becoming more and more complex. And again, criminals don't just bank with them. So if they're able to leverage the data that we have and leverage the workflow tools we have, they'll be more effective. So we now, we signed our first tier one bank um, last quarter, and we're running a lot of POCs where we can show the benefit of this, um, this technology across those tier ones. And we're getting more, more squarely into the tier two banks now. We can't have a discussion about technology without talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, and it's been around for a while, actually, but certainly since chat GPT, really a great marketing move, by the way. Yes, it is. Uh, open AI. But we all talk about it. Uh, tell me what you're doing right now in terms of the modernization of the markets uh, with AI already, and where do you see it going? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we have been leveraging AI within NASDAQ. Um, Verifin has been using it for several years. And there it's really kind of advanced algorithms, self-learning algorithms, getting smarter and smarter and identifying patterns of behavior. Um, and so we're able to learn from them as to how they've been able to integrate that into their product suite and into their product development suite to make it so it's more effective. 
at NASDAQ, we actually um, are asking the SEC to approve our first AI-driven order type um, within NASDAQ. And, and a big part of that is um, we have billions and billions of messages that flow through our systems every day. Uh, about you know anywhere from I would say 60 to 80 billion messages a day. So it is we have a, a big data pool, and what we're trying to do is structure order types that give institutional investors better fill rates. So we have a certain kind of order type called a, a midpoint extended life order, little 175 different characteristics of the market to try to identify what is the right timer each stock by stock, and it updates every 30 seconds. Um, so it's a good kind of self-learning tool for the market um, to create a better experience for our investors. You know, we'll see, um, you know, that's just the first foray. But a big part of our, our strategy also is bringing our markets to the cloud. And that's a foundation, because the more you can put your, your capabilities into a more scalable, more resilient kind of infrastructure, and the more you can use their tooling, the, more, the smarter we can get with our technology. Tell us about that SEC approval that you're seeking, uh, because one of the issues, a lot of excitement about AI, some trepidation, but one of the issues is, is it right? Because we hear all these anecdotes about really wonderful things that are just flat wrong coming right. out of a generative AI. Uh, what does the SEC put you through to make sure what you're using gets it right? Because in financial transactions, you got to be right. Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, with an order type that what I just described, we're able to de demonstrate what all the inputs, how all the inputs generate an output, right? It's a self-learning mechanism, but it's a very defined package, you know, of, uh, of AI algorithms. So we are able to show explainability of the model. And I think that's going to be a, a core underpinning of early AI implementation in the markets. However, you know, when it comes to anti-financial crime, I think that's where we have to unlock the potential and more advanced that may not be com totally explainable, but get them to an outcome that they're looking for to take advantage of the system. I think that the, the banks and brokers, they have to be able to leverage those same tools to combat those criminals. And so we are asking regulators to think more broadly about how to leverage the next generation of AI, which is not as easily explainable to be able to um, find patterns of behavior and root out criminal behavior. So we're hopeful that they can kind of look at use case specific problem for, for the world economy. It's also, a, you know, and very frankly, the banks are being put on the front lines to combat this problem. And yet, so they have to have the best tooling available to, to do that. I think what we're, what we're challenging the regulators to think about is, number one, as I said, you know, criminals don't just bank in one bank. In the United States, we're allowed to pool data into a third party kind of container to allow for banks to pool the data to look for criminal behavior across the system. But in Europe, that is not allowed. Um, in Canada, that's, that's just starting to be allowed. I mean, and, and so therefore, they're really hamstrung and they can only look at their own transactions to try to find criminals. I think that's number one. Number two, putting more AI algorithms and, and kind of unleashing the power of the next-gen technology to find those patterns of behavior so you can root out the criminals is number two. And then number three is a feedback loop. You know, regulators receive probably millions of what they call SARS reports, which are suspected, um, suspect, you know, su suspicion of criminal activity by the banks, but they don't ever tell the bank, yes, this was in fact a criminal act or not. If we had that, that feedback loop back from the regulators, we could then make the algorithms either even smarter. We could say, oh, we've got validation that this was a real criminal act, so let's make sure that we can use that to kind of be smarter with the next, the next SARS report. So that gives me a good sense of where we are today. Where are we going? Start with Europe, first of all. Is there a real movement toward allowing some consortium data sharing to get past that problem you described? Yeah, and it's, that's the way to say it, it's consortium data sharing. And the answer is that there are some rules being proposed to allow for banks to start to share data within the EU and within the UK. Um, so I think that that's a, a really important development. And of course, you know, there are privacy concerns, but the fact is that there are new technologies that today that where you can take that data in and encrypt it in a way that makes it so that you're only using the data that you need to find the right, you know, that specific type of behavior. You're not having to expose PII from bank to bank in any way. You're, you're basically maintaining the, the integrity of the privacy while still being able to leverage the right amount of data in an encrypted fashion to root out the criminals. So if that's Europe, come back. Reports of, of activity without that feedback loop back to say, um, this is real, this is not. Because the more that we can tune the engine, the better we can tune it, 
the better, more effective we're going to be. And a big part of it is reducing false positives, mm -hmm. right? The banks have to have an army of people to look at every single you know, pattern that is suspected, and then they, they have all these false positives they have to walk through. The great thing about Verifin is that we're able to reduce false positives by 25 to 50 percent within the banks because of the use of the consortium data and the, algor and the AI algorithms. But now, even still, if we had even more of a feedback loop, we can make them even more efficient. I mean, it is a very, un unfortunately, it's still a very inefficient process. You describe what the SEC is putting you through to get approval of your AI in a very different part of the forest. Right. Uh, how does that apply to financial crimes? Are you going to have to go through a similar process, and does it work as well? It's not quite as specific about inputs and outputs. Yeah, so I would say that with regard to um, anti it's a different regulator. So it's kind of the OCC, the Fed, and others. And they actually require the banks to have complete explainability of their models. So, or does they, that work? That's an expectation that they have. We have, to, we have to prove to the banks, they do diligence on us. We have to prove to them that we can prove expl explainability in order for them to feel comfortable using our system. Um, and that's why I think we, we want to engage with the regulators to say, what's the next generation of AI going to do that's going to make it even more effective? It's not totally explainable. But you understand that we're not using it. We're using it for the right purpose. And so, changing the regulatory, um, I would say, process around the use of AI is going to be an important next step for every industry, and certainly for the financial industry. We are a data-driven industry. We are probably the most data, one, well, one of the most data-driven industries in the world. We're also kind of on the front lines of technology in many, many regards. So if they can work with us to kind of figure out how to use these the right, you know, the technology the right way, I think it could become a blueprint for other industries. As you seek ways to help financial institutions, other customers get their work done, part of that work right now has to do with ESG. Uh, Navigate the public markets more effectively and, and efficiently. So we've actually built, um, uh, we bought two small companies that have built these tools to help with ESG generalized reporting, put it in one container, and then we map it to all the taxonomies and all the rating agencies that are out there. Um, and, and also one that's very focused on environmental. So we have one that's more general, one that's focused on environmental, and all of the sustainability metrics that um, companies need to put forth. We think that that makes it so that they can be more efficient and effective. And then we actually have an advisory team that helps them figure out how to communicate the right way with investors to make it so investors can give them the credit that they're, that they're owed for the programs they have. Um, so we're not trying to take a stand on it. We're just trying to make it so that corporates can navigate it more effectively. And, and actually, it's one of the, it is the fastest growing tool within our corporate division within NASDAQ, you know, the corp, serving corporates, um, because they have such a need for it. One last one. Uh, we've talked about how you are, NASDAQ is more than simply a stock exchange. So, but you, you still are an exchange. We are, yes. Uh, and, and you are an exchange for regulated securities. There's some news recently about regulated securities exchanges involving Coinbase. Coinbase, ironically, is actually listed on NASDAQ. Yes, they are. As one of your stocks. Uh, when something like this comes up, when there's an allegation that, in fact, they are illegally trading in regulated securities, what do you do? What does NASDAQ do with a listed company like that where you have the SEC going after them? Yeah, well, first of all, the way that you have to think about the process to go public, I think, is probably a good starting point, which is when a company chooses to go public, they, they submit an enormous amount of information to the SEC. They think about you know, their business model, their financials, and their risk factors, and all the risks and disclosures that investors need. The SEC then goes back and forth a series of questions, and once they approve it, then the exchanges are allowed to evaluate it. And the way that we evaluate it is on the basis of very discrete listing standards, as well as governance standards. And we do kind of do a governance. Very discrete listing standards, as well as governance standards. And we do kind of do a governance overlay. Do they have proper independence? Do they have, you know, is the board composition appropriate for? Take a look at it now, given the fact you're on notice. Um, we would actually work with FINRA and the SEC. So it's a very collaborative relationship across FINRA and the SEC in that context. OK, Adina, thank you so much. Really great to have you. That's Adina Friedman. She's the chair and CEO of NASDAQ. Thank you. <clears throat> Did you choose that walk-in music? Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's my theme. <laughs> uh, great to see you. Nice to see you, Jason. Uh, this is a great crowd that we have uh, here to, to listen to what you have to say. I love talking to you in these contexts because you are experienced, 
relentlessly curious and so well connected. And part of it stems from your network of people, but also I, I think it's fair to say you're sort of now not the CEO, but you were for a long time the CEO of CEOs. You have this portfolio of companies and they give you great insights in, into what's happening in the world. So I want to start there. What does the world feel like right now to you as an investor? Is, it's a tale of two worlds in a way. The goods sector is slowing down. Inflation starting to affect a lot of companies not able to pass on the, um, uh, the cost as easily as they had in the past. And then you got the services side. And the services side is doing exceptionally well. Travel, leisure, et cetera. And that's doing uh, very well. And I don't see right now any side. And the service society is great from 25 to <coughs> 50 year olds has actually picked up. And I think it's over 82, 83 percent now. And that's, that's quite good. Uh, the 50 and over, 55 and over has really declined. And it's in the 30s, uh, like 38 percent. So you're going to have a tighter labor market for longer, in my view. That's tough. Secondly, you have uh, inflation should stay up because of the energy uh, transition. CapEx, enormous amount of money being put into that. I think that will keep inflation up as well. And then, of course, geopolitical tensions. Our companies, and we have at any one time more or less 200 different companies around the world, they're seeing a lot of the same thing. It's business is not terrible. Uh, revenues are up double digit. Earnings are up high single digit right now in, in general. And, uh, you know, we expect that to continue as long as we manage uh, the, the cost side. And so when you talk to these CEOs, are they nervous, excited, cautious? How would you characterize them generally? Well, I don't know how you get very excited about inflation running <laughs> where it is but, and a slowdown in the economy. But having said that, um, yes, right now I'd say they're cautious. Yeah. And they're cautious on CapEx. They're cautious on expansion. Uh, supply chain has gotten better, but it's still not perfect yet. You still have issues uh, with, with China, and a lot of our companies uh, have uh, used China as a supply uh, base. And so, uh, yeah, we're just being cautious. And I think that's the right thing to do right now. Also being cautious on over leveraging any company uh, where we can uh, try to uh, push out uh, the uh, maturities, et cetera. And I would imagine that leads to a decidedly not robust deal-making market. Is that fair to say? Pretty quiet. You know, if you think about it, Jason, about 8.5% uh, of GDP. Today, last the April, was about 1.3% of GDP. So what's happened is you have a much tighter uh, you know, capital market. That just makes it tougher uh, to do deals. Having said that, the private credit market is uh, very strong right now. And people like KKR and others that have a large uh, private credit business um, we're able to fill the gap and, and do things. Secondly, uh, we bought several companies that uh, we just did all equity. And we'll finance later when rates come, come down and we've got plenty of equity capital. We'll buy them with just which equity. And so what you're going to see, I think, is a sustained period of time uh, where the capital markets will stay tighter. It is not to date a credit issue could become a credit issue, but it's not there yet. It's more of a liquidity issue right now as to why you're not seeing as many uh, private equity deals done. I want to get in, based on what you just said, get into a little bit of the guts of KKR, because what you just described is a very different firm from what you and Jerry Kohlberg and your cousin George Roberts started in 1976. Well, I think you have to go back a little bit and understand uh, the, the most important conversation that Jerry, George, and I had in 1976, and that was what kind of culture did we want to have? And it was very important to us to have a culture where everybody was uh, included in everything we did. That meant that everyone was paid for uh, and got part of the carried interest, part of the fee income, because all we did when we started, everyone at the firm gets to participate in everything we do. 
So that means that if I came in to see you and you're the CEO of a company, uh, that used to be all we could talk about is your company for sale. Today, let's get to know you. We, we are very big believers that people do business with people they like and trust. And so build a relationship, and that's really how we go about it. And then eventually you find out, because everyone at KKR has a toolkit, they find out that, wow, this uh, company needs uh, to redo their balance sheet. This one wants to make an acquisition, but they don't have the banks covering them anymore because we're in a tighter credit situation, et cetera. We're able to be able to provide capital up and down the capital structure. So yes, that is correct that last year, uh, about 95% of the money we raised, which was somewhere uh, uh, in the $75, $80 billion range, was non-private equity. And the reason for that was we had finished raising large private equity uh, pools of capital already. So that money was used for, uh, uh, for climate, for ESG, for real estate, for credit, all kinds of credit, and for infrastructure. So uh, today we're a very diversified firm, able to be a solutions provider to many companies uh, anywhere in the world. And that's really was by design what George and I and, and Joe Bay and, and Scott Nuttall really worked on over the years. One of the interesting things that you've gotten into, and, and Joe Bay, the, the co-CEO, talked about this a couple weeks ago or in the, in the last week or two, was getting into the, the high net worth uh, area, uh, a new fund related to that. I mean, this has been, long been the holy grail. Jason. That's a huge opportunity. First of all, uh, in the high net alternative, what I'm saying is that's private equity, that's infrastructure, that's real estate, uh, it's maybe private credit, et cetera. And so we have come up with democratized products across the board uh, here. Um, and uh, uh, we're working with different um, uh, registered uh, advisors and getting on different platforms to sell these different uh, products. This is fairly new for us, but uh, initial reaction so far has been very strong. Because if, I, if we'd had this conversation 10 years ago and you said to me, do you think that KKR will ever be um, uh, dealing with the high net worth pe uh, a population? I'd say, yeah, in a small way. Mm. But today, we're now able to deal with the high net worth population globally in a very major way. And that's going to change the complexion. Uh, these are uh, pools of capital that will you know, be fairly well tied up for five years at least, uh, if not longer. And uh, uh, we're going to, I hope, take advantage of the opportunities there today. So one of the things that's going on at the firm, you're now a year or so, year and change, uh, I believe, into a pretty major transition, which is your job has changed. You, hand, you and George handed off the CEO roles to Scott Nuttall and, and Joe Bay. So what's your job like now? Well, first of all, I'm glad after 45 years to finally get promoted. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really happy about that. So George uh, Roberts and I, uh, we both founded the firm with Jerry Kohlberg, and uh, for 45 years, George and I were co-CEOs, and uh, we're now co-executive chairman. We meet uh, officially once a week. Well, that was over a seven-year period, and what we did then was to make Joe Bay and Scott Nuttall co-chief operating officers in, I believe, about 2017. George and I stayed as co-CEOs, and we kept giving more and more um, uh, responsibility to them, let's see how they do. And they did a phenomenal job, particularly during COVID uh, there. The firm grew dramatically during that period of time, and uh, they uh, performed magnificently. They showed real leadership. Now, picking two people, I've heard over and over again, uh, two people never work. Yes, we've got lots of examples where two people don't work. At KKR, you know, George and I grew up together. We're uh, four months apart in age. We met when we were two. We're first cousins and best friends. And uh, that's the best partnership you could have. So what we saw in Joe and Scott was the fact that they um, came into the firm together, 
probably 25, uh, 26 years ago now, um, grew through the firm together, and their families are best friends. But there was one piece that we focused on very much. Obviously, they've got capability of leadership. Did they believe in uh, and live by our culture? And that was critical, because if we lose the culture at KKR, this culture of inclusion, everybody participating, uh, we lose our DNA, and they live by it. And so that was a very important part. George and I have always believed that if you, because um, we're often asked, how did you make it work so well? Uh, and by the way, uh, you two must fight a lot. Oh yeah, we had, uh, I think we had a terrible fight. We both were seven. And <laughs> he, he wanted to ride my new bicycle. He had just come up to Tulsa from here. <laughs> That's right. So um, in, in uh, Joe and Scott, we saw many of the same characteristics and same friendship and camaraderie with their families and, and the two of them that George and I have. And so it became pretty natural for them to then succeed us. But you know, we built this over a long period of time because we always said we wanted a firm that survived long after K, uh, George and Henry were gone and it contained the same DNA that we've been able to build uh, for many years in, uh, in the past. One of the things I always like to ask you about is New York City because you've been a steward of this place since you came to Columbia Business School back in the day. Uh, you've been very involved from a civic, philanthropic, and obviously business perspective. What do you see in New York City right now? You've moved to Hudson Yards. The, the firm is now located there. What does New York City feel like at this moment? You know, so I, wildfire I, is notwithstanding. No, no. I, I worry about New York, uh, and I think it's going to take a long time because we have something today that we didn't have before, and that's the aftermath of COVID, of just getting people back to work now. I'm happy to say that at uh, KKR, we got people back uh, um, about two years ago. And what we said was, we're a, uh, a, a, an apprentice model. People learn from each other, so we expect you to come back in, and they did. Now, it didn't hurt in New York, for example, the fact that we had a brand new office, we had great food, uh, and uh, people uh, wanted to be together. And you learn from each other. One of our biggest challenges in New York, and the challenge for Mayor Adams, is going to be to get people back into the office, and that's going to be tough. It still isn't happening yet. It's better than it was. So that's one worry. The second worry that I have is just crime. Um, you know, I wish... I've lived here since 1967 and uh, coming from Oklahoma, but I uh, think it's just going to take a long time to get back to where we should be. All right, well, as we start to wind down a little bit, I have to ask you about a very important topic, golf. Um, you're a very good golfer. I know that from a number of people, including my boss and your friend. Don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> um, you're a deal maker. We saw a hell of a deal yesterday uh, putting the PGA and live together, at least on a commercial basis. As a deal maker and a golfer, what do you make of it? Look, I don't know all the details, and there's my bet is there's a lot more than what the headlines say that the fine print is, is really important. But I think getting together is the best thing for golf. This fight that was going on and the lawsuits that were uh, raging and uh, one side, the golfers from Liv, and, uh, you know, taking shots at the uh, PGA and vice versa, that's not constructive for the game. Uh, you know, uh, golf for a while was very flat years ago. Tiger Woods got into the game, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the number of participants in golf uh, increased uh, by two, three million uh, participants. And then it started back down. So the worst thing, yes, it, it sort of makes interesting reading, but it is not constructive. So I would say this is constructive. As I say, I don't know all the fine print, the details, but I'm very happy that they've gotten this behind them. You've got some very capable people on the PGA side uh, that are on the board there, headed by uh, Ed Hurley and Jimmy Dunn's on that board. They know a lot about golf, and they're deal makers. They know how to get things done. So when I saw the headlines come across, I couldn't be happier that mm. this is 
I hope never. doing. Um, what energizes you at this point from a business perspective or, or, or even personally? I mean, this is, this is a pretty remarkable chapter that you've entered into. Well, I happen to love where I am right now. Um, first of all, uh, I'm asked from time to time, so what drives me? Well, for years, what's driven me, and today it's exactly the same, if not even more so, is curiosity. I don't think that anyone can be a great investor unless you're curious. But you've got to be curious about a lot of things. It's not just the stock or the stock market. If, if I took people to the window uh, on in our office, and we go from 74 to 80, and said, look out, what do you see out there? I hope that they would say, I see possibility, as opposed to, I see the tugboat in the Hudson River. You've got to see opportunity and see where connect the dots. And so what drives me so much today really is curiosity. I'm spending a lot of time, which I've done since 1998, but I did it out of my back pocket, in the venture startup world. We didn't do it at KKR, so I was able to do that. Today I built that up significantly and um, having a lot of fun, entrepreneurs, et cetera. That's fun. Secondly, I'm very involved in an organization called Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, SEO, and that's critical for me. It's helping the underserved community uh, get a good education from ninth grade through college, so it's an eight-year program. So I spend a lot of time uh, on that. And I'm still very involved at KKR. Uh, in fact, I'm as busy today or busier than I've been, except I don't have to worry about all of the detail day to day. Sounds like a pretty good job. It's a great job. All right. Thank you for spending time with us. Please help me thank Henry Kravis. Thank you. From every side.
my beating heart ladies and gentlemen please take your seats the program will begin 
in 10 minutes. to do.
ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program... Please welcome to the stage TIAA President and CEO Tashonda Brown Duckett with Bloomberg Shanali Basic. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. There are, as you all know, a lot of long term questions. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. There are, as you all know, a lot of long-term questions I have for you, but I figured the first place that we start, given your view of the financial health economy, but there's some real headwinds when you think about inflation, when you think about rates continuing to rise, when you think about the broader geopolitical environment, we still are battling a war, et cetera. So what does that mean in terms of what we're seeing? We do anticipate a mild recession the latter part of the year going into the first quarter. Um, but I think what's most important as someone who runs a company that exists to ensure mil millions of Americans can have a secure retirement, what we are seeing right now and what we will expect to continue to see is that 25 percent of Americans have reduced their contribution towards their retirement plan. And within that 25 percent, 
50% have taken it down to zero. And so when you think about an environment where rates are so high, inflation is so high, it has real short-term but also long-term impacts as we think about what that will mean for millions of Americans on their path to having um, you know, confidence in their retirement. You know, it's interesting. You see a very different view when the banks think about savings and deposit yeah. rates going up. The reality, too, is you're seeing Americans not only contribute less, but dip into their retirement. Yeah. And it's a real problem. I mean, just to kind of anchor on some key stats, there's a $4 trillion savings gap in our country. We know that 40% of Americans run out of money we know that women retire with 30% less. And when you look at people of color, 54% of African Americans are not saving enough to retire. And so when you think about that backdrop, and when you hear stats that within that today, people are taking down their contribution and some are depleting, it will have a long-term impact that I would say we're in a crisis as we think about real risk for the average American. It's interesting. Let's talk about the here and now, because if you look on Wall Street, people say, OK, inflation, it's coming down, it's coming down, but it's still high. Yes. And, you know, actually, I want to pull up a poll here to kind of talk a little bit about the, whether we've even seen the worst effects of them. The questions are, is will there be after? Think about the everyday needs of people, how they are filling up their gas tank, the price of food the cost of clothes, whatever that is, that impacts their overall financial picture. And so when you hear stubborn inflation, inflation is still high, we're already seeing the impact on the average consumer to have people go into their retirement plan and reduce their contribution because they're making an impossible trade-off is a concern. And when you think about what does that mean, that means they're taking income that they're gonna get taxed on. So that dollar is not a full dollar and they're losing the compounding value over decades. So the real question for us is when people are making those tough choices today, specifically in a high inflationary in environment, how do we make sure that as we're navigating through this cycle that they can get back on track? So it's not just about the here and the now and the decision that an average American is making today. It is also about what do we do to help that average American get back on track to make sure that they can make better investment choices through the long term in order to make sure that they can have a secure retirement. I do want to get into this idea of what companies and the government can yep. do about this problem. But before we get there, I want to kind of outline, um, outline the, the disparities we see here. There's this sense out there that in, in, inflation is not impacting everybody equally. Right. So what does that look like uh, when you look at you know, the American demographic? And what are the ripple effects of that type of widening inequality? Well, I mean, we know and history has told us is that we're, whenever we are in an environment of economic uncertainty, it can have an exasperated impact in diff for different populations, particularly people of color. And again, when you look at the first stat, 40% of all Americans, and then you have 54% of African Americans, and we know the impact for women retiring with 30% less, these issues compound. And one of the fundamental questions I think we all ask ourselves that are committed and retiring with 30% less, these issues compound. And one of the fundamental questions I think we all ask ourselves that are committed and wanting to close the economic gap, the inequalities, well, if we are not dealing with the long-term implications, understand the decisions that people are making today, how will that impact decisions tomorrow? How does that have a disproportionate impact in people of color and women? And then what decisions do we need to make in policy as well as in business to have better outcomes? It's interesting that you put the burden transfer generationally. There are Absolutely. some that would also say that that burden also gets transferred to the U.S. government. Yes. We started today talking a lot about kind of the U.S. debt load, how unsustainable it is. You know, how do you think about the responsibility of governments here versus corporations when you think about Americans' financial health? Well, I don't look at it as an or. I look at it as an end. You know, we know that good policy matters especially when you're thinking about long-term investment solutions. And when you ask the question about Social Security, we know that Social Security was never designed to be the full replacement for someone's retirement. But the reality is a large percentage of Americans are relying on almost 90% of Social Security to cover all of their financial needs, which is not sufficient. And so when I think about the role, I think about it in a couple dimensions. One, we need Social Security, and so hopefully we'll, we'll figure out how to address the entitlement and what does that mean. But there's real risk that it could be less. And we also know that we have longevity risk in our country. People are living longer, which will put another strain on the government. 
And so as we think about business, as we think about the investment community, as I think about uh, a CEO, being the CEO of TIA, I think about how do we look at the allocation and talk about low cost and plan annuities as part of that overall uh, portfolio when you think about not just stocks and bonds, but you think about guaranteed income in a low cost way. I think about what employers can do to say, are we, do we have a strong 401k or 403b plan? But it's not enough to say that we have those benefits. I think we also have to ask the question, are all of our employees participating in the plan at all levels? Are they all enrolling? And are they all increasing that percentage? Business, there are a lot of things you're right. thinking about right now. I think it's a big question. The good news is we all know that business matters when it comes to health benefits, when it comes to retirement benefits. We understand the importance. It's not just the wages. It's also about the benefits that we provide in order to be able to attract and retain talent. And so it is a call to action. It's a call to action because we know with all the great work that business has done, it's not sufficient when the outcome is 40%. And so when I think about basic practical steps, I would suggest a few things. One, make sure that the plan is working. Just aggregate the data. Are the people furthest removed from you investing in your 401k plan or 403b plan? Auto enroll, auto escalate 1% every year to get to that maximum contribution. Clearly, the employee has the option if they need to opt out, but the next year you opt them back in. And we know studies show that when you do that, you have stronger outcomes. And then lastly, I think we cannot have this conversation without talking about education. How do we make sure that we are informing and taking the opportunity to educate our employees about the benefit, about what does it mean to have a secure retirement, and to make sure that they understand that making sure that they are secure puts a less burden on their loved ones that they care about. So there's a really important role that we play in business. And then finally, policy. I think in the business community, we have to continue to encourage uh, Congress, to encourage the federal, federal government to operate in a bipartisan way, to continue to provide solutions that can make it easier for the average American and easier for business to make sure that people can be on a, pa on a path to a secure retirement. You know, we started this conversation off talking about that stat that 40% of Americans run out of money. Yep. And if you look at the, the stats, the real, the real survey here <laughs> that is coming out, either most people in the audience believe that there will either be aftershocks and inflation or that new problems are coming. Yeah. What makes that 40%, 50%? Either most people in the audience believe that there will either be aftershocks and inflation or that new problems are coming. Yeah. What makes that 40%, 50%, or 60% or even more? I mean, are you worried about the direction of travel here? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely worried, but I also have to make decisions for the short term that can have longer term implications. And so I think it's important for us to continue to make sure that we're looking at the after potential effects of inflation. I think we absolutely have to make sure we're not just thinking about the here and now, but what are people doing and what are those behaviors that people are, are acting today and what can that mean in the long term? Because we will have a crisis in our country if we are not making better decisions today to make sure that people can have all the solutions and the tools that they need to retire. I want to talk a little more about some of the hot button issues in the market as well, because I know that you have a pretty nuanced take to them. We've been talking so much. Everyone's going to be talking about artificial intelligence yeah. today, let's be honest. But um, you know, when you think about how you're running your business on it, TIA is a private company, what are the ways you're using it, and what are the ways you're most concerned? I mean, AI has been here. It's here, and it's only going to continue uh, to, to grow in terms of what it means to business. The way I think about it is I think the way that many of us think about it, clearly the benefits of AI is improved productivity. There's opportunities to make it easier to delight the client experience. There's ways to be the companion to the employees that you have so that some of the baseline work can be not what they have to focus on so they can work on you know, higher complex issues and making sure that you have a reskilling program um, in place um, as you think about the jobs of tomorrow. But I also think given that we are a long-term investor and given that we are working with participants all ages, all the way through the transfer of wealth, we have to be concerned about risk. And so I think as we continue to invest in technology, as we all continue to get smarter about AI, I think it has to run a parallel path to really running what are all the risk scenarios. I think the investments that we make in technology, whether it's cyber or other risk tools, cannot just be the protection of yesterday's risks. It's not even enough to make sure that you're investing for the today's risk. We are making investments to thinking about tomorrow. What are the implications? You think about 
fraud, when you think about people wanting to take advantage of the elderly, uh, the elderly community is one of the, the sectors that are most primed for abuse. And so making sure that we're communicating with our participants, making sure we're communicating with their loved ones, this is a risk that's happening today, today. And the risk will only become more amplified as we think about the sophistication of technology. And so that is why I think it's important that when we're having a conversation about AI or any technology, especially in the investment community, at the same time, we have to have the conversation about risk to make sure that we are doing both, taking advantage of what can be good for business, but it's not good if it's not protecting ultimately who we serve. And so you, we have to strike the balance. Do you think that many companies are kind of being very naive to some of those risks on the surface? I don't. I mean, whether it's the business council, the business roundtable, I mean, any uh, environment that I'm in talking with other uh, colleagues, this is top of mind. And it's top of mind with respect to innovation. It's top of mind with respect to what does it mean to the workplace and the workforce. And it's top of mind for all of us as we think about the different risks that it can mean to our business. So I do think that we're not being naive. I think we want to become more knowledgeable about the use cases across our company. But I think any good leader wants to also understand how do I make sure that I'm also protecting the company and the people that we serve. We started this conversation talking about this idea of a mild recession on the horizon. How would you help the audience here anchor their minds into what are the things that investors are not seeing, the biggest risks that you're thinking about right now as we think through the next six to 12 months? I mean, the good news, I think we're all talking about the same thing. And I think investors are looking at the macro environment, but I also think investors are looking at what does it mean to the balance sheet of, of everyday Americans or regardless in terms of all the decisions that, that we have to make. I think when we look at a mild recession, I mean to the balance sheet of, of everyday Americans or regardless in terms of all the decisions that, that we have to make. I think when we look at a mild recession, I mean clearly the labor market continues to be strong. You know, I think clearly unemployment continues to be low. Investment options. But I think the, the core fundamentals are continuing to be strong. I think we all understand the, you know, what's happening in the environment. But I do think these unknowns are ones that we're going to have to continue to navigate. And I think the most important thing that I would share, given the space that I'm in, is making sure that as we think about the long term, particularly for those when you're thinking about their allocation for retirement, are we doing everything that we can to make sure that within their portfolio they have access and exposure to guaranteed income? And into a potential recession, you know, this idea that Americans are dipping into their savings yep. to get through the cycle, is the consumer as strong as everybody thinks? Yeah, I mean, it's uneven. You know, I think, you know, on one hand, you know, people are sitting with a lot of cash on the sideline. And on the other hand, there's everyday Americans that are making, you know, real tough decisions on how to access cash. And so I think we cannot uh, just look at the macro numbers. I think we have to recognize that it's uneven. And I think as we're navigating this environment, there will continue to be stress on that average consumer. And depending on what happens in a prolonged potential recession, those implications can be exasperated. And I think that's something we have to continue to watch. Shanda, thank you so thank much. You very much. For thank your you. time. Please welcome to the stage Soros Fund Management CEO and Chief Investment Officer Don Fitzpatrick with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. Don, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Ah, uh, boy, I think the best place for us to start, Don, is by giving everybody a little bit of context, because the more they end Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Ah, uh, boy, uh, in the investment decisions that you make, highly unusual uh, for a pool of capital as large as yours, right, in the order of $30, $30 billion? Just shy of that. Just shy. Uh, it enables you to respond immediately and to pounce on market dislocations and as I understand it, that's why you're always studying, right, the market for potential cause and effect scenarios. Is that right? That, that, that's right. We have a really open investment mandate. So we have one team, one pool of capital, really one sophisticated client. So we can move across asset classes, across liquidity, 
in ways that I think very few other pools of capital can do. And we have a very integrated team, so we can connect a lot of dots that I think are harder for others. And in a moment of, in time like this, I think that becomes exponentially more valuable. And just to avoid any confusion, that client is George. <laughs> and, and his foundations. Um, I do want to spend a good part of our conversation talking about these scenarios, the ones that you see unfolding in the near term and maybe a little bit further out. So what excites you most right now? What are you most interested in? What do you see happening? So um, right now, the, the asset class that we think is, is, is most interesting is actually typically a boring asset class, and that's agency mortgage-backed securities. And the reason for that is... Two-thirds about of your current holders, it's the central bank and banks have turned sellers. Um, and, and you have a d dynamic where you've had extraordinary interest rate volatility. So the, the valuations in that space have gotten, we would, we, we would say, disproportionately cheap relative to other asset classes because of those technicals. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you had obviously some high profile regional bank failures where you have the FDIC auctioning off a, a good portion or, or sizable um, portfolios, and that's also adding to kind of the technical. How can that last? I mean, if, if everybody sees the value in that trade, surely, right, the spread has to collapse. Yeah, um, well, a couple things. First of all, when it comes to equities, I hate being in a consensus trade because you're at, at the mercy of, of the next, you know, the greater fool or the next marginal buyer. When you buy fixed income, you just have to be right because eventually you have a maturity. Um, so, the, so I think you're right. There's a lot of people who are, who are citing this asset class as cheap. Um, when something's cheap, I want to know why it's cheap. And again, there's some really clear technical reasons mm -hmm. why this asset class um, is cheap. And by the way, I think you're going to see more bank failures, likely in the small banks, so it's not going to be the big headlines and the size of the failures we had so far, but I think there's more problems under the surface. So you'll, you'll see um, continued sales. And the other thing that, that is, is um, you know, undeniable is a, in aggregate, banks have to reduce balance sheets and shorten duration of portfolios here. There is, um, you know, regulation coming mm. um, that's going to be pretty punitive. Talk a bit more about that. Yeah, so options, I think, are going to disappear. That's where people didn't have to mark things to market. Um, I think when it comes to liquidity management, um, there's going to be a lot more scrutiny on that. One of the interesting things is coming out of the financial crisis, there was a lot of focus on asset quality, so things like stress tests, and not as much on liability management. But now we know, like, you know, deposit assumptions were just wrong. What, what other kinds of trades and or investments seem attractive to you with that as the backdrop? So we're, fi so we're finally, with that as the backdrop, you are seeing a credit contraction. I think, you know, the, the recent loan data, you know, doesn't it actually surprise a little bit better to the upside. But this contraction is invariably coming. Um, you, you, banks will just be able to loan less. Um, in the levered loan space, 70% of levered loans have been bought recently by CLOs. CLO issuance right now is at 2020 levels. And also, typically, um, CLOs have a reset where they can extend duration. But this is another like unintended consequences of higher rates. Now, with higher rates, those resets don't make ec economic sense. So you have 40% of existing CLOs ending their reinvestment periods by the end of this year. Um, so you're just going to have less loan, I, less credit available. And there's a lot of people who think, ah, private credit has grown exponentially. They'll just fill in the gap. I, I think you were going, that's, that is about to kind of emerge. And I think the magnitude and probably more interesting, the duration of that default cycle is going to surprise people. How do we see that play out then? There's clearly 
a bond market, there's a leveraged loan market, but there isn't much of a secondary market for things like the unit tranche loans that have been, you know, that, that, that lately have been dominating the growth of the private credit market. Yeah, so one of the things you're going to see is the most vulnerable loans are going to be the ones that private equity took out, so sponsor loans. And I think you're going to see those private equity companies be really aggressive around liquidity and maturity issues. So I think you're going to see a lot of kind of extend and pretend. And that also reduces the amount of real dry powder out there. For you, is this just a matter of waiting for the things that, that you find interesting to get cheap enough? Or are, you, are there opportunities to short along the way? Yeah, so right now, our balance sheet is really clean. And one of the things I've been stressing to the team is it is a little bit about being patient. And I think sometimes that's something that investors do poorly, both institutional and retail. Um, is, is just be patient and let the opportunity set come to you. I, again, I think where we're headed, in some ways, um, the great financial crisis and COVID were, were not that painful, right? Because they were really deep um, corrections and, and really quick recoveries. Getting rates come down quickly, and that, I just don't, I don't see that happening. Do you not see it happening with enough conviction that you're willing to take the other side of the rate trade? Uh, we, 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 have, we have that bet on in rates for sure. And I think one of the, like, one of the things that's, that's so different about this time is you had central banks and, and fiscal authorities throw good, but below the surface, like all hell is break, breaking, breaking out. But think about that. That's going to make the Fed's job really, really difficult. And, and you could have a really big default cycle without GDP rolling over. Much of this, Don, as you just alluded, is the consequence of policymaking, uh, both at the fiscal and monetary level. How much confidence do you have in market regulation right now? Um, when so you see what's going on in crypto, for example, over the past couple of days. And folks, I think you're going to hear a little more about that in a few minutes. Yeah. Um, but also in antitrust. Yep. Um, you mentioned banking. Yeah, so um, I will start, start with, with crypto, which always gets me into trouble. But, um, <laughs> but I think, you know, especially the headlines of the last couple of days, it's clear these crypto native um, platforms would have benefited from having an adult in the room. They're, they're <laughs> <laughs> Somebody might have something to say about that. <laughs> to state the obvious. Um, but but, but like there, are, there are just long held and simple norms about how you treat customer assets, for, for example. Um, and what I think, I, I think crypto is here to stay. I think what's, what's happened is, is clearly a setback but right now, I actually think it's a huge opportunity for the incumbent financial firms to actually take the lead. The ones that are already regulated and run, for example, regulated exchanges. Yeah, and know, and know how to segregate client assets. And, and, and yeah, so I, I think that is, is what's going to happen. On kind of Wouldn't the, that be ironic, though, given the disruption that crypto promised? Yeah. On kind Wouldn't of the, that be ironic, though, given the disruption that crypto promised? Yeah, there is some irony to it, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sh yeah, it is, it is ironic. But I think that's, I think that is going to be the evolution. The two fractured to be wholly effective, in my opinion. Um, but when you look at what they're focused on, it's clear that they know post the financial crisis, because of regulation, they shifted an exponential amount of risk into the non-regulated, um, non-banking sector. And they're trying to figure out ways to, to get out that, because that is where your ne next systemic risk is going to occur. And their ability to spot it and course correct right now, I think, is pretty limited. So you think, see things coming out like uh, the amendment to form, form PF. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Would they have to alert the SEC to so-called trigger events? Yeah, in, in very short duration. I actually think... 72 hours, I think. Exactly. And I think, in a lot of ways, that design is better than in 2011, Foreign BF just asked for this huge data dump that, candidly, I'm not sure the SEC knew what to do with. Um, so this alert system... I think is 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 really interesting and 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 like elegant in, in its simplicity, but I worry it will allow them to see idiosyncratic risks and probably um, help. So if you look at the top four public market hedge funds right now, their balance sheets, their gross assets are well in excess of a trillion dollars. Um, and at the, again, you have your regulated dealer community where their balance sheets have done nothing but go down. Um, another, another stat that's really interesting, your publicly traded alts, assets under management, have doubled since 2020. So in other words, and we think we want to position ourselves to take advantage, advantage of those dislocations. But by the way, you saw it on the back of Silicon Valley bank failure when you had two-year treasury rates go from like, you know, above 5%. To below 360, that's like a crazy enormous move for a two-year government bond. There are any number of different kinds of dislocations. We've talked about some of them, technical, structural, cyclical. There's technological, too. Yep. Do you think AI is going to create market disruptions, dislocations? Um, potentially. I think, um, you know, when, when we see what's going on in AI, first of all, when you look at what, what just came out of the recent earnings report, it is clear that we're at the beginning of a mega cycle um, in, in spending in AI. And the real beneficiaries, obviously, are the applications, so your SaaS companies, and you know, infrastructure, so it's, it's cloud and, and your you know, high-performing high chip companies. Um, those stocks right now are extrapolating pretty enormous compounding growth, um, allows us to talk to computers like ourselves, and the ability to, to tap into massive compute power, and probably even more importantly, enterprise data and just global data generally, is going to be seismic, and, it's, and, and, and the capabilities are just gonna be exponential. Don, last question for you. There's a long tradition of prominent investors who speak out about economic policy. And much of the commentary we get from them, I think, is genuinely altruistic, right? Out of concern for the good of the country or perhaps even the good of the world. And George Soros. Hopefully one day. Yeah, I, 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 I um, you know, George is active. And I, I think it's important that I'm deferential to him. Um, I do serve on government advisory committees, so I, I I try to working be working behind the scenes. I try to work behind the scenes, um, but yeah, one day. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Don Fitzpatrick. Please welcome to the stage Niam Investment Office Chief Investment Officer, Dr. Manar Al Monif with Bloomberg's Michelle Lin. I'm Michelle Lynn, Global Head of Data Science and Insight for the Bloomberg Media Organization, and I'm, jo I'm joined by Dr. Manar Al Monif, Chief Investment Officer at NEOM Investment Office, joining us for the NEOM Sponsor Spotlight, Redefining Sustainability, Livability, and Business Among Current Global Challenges. Welcome to Bloomberg Invest, Dr. Manar. Oh, good morning, <laughs> and thank you so much for having me here. Um, okay, so we want to start out to create a better life. And I'll answer your question. The first one is, why NEOM? Mm -hmm. Well, simply when NEOM was created, it wasn't only to create a better life for Saudi Arabia. It was simply built as a foundation of a living laboratory where you can create new ideas, new innovation, to create a more sustainable future for all of us. And these ideas that... The second pillar that we're focusing on is redefining livability by actually building a city centered around people, bringing time back to them, 
and ensuring that we're creating an exceptional high quality of life, giving time back to people and offering for them diverse interconnected communities, access to exceptional landscaping available, and most importantly, bringing time back to them. And the third aspect or pillar that we focus on is redefining businesses. Our aim is for NEOM businesses to grow faster than anywhere else around the world by creating a foundation of uh, an infrastructure free from any legacy infrastructure progressive laws and regulation that is primarily focused on businesses to allow them to grow faster than anywhere else around the world. So that's really the main pillar that we're focusing on and that's the foundation that we're presenting to the globe today. So where is NEOM now in its development? Great question. Uh, there is a lot of development. I think so today when you, see the, when you speak about the word NEOM, everyone is speaking about it uh, in details significant work have taken place in NEOM. Uh, today, uh, example, we've done uh, 20 of the essential infrastructure is already in place. Uh, the amount of construction work that's taking place in NEOM is exceptional at a speed that's never been done before anywhere else around the world. We've launched uh, four regions so far, and that is true to our vision in which we're developing only 5% of the land in NEOM and 95% is gonna be untouched by urbanization. Uh, this is the line, the vertical city, which is a true transformation when it comes to livability. Uh, Sandala, which is our you know, islands that's connected to the Red Sea. Trujina, a year around mountain destination. And finally, Oxygen, which is an industrial city that is changing the way that we're doing business that will be producing 600 tons of hydrogen on a daily basis that can be used in NEOM and exported majority globally. And that's one of many to come. And the exciting news is we had really significant interest from the market. 23 financial institutions participated in the close of the green hydrogen. So how do you navigate today's market dynamics and what do you see for the future? No one can predict the market dynamics. You have your ups, you have your downs. Every day it comes with a different challenge that you see. But as an example, Saudi Arabia Vision 2030, when it was launched back in 2016, primary focus was diversification. At that time, the oil prices was $30 a barrel. Today it's 70. And we're proceeding with a speed that's never been seen before in making this transformation and change. And as a Saudi, I'm really impressed and very proud with the speed of how things are happening. Saudi Arabia world capital of energy didn't used to speak about renewable energy. Today they are taking the lead in speaking about green hydrogen and new development. So today it's clear for us, we are building a sustainable city, we are building a future, and today we are extending an invitation to everyone that is as keen as we are in building a more sustainable future. Ability, livability and business among global, you know, current global challenges. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Katie Greifeld. I'm an anchor with Bloomberg News. I'm joined here by Marty and David, uh, who really need no introduction. So we're talking about the, the future of finance as it relates to AI. You two are uniquely qualified to talk about this. Just to go through some of your background here, Marty, in addition to a PhD in medical information sciences, you have a computer science degree from Harvard. David, uh, you one up that a little bit. You have a PhD in computer science. I have a liberal arts degree, which is also very good, but <laughs> I guess a good place to start. <laughs> it feels like the hype around AI gets bigger by the day and on some days bigger by the hour. So let's focus this conversation on the investing landscape and set the scene here. When it comes to specifically investing, David, what is hype and what is reality? What, how big could the reality actually get? The, uh, the, the hype is uh, absolutely remarkable. And 
uh, I, I, I've never seen anything quite like it. Uh, it uh, ChatGPT uh, really uh, captured people's AI has been having an impact for, for decades. And uh, this stuff isn't brand new. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, the applications that you're seeing today have been in the works for quite some time. And in various uh, 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 applications, uh, you know, you've been interacting with essentially language models. You've been interacting with deep learning. You've been interacting with all sorts of language models. You've been interacting with deep learning. You've been interacting with all sorts of AI approaches. So it, it, what, what's really changed is that, uh, you know, the awareness has occurred. Everyone is pretty surprised at the behaviors that are emerging from large language models. Uh, you know, that's actually really, really interesting. Some people have claimed it's sentient, and then when they say that, they get into trouble. Uh, you know, I certainly don't think that it's sentient. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't want, I could talk a lot about this, but I'll pause. But, you know, the one thing that I, I wanted to, um, uh, uh, you know, it's almost like a joke. Uh, when I was at the AI lab at MIT, uh, you know, back in the 80s, late 80s, uh, uh, the joke was whenever AI, the definition of AI that we used was something that you could not achieve in a computer. So anytime that you actually got a program to do it, and uh, you would be, everyone would say, that's not AI, it's just a piece of software. And so that actually, it's not really a joke. Um, when I look at many of these things today, I say, okay, it's really cool, it's, it's unbelievably impressive, it's very useful, but this has just been a progression. You could say that about computers in general. Mm. And the impact of computers on society, the impact of databases on society, this has been going on for you know, since the beginning, uh, uh, you know, since when computers were invented. Mm -hmm. And so I see this as a progression, it's extremely exciting, but, you know, I'm not actually long ago, uh, and you looked at, um, you know, for example, ELISA, which was, uh, you know, the first uh, chat program that was, it was invented at MIT in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Even at th that actually, I think, made the front page of the New York Times. Uh, I don't know if any of you are aware of it, but, you know, it was a, a pretty simple program but it was an ability for, uh, you know, someone to, you know, it was a, a chat bot. And, uh, you, you know, it turns out that, you know, many people became seduced. It's actually a very interesting experiment in mm -hmm. human psychology. So there's a lot there. Let's pick up on that point that David made, though, that this is a progression of what we've seen for a long time. I mean, AI has been around in investing for a long time. And when you think about the current buzz right now over generative AI, you know, what we're seeing with chatbots, chat GBT. Do you see that as a progression of basically the AI evolution in investing, or is this a breakthrough? So it's just more software. That's how I would see it. Just and we've software. been bringing more software into finance for a really long time. And there's been all kinds of breakthroughs and there's been kind, all kinds of problems. Uh, it is statistical pattern matching. It's extremely powerful and it's interesting, but I do not see AI achieving what some would call the holy grail. Everybody wants to know what's the S&P going to be in six months. Can you tell me? And I can't, okay. and neither can the AIs. And, and at the risk of getting too technical, there's, there's a really profound technical reason why the AIs, I think, are not going to do that, predict mm -hmm. the stock market. The successes that we've seen in AI, and they are amazing, they are brilliant, all come from one profound realization, which is if you can take a large number of samples and you can dichotomize it and say, these are pictures of cats and these are not pictures of cats. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the internet was great for that because people love putting pictures of their cats on the internet and they say, this is my cat. Yeah. So now you've got this labeled data set yeah. Well, we've gone to town on that. You can train up an AI, and it can say, you give it a new image it hasn't seen before, and it'll tell you whether there's a cat mm -hmm. or not, and then it'll tell you all the variations. It will tell you, this cat is 10 years old, and it's this breed, and it might be because the concept of a cat is stable in time. Cats aren't evolving. Well, they evolve, but right. very slowly in evolutionary time, not from today to tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The stock market is notoriously not a stable distribution, so. Well, it's taken a lot of guesswork out of my world. But when you think about sort of the biggest opportunity for application of AI in investing, I mean, David, is it 
actually boosting returns or is it just boosting productivity when it comes to the research side? Well, in, in a sense that if we were having this conversation years ago, you could say, you know, you could replace AI with uh, regression. And you could say, how is regression and clever uses of regression or, how, or, or boosted learning or any of these things? And, uh, you know, not to, uh, uh, you know, to, to brush aside your question, um, uh, the answer is, it. yeah, the, but the answer is it's going to, it, it's actually kind of hard to tell. Uh, it is a, 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 a you know, a, a, a relatively large language models are relatively new, and people are now trying to think of what are the most effective ways of using them. And uh, you know, I, we have such limited time. I don't want to, you know, talk about uh, you know, to, to a deep dive or talk about things that people may know. But you know, for example, large language models are pretty good at you know taking text and summarizing it. The summaries may not be all that reliable. But they can summarize things, and so that can be a boost to to uh, to humans if you need a summary. And uh, to be clear, large you have sure you can type it into Chat GPT and you're going to get an answer. But you know, of course, you know not to believe it. You might use that as a starting point. Yeah. Um, so for applications where you don't need exactly the right answer, or it's okay that it could be completely wrong, and there are many applications like that. Uh, it'll it'll be very useful, um, but you know uh, you know just like with every other tool that's been invented, uh, time will tell. Well, Marty, that concentrate these services because among other things, to train one of these frontier large language models requires clusters that that are doing 25 exaflops. That's 25 times 10 to the 18 instructions a lot. per second, and they have to do that for months. And so that would argue for there being a very small number. On the other hand, there's been this notable release into open software of an LLM that Meta was working on. And now there's thousands of versions of them. I can't keep track. And the question is whether for specific applications will those be good enough? And then there will be a million or a billion flowers blooming. But back to your question on returns, mm -hmm. I would say it's good for net returns, okay. right? So I don't know about gross returns, but it's definitely going to increase productivity. And there's a lot of agony about what it's going to do to investing jobs. There's one thing that I've experienced, I know David has experienced this too, which is over time, there's just more and more people working in our industry. Mm -hmm. But the skill sets have changed in a dramatic way. And what those people are doing is very different. So yelling buy and sell into a phone isn't really happening because the computers are doing that much faster. But there's still a lot of people. We have traders who code. And so I would give the same advice that I gave in a, a somewhat infamous town hall at Goldman Sachs <laughs> in, in 2011 where I said there's really three stable strategies with respect to the computers. And I'd say this is true for AI as well. You can be a person who tells them what to do. That's worked well for me. You can be a person who collaborates with computers and the people who tell the computers what to do. Mm -hmm. That's a great strategy for everybody. You can stand in the way of progress and hope that you keep your job forever doing exactly what you're doing, and that is really dumb, and you will be roadkill. I think we all know some people <laughs> like that. You gotta, you gotta get with it. So yeah. one of the things that I'm super excited about, just to say one last thing, is. On, on David's point of, and, and actually, can you give that to me in the form of a sonnet or a haiku? Mm -hmm. yeah. I do. I, by the way, but I, you, you know, I, I, so I, I've of course done many experiments with various large language models, and uh, uh, I, I uh, you know, recently asked uh, uh, ChatGPT, I believe I was using that one, uh, uh, you know, a legal question that uh, you know I had, and. Uh, uh, you know, it was a uh, you know, question doesn't really matter. And it gave me a very well-reasoned answer. And I was, I was quite impressed. And it was like, you know, a, a couple of pages long, and it cited various laws, and it, you know, reached various conclusions. And it was super impressive until I tried to validate it. And <laughs> it turns okay. out that uh, everything it said only had a grain of truth. And so the whole thing was entirely wrong. And... But it was incredibly impressive. And so, you know, you've all heard about hallucinations, but, you know, try it yourself. And what you're going to see is that for um, certain classes of problems where the training data is of high quality and it doesn't have to do kind of 
you know, deep, in, uh, deep inferencing, uh, you know, it, it's actually pretty good. But w when it, it has to you know, make, let's just call it conjectures, connecting things together that have less statistical uh, uh, oomph about, for example, taking uh, LLMs, you know, you know uh, the, the current uh, state of the art uh, uh, models that are being used, um, and making them bigger and bigger, we need to have a deeper understanding of why they're working, how they're working, where the limitations are, and that will guide the, the research that will be needed. And, and, and so I still consider this whole thing to, I mean, there are definitely commercial applications. This is going to be big impact. There's a lot of money to be made off of. percent aren't worried at 5%. Jeez, 8%. Okay, so people are voting in real time. That's pretty cool. What are your thoughts? When you think about the risks, what is your anxiety level right now, would you say? My anxiety level is medium. Okay. I am anxious generally. <laughs> I, uh, I've been working like David in various kinds of electronic trading for a big part of my career. And I can think of ways in which this can go terribly wrong. Mm. Um, but we've had those problems before, right? So if you're connecting up an AI to an exchange and there's no breaks, like checking that you're a good credit counterparty before this trade goes in, I worry about things like that. So I'm big advocate for those control points where AIs interact with the outside world mm -hmm. having an awful lot of safety checks. But this is old. We've done this with railroads. We've done this with you know, we, we've done this with electronic trading. We've been here before. That is super important, and we absolutely have to get that right. The existential risk. I don't lie awake thinking about them. How about you, David? I uh, <laughs> fully agree. Um, I worry about an awful lot of stuff, uh, uh, and there are an, you know incredible number of things that can go haywire uh, in our world. Uh, there are incredible number of technologies that can go haywire uh, in our world. Uh, there are incredible number of technologies, CRISPR, for example, that could cause things to go haywire. But what you tend to uh, uh, find is that uh, the good news is society doesn't want everything to go haywire. And, and, and so there's a countervailing force where you know, people somehow figure out how to avoid extinction about AI any more than, you know, 50 other things. That's a good place to end it. Marty, David, this was awesome. Thank you both so much. A pleasure. Thank you. everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation with Kathy Engelbert, the first commissioner of the WNBA. Um, our session is called Leveling the Playing Field in Women's Sports. And obviously, there is a ton of excitement around women's sports and investing in women's sports right now. I'm curious from where you sit for the WNBA, 2022 was a banner year. What is the single best number that effectively tells that story? Oh, Scarlett, first of all, it's great to be here uh, back at Bloomberg. Um, I would say most viewed season in 20 years, and we're only 26 years old. We just tipped off our 27th season, so. Um, but there's lots of others, a billion impressions on social media, all the stuff you read about. But um, yeah, the viewership, because that's so important in building the economic model for the long term. Absolutely. So. There's a lot of demand, and we know that the WNBA currently has 12 teams, but you've said that that's not enough for a country of 300 million. Players want more teams. Fans want more teams. The timeline for adding new teams right now is, what, 2025-ish? Why not sooner? Yeah, we hope to uh, add to, uh, we hope it's an aggressive timeline to add to by 25. You have to run an expansion draft. You obviously, you've got to have arena leases. You have to have practice facilities. Um, you know, this year, um, there's a lot of discussion around roster spots because a lot of second round picks don't make teams. Mm -hmm. One first round pick didn't make a team. So you also don't want to degradate the quality of the game. So as you think about expanding into markets, um, like you said, I said there's 330 million people in this country. We're the longest tenured women's professional sports team in the country at just tipping off 27, double any other. No one else has reached 12. So we've got a lead on this and we've got, but, but we're, we're, when I came into the league, we had a lot of transformation to do, Scarlett. I mean, we didn't have enough fans. We didn't have enough um, national platform uh, uh, broadcasts. We, 
we hadn't globalized the game. We ha I had one marketing person when I walked in, and now we have over 20. So um, it's something where you've got to build, you have to scale, mm -hmm. and ultimately we'll raise of two of our teams, Seattle and, and Chicago, at pretty good valuations for us. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's like um, getting us on, on a good path now. You said that we're transformed because I've heard you talk about the need to transform the economics, the business model before aggressively pursuing expansion of the league. What specific part of the model do you think needs to evolve to meet the needs of 2023? Well, first of all, the first thing I came in after a long career, 33 years at Deloitte, and I come into the league and the first stat someone gave me is less than 1% of all corporate sponsorship dollars go towards women's sports and less than 5% of all media coverage of sports covers women's sports. So of course, as a good former accountant, I say, well, what's the denominator? I said, is the denominator a billion, 30 billion, 100 billion? Because if you were going to move that even a couple hundred basis points, let alone get it to parity, equity, or whatever, you, whatever word you want to use, how hard is this going to be? Mm -hmm. And little did I know, the denominator is huge. Just in North America, I think media rights deals are 30 to 40 billion for kind of US and Canadian based teams. And, and obviously, globally, it's much bigger. So even to move it 200 basis points is going to be Herculean. We're doing that. Um, but that's what, you know, funds all the things that get higher pay and better travel conditions and everything for men's sports is media rights deals, yeah. um, period. So as we look at the transformation, that's on the list. Marketing's on the list. Underinvestment and undervaluation of women in sports. I think we're a little bit of a microcosm of broader society, although I saw that the statistics now on women CEOs is up for the first time over a little over 10%. So that's progress. So. You know, we're trying to do the same thing around sports. Sports is just a little behind the corporate world from that perspective. Well, one thing that when you talk about the WNBA, it started league play in 1997. And at that time, it was a huge draw, right? Like ratings bonanza expanded aggressively. But by 2000, things, the tide kind of turned a little bit. Attendance declined, dropped, and sponsors stopped renewing contracts because the games weren't drawing enough viewers, particularly men. What are the lessons from that me where we don't have a team buy a New York Liberty jersey and does that make them a New York fan and are we marketing to them and using data and technology and we were doing none of that. So I think that's the lesson now is to find out who that fan is, who who that potential fan is. I mean, sports betting now is legal in how many states here in the US and we never had a focus on grabbing that fan in in a watch and bet versus a bet and watch um, because so much of sports betting now happens in the game. So. Um, so there's things you can do globally, globalization. I mean, we hadn't globalized it all, all. And I admire actually what the NBA has done with their global games platform. And so we just played our first game in Toronto. 20,000 people came to see a preseason game for the WNBA. This is like astounding, by the way. So for any Canadians in the audience, thank you. But but globalizing the game, so we're going to look at um, driving that global platform. Um, in India last year, we showed our games for the first time, over 20 million Indian people watch WNBA games unique, uniquely. Um, so there's huge opportunity globally. So that's what we need to do. We just weren't doing that. We didn't have the scale. We didn't have the human capital or the financial capital to do that. Well, now you have more capital because Bloomberg's reported that combined league and team revenue is projected to reach 200 million this year, which be, would be about double the growth in 2019, or the total, I should say. The thing is, the players don't always see the full benefits of that growth. Uh, base salaries as a share of total revenue shrank to 9% in 2022 from 11% in 2019. When you think about addressing this, does it all come down to the next uh, collective bargaining agreement? Yeah, so for those that didn't follow us, I walked in four days on the job and they said, you're going to Vegas to negotiate your first collective bargaining <laughs> agreement. I said, collective what? Um, so I knew the players were union, obviously. I knew the players had opted out as it was the right to do so. So we did negotiate a C very progressive CBA at the time. Now now we're three years uh, you know, hence, and now the players want more because we're doing well. And I totally understand it. And those statistics you just threw out are deceiving because we have found every opportunity to put more money. We put a half million dollar uh, prize pool up for our Commissioner Cup in-season tournament that now the NBA is going to do a mid-season tournament. But we did it. This will be our third year of doing it. Uh, we upped the playoff bonuses by 53%. I put a $4.5 million charter fund up this year. So we're finding ways that we know what the players value. They value mom benefits, fertility benefits. Um, they value bonuses, things like that. So you know those don't always get taken into account in the math. But 
you know, as we get into the next collective bargaining cycle, what we're trying to do is set this league up for 40 to 50 years, not just mm -hmm. the next five. So that's why we, were, we raised the 75 million last February, because I said I came in from a capital rich company to a capital poor company. And I said, not only do we need the financial capital, but that'll give us the ability to get the human capital we need to, again, drive a new digital platform, uh, marketing, you know, because sports, you know, you look, I'm a big studier of history too. You look back, when the NBA was 40 years in, they were still on tape delay. And what happened? They got a big rivalry coming out of college called Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. And that drove people to watch. And then a couple the narratives, years, the people. And a couple years later, what happened? Michael Jordan and the marketing machine, Nike. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about that, you know, would Jordan would have been a great player, but without Nike, would it have become this global uh, phenomenon and this global brand? And, um, and again, so studying that and trying to take and other sports as well, and trying to take that and use the momentum. I mean, I don't know how many people here watch the NCAA women's Final Four this year, but Thank you. 10 million <laughs> average go. viewers of that game on that Sunday. Um, and I was actually at the Masters right after that, and everybody was talking about women's basketball, and I'm like, this is the dawn of a new day uh, in women's basketball. So Absolutely. capitalizing off of that as well. So sports is now an asset class, and that's why we bring this up here at the Bloomberg Invest Conference, right? It offers uncorrelated returns, the valuations, uh, although they are high, you know, it kind of everyone's talking about for the next generation of players coming in. So they, they now understand that we do business of basketball. And I think they're going to see big returns going in the future. But, you know, I also tell them you don't deploy capital all in one year and expect that return. It's a three right. to five year deployment. Again, marketing, globalization, merchandise. I mean, our merchandise sells out. And then it's like our fans complain they can't get this person's jersey or this, um, which is good news. But that's because the supply is not meeting the demand. So as you grow, you've got to invest in that. We're investing in live experiences at um, our WNBA All-Star Game, which will be in Las Vegas in mid-July. We'll have a whole event called WNBA Live. We're investing, again, in a variety of things. We just launched a new app, yeah. uh, digital uh, DTC. How do we think about our own streaming platform? How do we spend money to make sure media companies see the value? One thing that has fascinated me about sports, it's all a multiple of revenue. It's not based on the bottom line. So multiples of revenue are actually, as we're growing revenue, actually helping us. So I have to ask about the biggest story in sports this week, which of course is the unexpected merger of the PGA Tour and Live Golf. What intrigued me though, was how women's golf thought about potentially doing business with Saudi Arabia. And I know you're on the board of the LPGA because the LPGA commissioner last summer said, she would take a phone call from Live Golf because it's my responsibility to evaluate every opportunity. What do you think about that idea that women's sports can't afford to ignore a potential benefactor, even when the benefactor might not be their first choice? Right. Well, first, I'm not on the board of the LPGA. I'm on the board of the USGA, which is My a apologies. non profit about the game of golf. So just, uh, but um, no, look, I think women's sports is really hard. It's like pushing a build, big boulder up a hill, and whenever you can look at opportunities, but it also has to be whether it's a company that you're looking at partnering with or a country you're looking at partnering with, it has to share your values. And that's how we think about it at the WNBA. So I can't comment on the LPGA or golf specifically. But I do know. How, hypothetically, if Saudi Arabia came to you, how would you think you might respond to that? I think we'd evaluate it across what our global games platform um, and the WNBA players. We, we're running a very player first, player led league, and I would yeah. go to them first and say, <laughs> That's a great Where answer. do you want to play? <laughs> Final question to you uh, Women's sports overall, there's a lot of eyeballs, there's a lot of money. It's a growth story. So, my question to you is what stage of the growth are we at? Is it closer to pre IPO Google? Are we past that point? Um, do you worry, perhaps, that it's getting froppy like an FTX in late 2022? Yeah, I, I would say we're approaching, or you know, the tween years, at least for the WNBA. Um, I think women's sports overall, huge momentum. We're going to get a huge lift off the Women's World Cup soccer this year. We're going to get a huge lift off the Olympics next year. The USA Women's National Team is going for their eighth consecutive gold medal there in Paris next year. It will be an all-time record in the history of team sports in the Olympics. And guess what? None of you probably know about it, right? <laughs> um, so um, yeah, we, we, ha we have to market around this. We have to uh, capitalize on it. But I think there's never been a better time to invest in this growth story. We are a sports media and entertainment property that is growing. Kathy Engelbert, thank you so much. Commissioner of the thank WNBA. You,
Please welcome to the stage Coinbase co-founder, chairman, and CEO, Brian Armstrong with Bloomberg Sonali Basic. Brian, you're quite the man of the hour. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, just yesterday, uh, Coinbase and the SEC have been kind of in this months, maybe years long dispute here over uh, de defining a lot of the crypto environment. And they brought a certain amount of charges against you, to which uh, your chief legal officer yesterday. ...about the business. So we were very forthcoming. We met with them probably 30 times over the last year. Um, and we started to kind of ask them for feedback. And we said, you know, we, we would like there to be a robust market in the U.S. to trade crypto securities. Of the 1,000 plus assets we'd re we've reviewed today, we've rejected 90% of them. The ones we've traded, we believe, are commodities. What feedback do you have for this for us? How can we come in and register? How can we work together? And unfortunately, we were met with silence. Uh, we really got no feedback in those 30 meetings. Um, the first meeting where they were scheduled to come and give us feedback, they canceled it a few days before that. And then we got a Wells notice a few days after that. So it's really unfortunate. We work with regulators all over the world, other regulators here in the US. Um, I think I've, I'm a reasonable person to get along with. Um, but unfortunately, the SEC under you know, this chair has taken a regulation by enforcement approach instead of creating a clear rule book in the US that can allow this industry to be built in a safe and trusted way. You know, when was the last time you personally met with Gary Gensler, and what did you say? Right, so when he first came in as the chair, um, I, I flew out to New York, I, I reached out to him, our teams reached out. I tried to make an effort to connect with him in person because that's what I try to do whenever a new regulator kind of comes in. To connect with him in person because that's what I try to do whenever a new regulator kind of comes in. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to connect at that time. I'm not sure why uh, we couldn't get on his calendar. Um, and we followed up a few times in the, in the year after that. We eventually got a meeting that was virtual. It may, it may, you know, it may have been COVID related or something like that. but. We were able to get a, a virtual meeting, but unfortunately, it was frankly like a pretty icy reception. I would say, um, you know, I, we sort of came in hat in hand and said, "Hey, Chair Gensler, you know, you, you've asked people to come in and register respectfully. We're here to register. What would you like us to do? What what um, process would you like us to, you know, talk to your lawyer? I'm not here to advise you." And um, that was kind of how the absolutely we do. And I want to make an important point, which is that um, the SEC chair may have a certain point of view, but that's not representative of the whole US government. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. I would say um, the SEC chair is a, is a bit of an, is really an outlier here, kind of um, in the US government. So when I meet with members of Congress, I think the broad consensus, probably amongst 80% of people I talk to on both sides of the aisle, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty reasonable view they have, which is we don't know exactly what this technology is gonna become, but we're seeing every other major financial hub in the world move towards clear legislation, we need to make sure that this innovation happens in the US in a way that, again, let's just protect consumers, let's apply some, some basic good ideas around AML KYC and audited financial statements and make sure there's no wash trading. Let's create a clear market structure where you know, businesses can understand which CFTC, SEC, who should, who should they talk to about which types of assets. So Congress is, is recognizing this and the, the White House is as well. Actually, the Biden administration put out an executive order about a year ago, um, kind of asking all the branches of government to sort of say, get your act together on crypto. We don't, there's some risks, but there's some real important opportunities with this technology. Let's create a clear regulatory framework. Will you fight this all the way to the Supreme Court? Do you think you'll have to, and do you have the financial resources to do that? Yeah, so um, even if this takes- Will you fight this all the way to the Supreme Court? Do you think you'll have to, and do you have the financial resources to do that? Yeah, so um, even if this takes some time, uh, you know, that's okay. Um, we, we, we've, so in Q1, we were adjusted EBITDA positive as a company, even in the depths of this crypto bear market, if you want to call it that. We have over $5 billion of balance on the balance sheet, right? So, um, and, and frankly, even though that this complaint came in from the SEC, it's really business as usual today, right? Uh, we're continuing to trade the assets that we have on our platform. Um, you know, we trade over 200 assets on our platform. The SEC complaint mentioned just 13 of them. Being great products for our customers and making sure we don't lose sight of that. And so this is a very serious matter that I'm going to work on with a couple of our executives. 
Um, but really, the vast majority of the company needs to keep building because that's how this technology is going to ultimately benefit a billion people, hopefully. How long does the regulatory overhang last? The reality is this could take many, many months. And do you think that your investors might lose some faith or even your customers while you go through this? Yeah, well, I mean, look, this is not a new concept, right? Um, there's been lots of discussion. The SEC has had rhetoric around this for several years that I think has influenced the market. Um, and so the investors in Coinbase are you know, comfortable with that if they're because they're, they're, it's all public, right? And it's not like some secret thing that's being revealed. Um, and I think they're taking a long-term view that um, Coinbase is a very different company. We're kind of in an N of one, right? We're, we're really the only company that was based here in the US that went public, that has audited financial statements, that's taken a compliance first approach. Um, you know, even in this recent SEC complaint, by the way, that came out yesterday, it was unfortunate they, they sort of did it back to back with other, another complaint that went out there. And I, you know, that may have been intentional to try to conflate the two, but I think people are smarter than that and they recognize that um, you know, this complaint against Coinbase, there were no allegations, <clears throat> no allegations of uh, mis misappropriation of customer funds. There was no allegations of wash trading. You know, myself and the executive team were not named personally. Um, it's really debating this more technical legal question of are some of these assets commodities or are they securities? And um, I think that's something the court will have to decide to sort of get some legal press, some case law out there, which will ultimately benefit us because we, that's what we've been asking the, the SEC for for a long time is how do we get more clarity? So if we need to go to the courts to do it, um, it's not our first choice. We'd rather the, the regulator had just published a clear rule book. But if they're not going to do that, the courts are there in the U.S. to avail ourselves of. So part of this was about securities <clears throat> being registered or not. And it serves an important part of these decentralized blockchains. And I guess I should mention also that um, you know, Coinbase's staking product is, is architected and built um, in a way to be compliant. And we actually think it's materially different than some of the other ones out there which have been called staking. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're going to continue to operate our staking business. So if users wanted their funds back in the staking service at this point in time, does Coinbase have the ability to service that at scale in case that there is a larger run on the staking business? Yeah, so, um, you know, staking is really something that's a decentralized uh, part, of, part of these decentralized protocols. So Coinbase is really just, um, you know, it's a pass-through mechanism. We're helping people access these decentralized protocols. So some of the decentralized protocols have, for instance, like a lockup period of, you know, some number of days when you initiate the withdrawal request. And so we're just making that kind of information available to the customer. Um, but it's, yeah, you know, all the, the funds are there backed one-to-one. -one. When, you're, when you're staking something, it's being pledged into these, um, these decentralized protocols. And, we actually don't even have the ability to you know, move it somewhere else at that point. It's, um, we're just giving people access to these decentralized protocols. So the business face withdrawals, does that have a material impact on Ethereum's price? And how does Coinbase prepare for something like that? Um, I'm so, what do you mean? Is there kind of a broader run that you have to be prepared for? Ethereum's price. And how does Coinbase prepare for something like that? Um, I'm so, what do you mean? Is there kind of a broader run that you have to be prepared for? Oh, well, okay. So in in our business, we're not we're not a bank, right? We don't do fractional reserve, um, and so there's not really this concept of a run, right? All the all the funds are there, backed one to one, and you don't have to take our word for it. You know, our as a public company, we have auditors, Deloitte in this case, who's gone in and verified all of that. And you can kind of confirm it in our financial statements. So, um, you know, if people want to withdraw funds, they 100% of it is there. There's no such thing as a run, really. So Second largest stablecoin out there. And um, as you mentioned, interest rates in this environment, that's been both a good source of revenue for us, but it's also something that we've um, passed along to customers. So uh, customers can actually uh, earn rewards on USDC um, and get, get access to some of these higher interest rate environments. Broader question, not just about Coinbase, but about the <clears> industry. <throat> as you know, more regulatory enforcement actions come to the forefront, how much of an overhang do you think that will have on crypto pricing? You know, it's hard for me to say. It was actually kind of surprising. Yesterday, with, with this complaint that came out, crypto was up, um, which I would not have expected. So I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if it means that people knew something was coming, but they expected it to be worse than it, than it actually was, or um, um, if they just felt that, you know, they're, they're still a believer in it or something. But, uh, you know, 
I, I don't try to predict what's going to happen in these markets. You know, <laughs> uh, we don't operate a hedge fund or anything like that. Um, we just want to provide a good service to our customers around the exchange and all the products we offer. Before I let you go, I want to ask about not crypto. I want to ask about artificial intelligence. We've been okay. talking about it all day. As a crypto entrepreneur, how do you see uh, AI? Do you see it as a competing factor uh, in terms of dollars going towards technology? Do you <coughs> see it dovetailing with your industry at all? Well, AI is certainly one of those couple really important technology trends that the US needs to get right along with crypto. And I think we're seeing a similar question start to happen in Congress along with crypto is like, hey, how should this be regulated so it can be done in a safe, trusted way? Um, I do think there's a couple interesting intersections between AI and crypto. Uh, one of them is that you know, in the world of AI, there, it, you know, it's so easy to mass generate things, whether it's a news article or images. Um, and so the provenance of those and the authenticity of it can be a little bit hard to figure out. And in a world of crypto, one of the great things about crypto, you know, with NFTs and whatnot, you can actually have a digital signature that proves, you know, maybe build this website and spin up this server. And so they're going to need um, financial money. They're going to need money to go do things in the world, these, these uh, AI agents. And so I think that actually in the future, you're probably going to see a lot of crypto transaction happening between AI agents or um, AI and various businesses around the world. Because Crypto is kind of the native money of the internet. The internet, the internet is global, it's decentralized. Every country, everybody in the world can participate in it. Um, and so it wouldn't really make sense to use um, you know, the dollar or the euro in a truly global context if you, you, know, you want to be country agnostic. So I think AI will use crypto more. How much are you actually working on that future? Mm. Um, so our <laughs> we're not trying to build something that is um, allowing bots to like transact in crypto at the moment, but what we are doing is we're building good infrastructure, you know, picks and shovels, if you will. So with Coinbase Cloud, for instance, um, we're making our APIs around how crypto is stored and transacted and commerce happens. And we're just exposing those kind of like Amazon Web Services, but to any business that wants to integrate it. So I suspect more businesses will integrate that over time and some of those may use AI. Um, we're also using AI in our business in a few other ways. I mean, we use it a lot for fraud prevention. Um, you know, and unfortunately, we, we get people uh, signing up, putting in stolen credentials and things like that. And so we've developed a lot of really good um, machine learning to detect that. And um, you know, we're occasionally we're testing it in a few other areas too. Just like around, actually, like you know, our design teams um, they'll sometimes look at um, Midjourney or Dolly and sort of generate an interface using AI. Or at least, like you know, show me five ideas for what an interface might look like um, to do remittances in crypto or for content creators to uh, have a direct relationship with their audience. And what would the interface for that? And AI is just like a great assistant. It, you know, it doesn't. I don't think AI really is taking people's jobs, it's taking tasks off their plates, largely, to make their jobs more efficient. And so Towards the bank of elevators, to take you up to the 29th floor, you can enjoy the views and your lunch there. For those of you who registered for the breakout lunch session, uh, building a portfolio with solid infrastructure, which is probably sponsored by Principal Asset Management, uh, please also make your way up to the 29th floor where our staff will direct you. And if you are tuning in, to that lunch session virtually. Please scroll down to the next session on the agenda tab and you can click to join the broadcast there at 12.15. So for those of you still sitting here, our main stage program will resume at 1.30 p.m. sharp. And this afternoon we'll be featuring conversations with Mark Lazary, Ray Dalio, and financial content creator Kyla Scanlon. So enjoy your lunch, we'll see you back here soon. Same place, yes.
facets and features But it's just a string of empty words We 
demon carving out a smile All you want to do is burst Well, there's nothing you could hide That could ever be too dark to tell And I'm crossing all my fingers That you'll come out of your shell And now you can The way it is, the way you are, yeah, you can hang your heart up on my wall, now I won't let it down, won't let you fall, I've been trying to put my finger on the thing that really makes you glow. Soaking up your eyes You don't even seem to know I know it's not easy And I know it gets so dark But I'm sure it would be harder If I didn't have your spot Just the way you 
can't be sleeping Keep on waking Without the woman next to me Guilt is burning Inside I'm hurting This ain't a feeling I can keep So blame it on the night Don't blame it on me Don't blame it on me Blame it on the night Don't blame it on me Don't blame it on me
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in 10 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Sports and money, they've always gone together. But never before have sports been so massively influential and as lucrative as they are today. We set out to find what's happening and what's about to happen at the nexus of business, sports, and culture. From the pickleball courts of Arizona, to the Kabaddi tournaments in India, to the cornhole boards at your local tailgate, this is what's next in sports. Please welcome to the stage, Bloomberg's Jason Kelly. <laughs> Robust applause after lunch, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for watching that trailer. That's our new show, Next in Sports, which is out of our Bloomberg Originals group, myself and Vanessa Perdomo. Uh, we debuted, we premiered the series last week about pickleball. We're going to talk a little bit about pickleball in a second. Um, and uh, airing tonight at 10 p.m. on Bloomberg Television and going wide tomorrow on YouTube, you will see our look at Formula One. Um, more to come on that. You saw a little bit about what you're going to hear. Um, thank you again for being here. I hope you had a good lunch. I have a little bit of housekeeping uh, to do here. And actually, let's take a look before we talk sports at what's going on in the market. You know, you guys care about this stuff. Um, so fair amount of green uh, on the screen. I'm going back to my Bloomberg Business Week days and how to read the Bloomberg because now I just do sports stuff. Um, but yeah, looking pretty good. So your money's safe. So settle in, and you know we're gonna have a we're gonna have a good conversation. Um, again, a few housekeeping reminders for our virtual attendees. If you experience any issues with audio or video, refresh your browser. If, if you don't know how to do that, I, I can't help you. Um, or if you really need help, use the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen for support. 
If you're here live in the audience, uh, you can find Wi-Fi information on your badge. Uh, and also, please take out your phones if you haven't done it already and scan this QR code. We're gonna be doing some polling. In fact, we may do a poll during this session coming up uh, with Mark Lazary, so you'll wanna be able to weigh in on that because I know he's gonna have some thoughts on the question that we're gonna be asking you. And to access both of those features, scan the QR code on the screen or type in your browser meet.ps slash Bloomberg invest. Good luck with that. You'll toggle, toggle back and forth between Q&A and polling by just going to the bottom of the screen and clicking the corresponding icons. All right, enough of that. Let's get to Mark Lazary. Uh, we're gonna talk all about sports and investing and I guarantee you from knowing Mark for a while and talking backstage, he's raring to go. Come on up, Mark. So you can sit on the couch or we can pretend like we're watching a game over here. All right. How are you doing? Thank you. Um, great to see you. Pleasure. Um, you have, I, I think I have a pretty fun job. You have a super fun job as well. We want to talk about sports in all aspects. We're going to talk about the Bucks. We're going to talk about pickleball because it, you had some comments about that uh, a couple weeks ago that went viral on the Bloomberg, thanks to my colleague, Shanali Basik. Um, but I have to ask you, I have to start by asking you about the big sports story of the day. Number one story in the Bloomberg yesterday. I talked to Henry Kravis about it earlier. Live golf, live PGA coming together. You're a deal maker, you're an investor in sports. I don't know if you're a golfer, but what do you make of this? I think it's fascinating. It's um, last thing any of us thought was gonna happen. So <clears throat> I think what I'd love to understand is the details of the deal, like why did the PGA uh, tour do this? It's clear why Liv did it. So I'd want to understand, you know, what are the financial, what's the deal? Like why did they, um, where a week ago, a day ago, a year ago, um, that was the devil and today they're your partner. Yeah, and you think it's good for golf? I mean, from it, you're someone who, constantly now is assessing what's a good investment when it comes to sports. We're gonna talk a lot about that over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. What do you think? Um, look, I, I can make you an argument both ways. I can make you an argument it's better to have competition, um, and I can make you an argument it's better to have a monopoly, right? So I think um, when you've got competition, it, there's more costs involved when you have a monopoly, you're controlling the process. So that tends to be better. Any business is better if you have a monopoly. Um, but for fans, it's better when you have competition. Mm -hmm. I wanna sort of pan, pan out a little bit and, and get to sort of the fundamentals of what you see in the world of sports. You have, by th this is just math, you've been a very successful investor already in this asset class, which it does seem to be an asset class. How did you identify that sports is something that you wanted to pursue as an investment? To me, what sports really is, it's you're buying a media company and you're buying a media company pretty cheap. And it's the only thing today in the world <clears throat> that you, you can't record, right? So all of us will want to watch something, you record it, and or you'll sort of stream it. Um, sports you can't do. You can't record Super Bowl. You can't record today's third game of the NBA Finals. I mean, yes, you can, but you're not watching it three weeks later, right? So um, that live aspect is actually fabulous. And so if you, what you want to be able to do today in sports is you want to figure out, so pickleball is actually, if you sort of think about it, um, when I invested in pickleball, I bought the franchise for 100000 Today, those franchises are worth five or 10 million. So that's a great return on your investment. But what's the opportunity? If Pickleball gets media rights, if people are putting it on TV and you're watching it, um, then that value of that franchise will go up. So I'll, I'll try to prove my point, right? So everybody here, who watches the Olympics, raise your hand. Right, so the vast majority of people. All right, have you ever watched curling on the Olympics? Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, as a media executive told me, if you watch curling, you'll watch anything. 
<laughs> I mean, think about it. What are you watching? You're watching somebody <laughs> throw a ball on ice. Imagine if I explained it to you. I said, here's, the, here's my idea of a great sport. <laughs> I'm going to have a guy. He's going to take a ball. He's going to roll it on the ice. And there's a little circle. He's going to try to get it in there. And you're going to go, OK, yeah, that seems tough. And then I'm going to have another guy. He's going to have a rake. And he's going to rake the ice to make it go faster. You're like, why would he do that? I go, that's the idea. <laughs> what do you think? And she'd go, OK, next. But that's on TV. And why is that? So the reason it is is because people love the best in the world to compete. That's, all, that's why you're watching it. You're not watching it because you love curling. You're watching it because you're watching what you think are the best people in the world compete. And that's why pickleball can take off. That's why padel can take off. That's why darts or whatever the sport is. And if you're able to find the right sport, then that's really what you have is you're going to get media rights because more people are going to watch that. As more people watch that, the value of your franchise goes up. So if Pickleball signs a deal where now you're watching it on TV and the value of that franchise will just keep moving up because you're going to get paid more and more for people to play, for people to air that. That's what you're buying when you're buying a sports team. So when you assess something, building on what you're saying, then you have to make some sort of bet on why someone would watch X versus Y, why someone would watch yeah. Pickleball. How do you do that? Um, well, believe it or not, it actually isn't that hard. You actually talk to a lot of people and find out, hey, do you like Pickleball? And you start where it's taking a hold, where it usually started you know, down south, right? Because it you could play it outdoors. And the more people you talk to, when you find that it's a wide array of people, mm. you know that there's a real high likelihood. So I think the next big opportunity is in women's sports, right? Why? Because more and more people, if you see the last, uh, the women's NCAA tournament, you had more people watching that, right? NCAA women's final, the tickets, went for more than the men's final, right? So you didn't know that, did you? All right. The haters will say that's because there was only 20,000 seats in the women's, whereas the men had 60,000. But at the end of the day, those seats, people were paying more. And when I look at that, I sort of see that over the next, here, here's another question, right? And you guys, you'll just prove all my points, hopefully, <laughs> uh, since I don't know the answers, um, and I hope you're going to do it the way I asked. So right now, I think it's like 90, 95% of all sports on TV is when you're watching it, it's about male, it's male sports, right? It's football, basketball. All right. Do you think over the next five years that number goes up or down? Right. It's going to go down. It should go down. You're going to have more women's sports. You're going to have different things. So if you believe that, that means you're going to have more media rights for women's sports. And if you have more media rights, then the value of those franchises will go up. So I think today you can get involved in women's soccer. You can get involved in basketball. You can get involved in all these different sports. Um, if you look at kids, they're, they want to see other women play. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing that there's this tremendous amount of demand, and it'll sooner or later take over by from the media rights. Well, and you've seen that. I mean, the NWSL is a really interesting yes, it is. case study there. The franchises, I believe, round numbers went for 2 to $3 million two years ago, and then they just went for 53 yes. uh, for the Bay Area franchise that that a, a institutional investor. And I think that's what you're going to find. I think in women's sports, uh, women's soccer should go from $50 million to $500 million in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So were you looking actively at women's sports? Uh, yeah. No, we're going to do uh, – we're going to raise a sports fund, but for right now, for me – until I have that, um, and I'm going to partner up with a, you know, somebody who everybody would know. We're hopefully doing the docs, and it'll get done soon. But what? Until then, I'll either do it personally, mm -hmm. or we'll do it through our sports fund. And so, when you thought about that 
fund, you obviously bring some interesting experiences to the table, most notably your ownership, uh, which you just exited, of the Bucks. Let's talk about that experience. It, the decision to buy and the decision to sell. Sell. Start with start with buying. What what was the thought process there? So when we bought the team, um, I remember David Stern said to me, "Today, you have just done the second hardest thing you will ever do." I was like, "Wow, okay." I thought it was actually the hardest thing was buying the team. He goes, "Nope, second hardest." I go, "What's the hardest?" He goes, "Selling." Mm. And you know, you start laughing. You go, ah, "That's funny." Uh, <laughs> But it turned out he was right. So um, at the time when we bought the team, the reason was that the national media rights were going to be over the next two years. So we thought at the time you were getting not, uh, the media right was $900 million for the league, which means there's 30 teams, so you were getting $30 million. We thought, um, or at least I thought, that the next deal would be about double. And so if it was $1.8 billion, um, each team would end up getting $60 million. So once that happened, the value of franchises would go up, right? And so I was totally wrong, and the value ended up being three times. Okay? So it was $90 million, $2.7 billion. Um, so the value of the franchises within two years, I think we paid uh, $500 million, went up to about a $1 billion. So um, that was a good day. Um, so you're, you're happy. And you know, the value kept going up. And I think now there's another media deal that's getting done. And everybody believes that's going to be two or three times. So it seemed that now was a good time because people are already pricing that value mm. in. Um, whereas before, they were not pricing it in. And I think today it's being priced in. Um, and I'll find out in five years if it was a good sale. I, I think the value of teams will keep going up. I just don't know if they can keep going up by the same percentage that they had gone up 10 right. years ago. So to that point, we, we asked you guys to answer a question. In percentage terms, which sports teams will give the best 10-year investment return? Let's throw up the, uh, the results there. So, oh, still voting. Oh, it's moving. It's moving right now. <laughs> it's live. Um, MLS, interestingly enough, is Essentially in first, we're gonna give it a give it a minute to settle. Esports, MLS, pickle. So the as you can see, esports, Major League Soccer, pickleball, WNBA, right. NFL. Does that track for you? Um, I can understand why people are saying that. I think on the esports, um, the hard part about esports is you've got to own um, the IP. Mm -hmm. And I think that's harder to do. So I think I think the growth in esports will be huge. Um, people love going to watch those um, tournaments and watch people do that. I think soccer is poised to really grow um, in the United States. I think that you know men's soccer is going to take off, women's soccer is going to take off. So I agree with that. Um, I think WNBA absolutely. Yeah. I think that's. That's a hidden gem. Um, pickleball, I think, if you're able to get the media rights, absolutely. Um, the NFL is steady. I think the good news about the NFL is it's you'll you'll make a very solid return on right. your investment. Right, right. Well, and I mean the the way it's set up. I mean the economics are unbelievable. If you're in the, <coughs> the you know the recurring uh, recurring revenue. Um, so what do you take from the Bucks experience that you will employ or deploy in in this fun environment. What's um, the biggest lesson? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a cold. Um, I think it was a great it was a great experience. I absolutely loved it. Um, you you got to play fantasy basketball every day. Which um, I think was one of the best things that I've ever been able to do in my life. I think um, you you got to be part of a great organization. I think Adam Silver is a phenom phenomenal commissioner. Um, you got to be partners with twenty nine other individuals. So 
I think you learned a lot. You compete against people on the court, but at the same time, um, you're actually partners in the whole. So I think for me, the experience was unique. I've been able to use that experience and that knowledge to now translate to do other things in sports. Mm -hmm. You know, we turned a team that was the worst team in the league that literally within five years, we did a champ, we ended up having a championship team. Thank you so much. Um, and that's pretty unique, right? When we won the championship, um, you, the NBA comes to you and says, you're gonna, you're gonna go on national TV and you're gonna hold this trophy up. And you're like, oh yeah, that's no problem. And before I go, my son says to me, he goes, dad, just so you know, it's really heavy. <laughs> Whatever you do, <laughs> don't drop it. <laughs> and now the only thing I'm thinking is, how heavy is this stupid thing? <laughs> <laughs> Did I work out? What have I <laughs> right, done? Right, right. I gotta let, and they say to you, I'm like, oh, great. And they go, look, you get the trophy and then you lift it over your head and you walk around to show it to everybody. And I'm like, okay, and the only thing you're thinking is how heavy is this? <laughs> um, so Adam Silver gets the trophy and he hands it to me. I'm like, oh, it can't be that heavy. And he gives it to me, I'm like, fuck, it's heavy, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, it's really heavy. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I pick it up and I'm lifting it. You know, you, you're going slow because you obviously don't want to drop it. Um, so afterwards, you know, lifting it, it's all good. Everybody screams. Um, I must have gotten a thousand texts that day <laughs> afterwards. And, you know, the bunch of people are like, looked like the trophy was heavy. You were having a hard time <laughs> lifting that thing up. And really, I, I, and I respond, no, it's not that it was heavy. I just didn't want to drop it, so I was going slow to make sure. <laughs> but on TV, it looks like, eh. <laughs> So, yeah, but it was a, a bit of a unique experience. Yeah. And so what, what are you most excited about investing in? I mean, you mentioned women's sports, but they take me a level down. Like, what, what's the analysis that you're doing? You talked about the, the media rights, but, like, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the secret sauce that you can bring? Because you got more and more people getting into this. When you guys bought the Bucks, it was a little bit novel. Now it feels like everyone's trying. I mean, we're talking about sports all day today and, and tomorrow. So um, I think what I've learned, I can turn that into trying to make teams into championship teams. I'll give you a good example. You could today. So I would like to go out and buy teams in Africa. I want to buy basketball teams in Africa. I think Africa today is 20, it's where the league was in, in the US 10, 20 years ago. You want to do the same thing in Asia. You want to do the same thing in India. You can do very similar things in Europe um, with EuroLeague. There are these massive opportunities out there that really need someone who understands what it's like and what you need to do um, to win a championship, but what you need to do to win. And so you can take your business experience um, and you can take your experience owning a team. And when you put the two of them together, there just aren't that many people who've really done that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that'll end up being a little bit different and hopefully be unique and enable us to do things that others have not. Well, I could talk to you all day uh, about this stuff and look forward to our next conversation. Um, I'm glad you didn't drop the trophy. So am I. Um, and I'm glad you're invested in pickleball too and we got to talk about that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>
welcome. I'm so pleased to be here with Boaz Weinstein. Some of you may know who he is. He is the head of Saba Capital Management. He rose to prominence both as a derivatives trader at Deutsche Bank and then, of course, in 2012, being on the opposite side of the J.P. Morgan London Chief Investment Officer uh, Office, which is known as the London Whale, and has since won this year's Institutional Investor Top Credit, as well as activist hedge fund managers. He is here, and I've got to say, he is here the day after his 50th birthday. <laughs> Boaz, <laughs> I want to start with, it's been 35 years. 15, when you were 15 years old, you fell in love with Wall Street. What's changed since then? You know, turning 50 does feel different, if, in case anyone's wondering who hasn't done it yet, than, than 49, and so I have been reflecting a bit. I thought about how I um, started on Wall Street. I was very lucky to get a job my sophomore year of college uh, at Merrill Lynch after school, full time in the summer. And I basically spent those years with thinking about Wall Street, being on Wall Street, and playing chess. And I woke up yesterday, a little bit earlier than the rest of my family, and I played five games of speed chess and thought about, and thought about Wall Street. And I realized, like, for me at least, 35 years later, basically nothing's changed. I still, I'm still very passionate about Wall Street. I'm still <laughs> passionate about chess, and uh, that's, that's who I am. Well, how do you play chess at a moment like this, or how do you use some of the lessons at a time of such incredible uncertainty when everyone's trying to figure out what the parameters are to even trade within? Yeah, so, you know, chess is attributed to thinking some number of moves ahead and seeing the future, and I kind of, I think it's great for a lot of things. Uh, it's great for concentration, it's great for planning, but I feel like this market, you know, we have this heavy fog outside, thanks to our Canadian friends, and we have, I think, a big, a big Plain fog. <laughs> we have a big fog in the market because you know, the, the bond market was pretty sure that the Fed was done like a hike ago, and now, and, and this one was a mistake, but all of a sudden now there's a, maybe gonna be another one or, or two to come, or, one, or 50 in, in July, and so, so the market is constantly wrong, and individuals are wrong. Trans, team transitory was, was said with confidence and then wrong, and I think we just have to accept that there is a thick fog right now, and fixed point prediction, this will happen, that will happen, there won't be a recession, there'll be um, a hard landing. Those, you know, thinking about chess to figure out four moves ahead isn't really the right game. Um, I think it's much more apt to think about poker where you have an opponent and you raise, you bet, they raise, you re-raise, they go all in and now you have to think, what do I know? What's the range of hands that they could have? Could they be bluffing? Might they have anything other than pocket aces for any of you who know what I'm talking about? Or might they have any two cards? And so I think right now we're in a almost any two cards kind of scenario. There's a lot of chances of different outcomes. And instead of saying, I think there'll be a recession or I won't, or there won't, which I, I kind of howl, howl at the TV screen when I hear that, I feel like you have to think about ranges of outcomes. And even if you know, I listened to Stan this morning, his comments were amazing, like, y you go with 40% chance of recession, or Goldman just shifted to 25. The point is that you could have a 40% chance of something happening and still want to make the investment that it happens because it's priced at 5%. And the way I look at credit right now is that there's almost no chance of a real pickup in defaults priced into credit spreads. And so through that range of outcomes informs our investment view, which is that the market, whether you look at the VIX or credit spreads, is not ready for that uncertainty. Okay, just a full disclosure, Boaz was banned, I believe, from a Scottish poker house for counting cards, was that correct? Um, <laughs> so, so different game, so we talked <laughs> okay. about chess. Oh, that was, that was That's blackjack, po there, There's right? poker, <laughs> I, I happen uh, in my misspent youth learned to count cards very well, and, um, and a Greek casino on Baker Street in London gave me a letter that I, Lisa saw um, when I was late to our meeting uh, that said that I'm no longer allowed to enter on, I think it was 10 Baker Street, uh, maybe that's Sherlock Holmes, but either way, <laughs> I'm not allowed to enter, and, um, and uh, uh, that's a different game. That's a game where it's, you have every piece of information, there's no uncertainty, what are the odds, and so, so forth. So let's dovetail that into how to get an upper hand ah. at a time when you do have this arbitrage, uh, this, this fog, and you're trying to come up with what the right parameters are, how do you know What's mispriced? How do you know where the probabilities are? What sort of do you look at to make some convictions? Yeah, so I've always gravitated to arbitrage strategies, not about predicting what will happen, but just security A against security B is mispriced. And actually by you accidentally mentioning blackjack, just reminded me that Ed Thorpe from Beat the Dealer or Beat Wall Street, this famous MIT professor, if you're watching, it's a bucket list item for me to meet you. Um, and he's still going, going strong. Um, so he, in the 1980s, did a kind of arbitrage called closed-end fund arbitrage. 
And I know that Warren Buffett, when in 1950, before he took Benjamin Graham's class, he sent me in 2018 his position report that the majority of Warren Buffett's holdings when he was about to enter that class were discounted closed-end funds. So I'm interested in arbitrage, and closed-end fund arbitrage is the thing I'm most interested in today because it is, it is tangible. It's an arbitrage that you can actually collapse yourself. You don't have to hope that Elon Musk buys Twitter in merger arbitrage, in cap structure arb. You have to hope the company behaves a certain way or certain outcomes happen in closed end fund arbitrage. You can actually control your destiny. So maybe um, I can tell you why I'm very excited about that now. Yeah, so closed end funds, let's just explain. You basically IPO a fund, for anyone who doesn't know, and you sell shares, and then you take the money and you can invest in whatever you want, and the shares should trade at the same price as the IPO or even higher, unless you know there's some kind of dissonance that you don't feel like you're gonna get all your money back. So why are you seeing an opportunity right now in this sphere? Right, so, so closed-end funds, open-ended funds, we, we typically know more about open-ended funds, so mutual funds or ETFs. If you want your money back, you're going to get NAV. It is, it is, it is a arbitrage on an ETF and in a mutual fund, they'll sell you the, a little bit of the portfolio, they'll sell a little bit of the portfolio, they'll give you back NAV. You're tethered to NAV, you always get NAV. In a closed-end fund, and there's 770 of them on the New York Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange, you have to sell it to someone else, and that might be at a 30% discount to NEV, a 2% premium, and everything in between and more. And so closed-end funds can sit at huge discounts for a very long time. As, I, as we talk here today, about three quarters of the market, the closed-end fund market, which is about a half a trillion dollar market, is trading just fine. Small discount, no discount, premium, but a quarter of it are trading at gaping discounts. And so I look at it like I'm buying dollars, for 80 cents. I'm buying a dollar for 80 cents, and unlike most investments where you have to think what's NVIDIA worth, what's the economy gonna do here, we just have to think, can we cause that 80 cents to go back to 100 through our rights to elect a board that cares about those things? The board is, of course, supposed to be operating to the benefit of shareholders, and they have a magic button. They can press a button to turn their closed-end fund into an open-ended fund. They could turn it into a mutual fund, an ETF, they could tender for shares, they could even liquidate, and they can make that discount go away. That discount today across closed-end funds, $60 billion. Okay, just, you're bearing the lead. You've declared war on BlackRock. <laughs> what are you trying to do here? <laughs> so, um, well, I wouldn't call it war on BlackRock. We've, we've been investing for a decade in this space, and funds that are at structural discounts, that are at double-digit discounts, 15, 20% discounts, even if they hold something as benign as California muni bonds, in the case of, for example, BFZ um, or MUC, those are two BlackRock California closed-end funds. And in 2020, when we had a mini skirmish with them, uh, on New York muni funds, they just merged them into their New York muni open-ended fund, and every single investor, including the employees at these firms, benefited because they own, they were eating their own cooking, and everyone won. But the reason there's a battle, the reason you called it a war, is because at the upper level of management, which is really the only place where there's any pushback, they would like to keep the money trapped because they'll get a higher multiple from the stock market if it's in closed-end fund form that they can keep forever versus an ETF where the stock market will say, well, people could redeem from that. And so we have three live campaigns. One of them is super ironic because it's a campaign on an um, uh, ESG fund. The ticker for that is ECAT, E-C-A-T. Um, there's a fund called Big Z, which is like Kathy Wood's ARC. It lost, um, since its IPO in March 2021, it lost 54%. And then a California Muni Fund, BFZ. If they turn those funds into open-ended funds or conducted tenders at NAV, every single shareholder would win, and that is $580 million to all shareholders from them pressing a button. How much has your portfolio of closed-end shares increased as a share of your overall holdings? I, in the past year, have been amazed at how the discounts for some of these funds have ballooned out to 20 cents, 20% 20 discount, and we, in our flagship fund, are 46% invested in closed-end funds. And particularly with BlackRock, because they are the world's largest, largest asset manager, because they are talking the talk on ESG, they're saying, this is how we want to be treated when we are shareholders in IBM or Disney or what have you, I believe they have to walk the walk. They cannot use entrenchment mechanisms to prevent us from putting people on the board. And I'll just say that they're a thought leader, but what they are doing to entrench with respect to stripping shareholder rights, banning shareholder proposals, which they've done, puts them 
at, on the G side of, of governance as the worst company in the S&P 500. So taking a step back, people might say they came here thinking that you were going to come here and say the world is falling, credit's going to fall out of bed, bet against it, these sort of broad proclamations, and instead you're finding these sort of nuanced trades that you can arbitrage out right now. So I'm wondering how do you find more comfort in some of the market technicals and sort of that aspect of the market rather than the fog? How, how do you sort of dovetail investing in, you know, basically Kathy Wood's fund because you think that it's a correct discount without understanding <laughs> sort of the broader, the broader sphere of things? Very, very fair. So it is quite easy. In fact, BlackRock's incredible success as a firm, they have lookalike products that are ETFs and you can hedge that. You can hedge the closed end with the underlying exposures like uh, Ed Thorpe used to do in the 1980s or you could um, or Warren Buffett thought it was cheap enough that he would hold it just outright. Um, uh, or you could actually find one of these ETF lookalikes. There's ECAT on, on the BlackRock side, and then there are multiple multi-billion dollar um, e ESG funds that are mutual funds that trade at NAV, that are great hedges, that are great merger partners for BlackRock. And so we can eliminate the market exposure and isolate just the, t the, uh, the discount. And to your qu question, how do we navigate technicals, you know, Don Fitzpatrick was speaking today about how attractive agency mortgages are. And, um, and uh, Dan Iveson yesterday uh, about how amazing agency mortgages are, that we have, we have Fannie and Freddie trading at wider spreads for a couple of reasons, uh, one of them being technical, purely technical, than even triple B corporates. So how to navigate technicals, I feel like it's become way more important in this environment. And technicals can sting, that technical can remain. And so one thing that's great about the closed-in strategy is it's, it's a closed loop. You can elect a board that cares to press that button and repatriate in those three funds only $580 million. Do you also think that the technicals are attractive for agency mortgage-backed securities? I think they're, for the reasons Don mentioned, unattractive. You had two-thirds of the buyers of these products now actual sellers. You have, you know, uh, BlackRock, for example, selling on behalf of Silicon Valley Bank. You have the Fed in, in almost in QE type of terms or not Q, Q, uh, QT, not QE. And so you're up against this technical. The technical has created the cheapness and the technical may very well remain, but it's a very different world. I think it's true for meme stocks as well. We saw it's not about what fundamentally a stock is worth. It's about what are the technicals, when might the technicals change, and that's the biggest driver to me of asset prices in, um, in my career. You talk about technicals, and that really raises a question of the fragility of markets and kind of market structure at a time when you have seen real concentration in a number of funds, and it seems like there is more kind of massive swings in certain areas. Do you feel like this market is more fragile or less fragile than it was a couple of years ago? I think there's a real fragility which showed itself March 2020 when all of a sudden the bond market and even uh, ETFs uh, were in free fall and, um, and it was really because of this supply demand imbalance. When I started in the business, there, there was, it was almost inappropriate to think that a mom and pop investor would own junk bonds or CLO tranches, but now with, with all of the, with the rise of the asset management industry bringing these products, we just heard today Henry Travis speak eloquently about bringing private equity to mom and pop investors. And that's really double edged because if it's in a product where they can sell on a, on, on a day's notice or no day's notice, you know, it can create real challenges. Um, or if there could be a, an avalanche because somebody gets their leverage cut in the private credit market and then, and then someone else has to sell. So I think that, um, there, the fragility remains. It's been um, it, it was uh, it's been tamped down by the incredible accommodation that the government made at, during COVID. And but the danger is still lurking. Do you think that private credit is an area of substantial risk? Do you think it's in the real estate sector? Do you think that it's just uh, in sort of public credit? Is there an area that you think is most mispriced right now? I think that um, private credit gets an incredible amount of airtime, including in today's conference. The speaker before, Mark Lazary, I've heard him uh, on Bloomberg speak about how incredible the opportunity is to make secured loans at 13%. Now that, that does sound incredible and you can withstand a pretty high default rate. Now flip it around to the person, the company that's borrowing at 13%, maybe into an economic slowdown, maybe into a world where that 13 will turn into 13 and a half because the Fed is not done hiking yet. You have this base rate that has gone from zero to five and a quarter, five, and it's headed higher um, if you believe Again, the, the, the experts that I have, uh, I don't know what I believe other than uh, to, to keep a wide range out, out there. And so private credit, which was a cottage industry a decade ago, a quarter trillion dollars is now 1.4, 1.5 trillion. 
And a lot of those companies are going to suffer under the weight of those interest payments, and it is almost for sure, recession or no recession, that the default rate is going to rise. A few weeks ago, eight companies defaulted over a weekend, including one in your industry, Vice Media. Um, and um, <laughs> carry on. She looks a little too happy, by the, no, by the way. No, I'm not happy about um, it. I'm just, you know, carry on. So, so I, I think that <laughs> um, you know, private credit's full of opportunity, but it's also going to be full of risk, and and there will be some. Uh, potential chaos uh, should it be met with also a, uh, a slowdown in the economy. One of your big uh, lures for your fund is as a tail risk fund and as one that is seeking to preserve capital and then also do well. And I'm wondering how many investors have come to you recently who are still incredibly bearish and trying to figure out how to preserve their capital and sort of uh, make a profit on it in the way that you're advertising? Yeah, it used to be you had to find a bearish investor that wanted to invest in tail, and we could not be easily fit into a box. You mentioned we won the credit fund award, but if you look through our portfolio, though it heavily uses credit products, we're really a long volatility fund that will perform well in a, in a, in a bearish market for credit, for equities, and it used to be hard to find investors that really wanted it. But there is, there's been such a change where um, U.S. endowments, pensions, um, European uh, investors, they're not looking at it because they're bearish. They're looking at it to say, first of all, is the cost pretty attractive, which it is now. When you think about all the problems in the world and the relatively cheap cost of hedging them, what is your unique brand, if, if there is one, of, of how, to, how to accomplish that? And, and then they're thinking about it like, how do I make some money so that when the market, if the market sells off hard, instead of having to sell, I can be front-footed, I can redeem from you, take that money and invest when there's tremendous scarcity um, for, for going long when everyone else is trying to sell, like we saw in March 2020. And so they've been, I think, um, conditioned already to think about it like a way to protect against you know, problems that they would face in that sell-off to instead be um, uh, aggressive to, to buy the dip. And um, tail funds, I think, accomplish that pretty well. We only have about 90 seconds left, and I'm sure that you spend a lot of time just sitting there thinking, what am I not thinking about? What am I, you know, how do I see around corners at a time when it's your job to, to do that? So what keeps you up at night now? I mean, what's your, what's your biggest concern as you look around at how we're set up? Uh, for the economy or for, for my, my own positioning? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Very different answers. Um, both. Okay, so I think that people have been cautious for a long time. You know, it kind of comes out of the, um, the COVID mindset and you could see a lot of fear in the market. We had Ukraine, we, had, we have inflation, we have, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, senior loan officers starting to slow down on lending. And you can kind of see these problems, but at the same time, then you see this jobs number and, and it's very strong and you see, you know, signs of life. And so, so I think people are tired of being defensively positioned. And, and probably have felt some temptation, especially with this AI boom, to say, look, maybe we have to move out of T-bills back into you know, risk. And I think T-bills are so attractive because wouldn't it be beautiful to stay, stay conservatively invested if you had to be long uh, uh, with that dry powder, if you're not in a tail fund, to sell those T-bills and move in when there has been a real reckoning. I feel like the market is tired of being bearish, and so to have now, look at, looking at just the front month VIX, for example, the fear gauge, to have that now at its lowest point since, since a month into COVID, or sorry, six months into COVID. So, so almost three years now, the lowest point seems kind of wild when you think about all the uncertainty that's in the market. And so I think this is a time to be cautious because the pricing, leaving aside some AI stuff that can keep going, the pricing is not there, and we should continue to be cautious, even if that's a little bit boring. Boaz Weinstein, thank you so much for taking the time. Always a pleasure having you. Thank you, Lisa. Please welcome to the stage PGM CEO David Hunt and BNY Mellon Investment Management CEO Hanukkah Smits with Bloomberg's Amanda Cantrell. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Um, we've already heard a lot of compelling viewpoints on private credit, commercial real estate, AI. 
And we're gonna tackle all of those and more right now from the viewpoint of two CEOs who control about $3 trillion between them. Uh, we have David Hunt, who's the president and CEO of PGIM, which manages about 1.3 trillion. And Hanukkah Smith, she's the CEO of BNY Mellon Investment Management, uh, which manages about 2 trillion. Uh, so thank you both so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Great. Um, thank you. So um, I thought we'd just start by, you know, looking at the session title, Today's Assets, From Safe and Secure to Risky and Untouchable. Um, so let's start there. What's, what do you see as untouchable right now? Do I kick sure, off? Sure, go right ahead. I think, first of all, it's all about context, right? So we, we've come, we're sort of entering what we consider to be uh, a new normal, higher rate, uh, in higher rate environment, and I think um, historians uh, in decades to come will look, look actually back on the previous sort of decade and a half and realize that was actually not a sort of normal environment of very low rates and uh, the quantitative easing, which had a real impact on valuations of equities in, in particular and also of yields that were very, very low on bonds. So I think the environment that we're entering will be more attractive for bonds. We're gonna see yields, and we've already seen that increase. We expect greater interest in fixed income. And we actually also think that equities will be priced more appropriately because they will be priced based on their earnings outlooks rather than being underpinned by uh, the supply of money. So when you sort of say what is untouchable, uh, that's, in, look, we would say in any type of environment there you're always going to find a particular security in a particular asset class that is a security you don't want to touch. But that is why for us as an active manager, it's really important to highlight the importance of research that our investment firms conduct both on equities as well as, 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 well as fixed income. So from an asset class perspective, we wouldn't say that there are untouchable asset classes, but within it, it is going to be about nuance. So in equities, more likely about value than growth. But again, in growth, if you target it well, you can still find growth companies. David? So I'd add a couple of points maybe to the, to the context, because I do think that we all suffer massively from kind of home country bias. And it's very hard to generalize around the world. Um, we're in very different places um, in, in, different, in different countries. I just spent, uh, in April, two weeks in, in, in Asia. And um, you know Japan has just actually uh, put its head above the parapet with a little inflation, and they couldn't be happier about it. Um, actually, they've got a little bit of growth, and you've never seen people so excited. Uh, and China is actually disappointing to the downside, and actually, I think, really having some difficult times getting their growth engine uh, started. Europe, uh, you know, I spent a week uh, there just a uh, week before last, and at least by, by our measures, is probably now in a mild recession already. Um, the UK, uh, struggling. And then you come to the US, which I know everybody get, lo loves to cover, but um, you know, it's a completely different situation where you actually have a government that has pumped far more money, I think, than people realize into the economy. We think there's still more than a trillion dollars of excess savings uh, that are sitting there. Consumer spending continues to be very strong. And our view would be that inflation is going to be high and therefore rates are going to be higher and for longer uh, than is currently priced into the market. But when you take that picture together, the world's in very different spots. And I do think that it's never been more important uh, to have an active manager who is actually looking very carefully at the local context. Because um, you know, generalizations by sector um, simply don't work in this environment the way that they might have a few years ago. So uh, forgive me then for asking you about a specific uh, sector or a no, no, <laughs> particular no. asset class, but I do want to touch on private credit because it's, um, you know, it's come up a lot today. Uh, we write about it constantly on the terminal. Um, there's you know, a flood of cash coming in. Um, how do you view private credit? So I, I think private ec uh, private credit is a is an interesting uh, asset class, and certainly with what we've seen in the recent environment, with the banking crisis and the conditions for banks tightening, there's there's been a, a surge of demand for private credit. 
I don't think that there is yet a bubble or, or, or froth emerging, but it all, always depends, of course, always where you are, whether you're on the buy side or how much exposure to, you have to assets that, or, to, or to loans that you've already extended. Default rates are still rel relatively low. Uh, certainly when you look at that on, on historic levels, we do expect them to go up but not by as much as, as might have been predicted. And when you, when you look at the size of private credit, while it has trebled over sort of the last decade, the pool is sort of on par with um, high yield and is not inconsistent with what we think right now is needed in the environment with some retrenchments on the part of the banks. Mm -hmm. So David, you're first. So, so I would just maybe broaden the question a little bit to private assets. So. At PGM, we manage about 300 billion in private uh, private alternatives overall, um, and uh, you know that's certainly a, a large real estate business. We're the third largest real estate uh, investor in the world, um, but it's also a big private credit business. So we have about 100 billion in private credit, and that's been our fastest growing um, asset class for for sure. And I think people often look at that and they wonder wh where is this new asset class kind of coming from? And it's exactly as Hanukkah says: it's not a new asset class. It's just that a lot of this financing used to come from the banks. And following the GFC, where obviously they had to hold a lot more capital against uh, these loans, they really pulled, uh, pulled back. Um, th that combined with the real collapse of finance companies, which is another whole set of asset classes that you know, used to be financed through, uh, through banks and through uh, corporations, is now being done by private investors. So um, we think that we're actually at the moment in the er fairly early innings of all of these asset classes coming to the private markets. So we can imagine while there'll be some ups and downs, and I, I'll, I'll point out some of the downs in a moment, but we can imagine this asset class actually continuing to grow for the next decade uh, as, as banks find it more and more difficult. This used to be mostly a US phenomena. It's now actually um, you know, one of our largest markets is, is, is the UK. We're seeing it now on the continent uh, and in places like Australia. Um, but with all of that, um, I would say that in a lot of this growth has happened in a period where we have not had a good old-fashioned uh, credit crunch. Um, and uh, there will be a bit of a shakeout. Um, our model is actually to have regional offices in all of the cities around the world where we call directly on middle market companies. We get to know management. And we think our ability to underwrite and to partner with them through a cycle is very high and distinctive. We are not simply uh, brokering lo loans from the sell side. And I think that's an important distinction. I think many of the firms that set up more recently who are sort of taking calls from the sell side and doing a lot of agent deals, they are going to struggle as we go through this next downturn. But a little bit of a shakeout is probably no bad thing. But that is in the context of a broader cyclical trend where this will become much larger than it is today. Do you worry, though, that the amount of money that's coming in uh, from competitors as well is uh, outpacing the opportunity set that's there right now? At the moment, no. I mean, our, our originations are running ahead of uh, kind of what we've been able to we've been able to handle. So I would I would say at least at the moment that hasn't really happened. I suppose it it could do, but for the most part, private assets. Um, you know, have suffered a little bit from the denominator effect in many institutional investors' portfolios where their public uh, bonds and, and stocks have fallen enough that it's hard for them to be reallocating. And so what we're seeing is actually a big growth in our secondaries business because we're actually now buying GP stakes and LP stakes out so that they can recycle more money to go back into the private markets in new, in new vintages. And I think that that's an important trend that will play out over the next couple of years as well. And um, Hanukkah, to switch to uh, another completely different asset class, albeit one that you uh, referred to earlier, um, growth equity. Um, this is something that came up you know, when we were having a conversation prior to the panel as an area of potential concern for you, um, growth equity and venture in particular. Um, what are the risks there, and what do you make of the current marks of a lot of private companies? So, so I think when you look, so, so again, it's all about context, right? So when you look at the current macroeconomic outlook and the cost of the, the rise in the cost of capital, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and some of the other regional banks, which, which are very important to the VC and growth equity infrastructure, I think that asset class 
does face some headwinds. Now, notwithstanding that, I think we need to keep in mind that those portfolios are still relatively small as part of institutional and retail portfolios, right? These are exposures that investors have in the context of larger private asset allocations, but they will certainly not comprise the largest exposure. So, but I think some adjustment from a valuation perspective is appropriate and that can actually provide good opportunities for buyers in this environment. There may be some exposure and actually opportunities for those that perhaps in the secondary market, as David uh, alluded to, through the growth and venture lens. Now, having said that, where we um, remain cautious is actually more broadly on the earnings outlook, because when you look at the portfolios that we manage for our clients, they broadly continue to have exposure both through our active equity strategies as well as through the indexing business uh, to the equities markets, right? And the earnings outlook, uh, well, I think we all would agree that the uh, earnings season for the first quarter came out better than expected. And this was also in particular, I think, here in the US on the back of uh, continued uh, good economic growth. Um, the earnings outlook has also not on the whole been revised upwards, right? The drivers of growth in the markets are around technology, in particular, in particular around AI. I know we're gonna maybe talk about that a little bit later. So it's, it's, it's very specific, but for the broader sectors and for the broader index, we have yet to see an upwards revision to the earnings outlook. And I think when you then have the context that David just um, uh, outlined of global companies that have exposure not just to the US but to other parts of the world where some of the outlook is perhaps a little bit more mixed. You're going to see maybe tighter labor markets. You're still going to see the inflation impact on the expense lines of companies. There will be some margin pressure. Um, that's where actually we remain somewhat cautious Notwithstanding that, we do find good opportunities in equities, but you have to be very, very targeted, which of course what is what active managers do. I definitely want to come back to AI later, but um, David, I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask you about commercial real estate. PGM is obviously a very large holder of commercial real estate, and um, you know different uh, subsectors within that asset class are facing very different fortunes right now. Yeah, because that, that would certainly be my answer. I actually think that uh, growth equity and venture have sort of taken it soundly on the chin, and that that's not so much where I worry about marks. I worry about uh, marks now in uh, private equity books, particularly ones that are leveraged, and in 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 real estate. Um, you know, real estate marks have not really come down uh, sufficiently, uh, and I think that we are going to see you know, an important, uh, an important move downward in, in many real estate markets. I will make a couple of points of context uh, in that though. First, uh, when people ask me about real estate, actually they're asking me about office. Um, but uh, the two shouldn't be conflated. Um, many parts of the real estate market are actually doing very well. Multifamily, which is probably our largest holding, is actually holding up extremely well. Rents are doing fine. We're not having a lot of problems with payments. Um, that remains a sector that's very, uh, I think, robust. And we don't have enough housing in the United States, in the UK, and in many parts of the world. So we've been underbuilding for decades. And so I think that the long-term trends in that remain very good. Industrial remains very strong. Uh, some of that has moved from, uh, you know, kind of the big boxes on the periphery of, of cities to where it's now last mile. But uh, that is a, also a very strong sector. I mean, we thought we were gonna have a big opportunity to buy distressed hotels. We were kind of excited about all of this in the pandemic and things came back so fast, we didn't even get a chance. Um, so actually hotels are doing better than we would have, um, than, than we would have thought. Um, retail, I think has been well told, that is a difficult uh, story, but that does leave the elephant in the room, which is, uh, which is office. And office, our, our, uh, our, our head of uh, real estate that likes to say, uh, offices can be divided into three things. There are Real winners, which are mostly new offices that have been built since 2016 in prime locations. And it is amazing what new rents some of these uh, owners are being able to get. There is uh, a whole group that is kind of in purgatory, which is about you know 60% of the buildings which are not in good shape, have not been upgraded to either to climate standards or to kind of the hospitality that's wanted today. And there's 20% of the stock which is actually uh, probably gonna get the keys handed in uh, on it. So 
we, we are going to have a big workout for that purgatory uh, set over the next uh, 24 months. Prices will come down. Some of that will get reinvested and rebuilt, and others of it will have to be repurposed. So I think there is a, a true reset in value in, uh, in real estate, and now is a great time uh, to be with an active manager in real estate and not buying the index, for sure. And if I can just add to that, we sort of see the same trend. We, we have most of our exposure through our partner, Amherst, who really have exposure actually to the, to the one attractive area that David just mentioned, which is the multifamily uh, space where they manage something like 50,000 units. And if you think about what's happening in the office world and, and, and the multifamily sector, they're, they're sort of pulling in, in, in opposite directions, but it's all triggered by COVID, right? The occupancy in offices has dropped, which is impacting the value of, 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 of office real estates. But at the same time, people are spending more time at home and therefore they actually want larger homes. So. Uh, and, and that's all very positive and it's creating fantastic opportunities. The refinancing opportunity will also create uh, fantastic opp buying opportunities for those that have cash at the ready. Okay. Um, David, I do want to come back to um, your earlier remarks on private equity and your concerns there. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I think that um, it's it's no no secret that a lot of the uh, the attractiveness of private equity over the last decade has been uh, low rates and the ability to finance a lot of these companies um, at 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 you know very low in some cases almost almost negative rates. Now, um, you know, with much higher rates, uh, that becomes a, a harder trick. Now, many uh, many private equity firms have managed themselves with relatively low levels of, of leverage and have focused much more on operational excellence of the companies that they buy, and I, I think that will carry on to be just, uh, just fine. So I'm not calling for somehow a great decline in the returns in private equity, but I do think there are a variety of new players, and it's amazing how many new players have come into private equity who uh, I think haven't had the experience of, uh, of operations, who have been relying on a lot of leverage as that stuff comes due, I think that's going to be very hard, and I think those marks will start to come through in the next in the next year on those on those books, for sure. Right, Monica, do you have thoughts on private equity? No, not 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 as much. No, I think David summarized it well. Great. Well, then I will, uh, as promised, uh, come back to AI. Then, uh, <laughs> which. Uh, I know we have heard lots of different uh, viewpoints on it today. Some people think it's, you know, or the, the hype is getting ahead of the reality of the technology. Other people think it's potentially as transformative of the internet uh, as the internet. Yeah. Uh, where do you stand? So AI is already meaning so many things, right? As you say, on one level, it can be hyperbole and it can indicate froth in the markets. To some extent, it brought me back to, um, to sort of the late 90s, right, when we were all talking about the internet and actually where you were making money was in the picks and shovels, but not like selling eyeballs. And the other uh, analogy that it brought back in my head was every time I would come here, it was of course you always knew there was real froth in the market when you were a yellow cab driver at the time, not your Uber driver that we have today, would ask you about which internet company to invest in. <laughs> so I haven't been asked yet by an Uber driver <laughs> what AI stock. It'll happen soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I would be uh, <laughs> investing in. But I, I, so I think there's real opportunity to be had actually in the equivalent of picks and shovels as we're already seeing in really the advance of certain companies. NVIDIA comes to mind, for example, in the AI space. But what is really, I think, the interesting story is how we are using AI in our own environments, right? Both as an investment team, but also how we use it in our business. At BNY Mellon, we have actually at the broader enterprise level established a digital R&D hub in Dublin to look at how we can uh, look at document um, uh, automation and analysis or how we can use predictive analytics all for internal use but also for our clients. We're looking at how we can use natural language processing as an aid into the investment research process. So it covers multiple strands. I don't think we're at a time yet where it will replace the human in the investment process, but it can certainly augment. I think it actually has the potential to make a lot of the jobs fundamentally more interesting. I mean, we, we absolutely have what we call kind of sandbox experiments, because we're still, we still want to be very careful. Um, you know, we don't want to train a large language model on our data to find that it all of a sudden sort of escapes out the back door, right? So, so we're very careful and very kind of controlled about how we use it. 
But nevertheless, the ability to take rote tasks, of which we have many in the asset management business, and really automate that extremely quickly, and therefore turn the job of the credit analyst into much more one of, of problem solving and analysis instead of spreadsheeting, I think is really exciting. And so I'm not one of these people that thinks there'll be many, many less jobs, but I do think, at least for our industry, it will be the jobs that we have will have kind of moved up and be more interesting than they are now. And I think that's very exciting. So we're actively experimenting with it, and I expect it'll be more and more a part, uh, a part of our business as we go, as we go forward. Well, I am afraid that we're going to have to leave it there as we're out of time. I feel like I could ask you each uh, so many more questions, but thank you so much for that. Well, thank you for thank having you. I appreciate it. Great to be here. Please welcome to the stage Bridgewater founder Ray Dalio with Bloomberg's David Weston. Okay, here we are with Ray Dalio, the one and only. Hi, David. Uh, hi. It's great to have you, Ray. Thanks for great being here. Great to be here. I always enjoy speaking with you. So, so we all know Ray Dalio, obviously, is the founder of Bridgewater and is an esteemed author of books as well as LinkedIn posts that we all wait for. But he also now is starting something actually with Masterclass as the leading, the number one luminary investor. So congratulations. That's how they pitch it. Yes, <laughs> well, I think we'd all agree with that. Uh, so we have read your material and we have some sense of how you structure it, particularly even your most recent book. You've got five basic forces that explain a lot of economic history. You go back several hundred years and look at it. And I thought we might take some of those and apply them to the present day. Uh, and as I recall them, and you'll correct me, uh, the first one has to do with money, credit, debt, the economy, right? And then internal uh, conflicts within a country, external, uh, and then uh, forces of nature, which would be climate change probably today, and then technology. Start with the first one, uh, the, the one that involves debt, credit, money, the economy. And apply it to the here and now. One of the big raging questions is, our long-term interest rates, and for this purpose, I guess I mean your real interest rates, are they going to remain elevated? We've, we're down at negative. We're now up above one. Are they going to remain elevated in the out years as you see it, or do you think they'll come back down? There are camps in both directions at this point, and you look at the long term. Long term, where are we headed? Well, it's most important to me to not just answer questions like higher, lower, or whatever, but to trying to explain the mechanics, the cause-effect relationships that are going on, right? Um, and the reason I did this study, which then turned into a book, and I'm just a practical markets decision maker, is that three big things happened in my, are happening in our lifetimes that never happened before. Uh, that, let me say that again. Three things that surprise us that haven't happened in our lifetimes but happened many times through history are the creation of an enormous amount of debt and debt monetization. The second is the internal conflict, the large wealth gaps and the internal conflict that makes the politics of uh, populism and so on. And the third is the great power conflict, uh, comparable powers, the United States and China and the possibilities of war. Um, but back to, uh, to your question in terms of the mechanics, there are very basic simple things that there is, um, there is a debt cycle. There are short debt cycles. We're used to those. They last on average about seven years, give or take about three. Um, and you know you have a recession and interest rates are, uh, are low, inflation is low, and the Federal Reserve becomes stimulative, and then you have growth. You have non-inflationary growth, and you have inflationary growth, and they tighten monetary policy, and then you have the slow up or the recession that follows until the cycle participates. We, uh, it happens that way. We've had 12 of those. We're in the 13th. We're about halfway through that cycle. We're at the point where interest rates have to rise. Okay, so the level of interest rates, it's, you have to satisfy a debtor and a creditor. And so that means interest rates have to be high enough that the creditor gets a real return, higher than their money. And so, and if you don't do that, you create the cycle that we have before, 
where money is essentially free, interest rates are nil, or in some case negative, and you have a situation where you don't have to pay principal, so money was essentially free, then that imbalance is enormous, and it's made more enormous because even then the supply demand is not adequate. There's not enough demand to buy those bonds. And so the Federal Reserve's got to come in there and print money and buy those bonds and redistribute wealth. So you have that difference. So now you're moving, you, we have moved to a level of real interest rates. Think about inflation. Um, that is, um, depending on how you calculate, if you look at tips or if you look at short-term interest rates, they need a one or to one and a half percent real rate. Those days that we have seen in the past are over, and there's a big adjustment in that. So the, the headline for that is, so who have been the losers? Who have been the winners and who have been the losers? This is a different kind of uh, debt problem in that what happened is, in order to create this big transfer of wealth that there needed to be in various ways, uh, the government borrowed a lot of money because they spent a lot more than they earned, and they sell a lot of bonds. And then the Federal Reserve buys bonds, and it subsidizes those bonds. And so the big losers of this cycle has not been the individual balance sheets because the individual balance sheets have been improved. It is the fact that those who are ho holding government debt are the ones that are having the losses. So the central banks have all lost a lot of money. Um, the commercial banks bought a lot of these debts. So when we look at the commercial banking problem, it is largely a government debt problem because there was the financing of holding bonds with short-term interest rates, and so that was the squeeze. So you have that particular dynamic. As we move forward, um, the higher you raise the debt to income ratio, the more difficult that balancing act becomes. And so we're seeing a trade-off now that interest rates have got to be high enough for the creditor, but not too high for the debtor. And so you're seeing now this adjustment in which you're having sort of a 1%-ish growth rate, not the household sector having a problem, but uh, the, those who are holding the bonds and, and so on, they're having the problem. And so you're seeing growth come down with still an inflation um, issue. The inflation issue comes from two parts, really. Uh, first of all, if you spend a lot more than you earn um, and you give a lot of money and credit, you're going to have an inflation. But um, it also comes from the supply-demand bond, of bonds. So if you look at who's benefiting in this, the household sector, the workers, are, are benefiting. <clears throat> this isn't a classic recession in which the unemployment rate goes up because the unemployment rate is remaining relatively good because there's wealth transfer, and you have, um, and they are also having higher wage gauges. And then you have the inefficiency of the global supply chains, which has a, happens there. So what that means, I think, is that you have this stubbornly high inflation. We're not gonna go down to our targets for a number of the reasons. And then there has to be the real interest rates remaining high in that, and that creates a sort of stagflation kind of environment. So let's talk about that stubbornly high inflation. There are some who think that there are larger forces that may drive it back down, uh, demographics in particular. Uh, uh, too much savings, actually, globally, as the population ages. At the same time, reduction in productivity, less demand coming online. Uh, some people argue, in fact, that we will have the inflation come back down on its own, and therefore the nominal rates, if you add your 1 to 1.5% 1 .1 on top of it for the real interest rate, they will come down. Do you disagree with that? Yes. Um, <clears throat> in the, um, it's a matter of the amount of money and credit created, and it's also a matter of productivity. And so when we look at the amount of money and credit, we will spend a lot more than we will earn. We know the budgets, we know the projections, we know individuals. That's going, the big risk there is a supply demand risk. So we are going to sell a lot of bonds and, and then the question is, does the Federal Reserve come in and then start to print them and make that? So I think from, from the demand, including employment and the amount of money creation, we have that power. And then we're also living in a different world 
particularly as supply chains change. The only big question is the technology impact. Like, if we take a five year, you were talking about a longer term yeah. horizon, we'll have to talk about technology and the impact that that'll have on that in terms of productivity. But the demographics is not a favorable thing uh, because what we're going to have to do is draw down savings and there's going to be lesser number of population. So in terms of the, lo the uh, labor component, I don't see that as an, um, uh, a net positive. You mentioned that uh, going out, it looks like we're going to be borrowing more than we're earning. Uh, does that mean we are in or headed for a debt crisis? You wrote a book on that as well, studying debt crises since 1945. Are we in a debt crisis or are we headed for one? Um, we are, at the, in my opinion, we are at the beginning of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too, mu too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. What's happening now as we have to sell all this uh, debt is we then have, w do you have enough buyers? There are changes now in terms of the quantities in the world that are being held by um, large investors around the world that have lost money in these treasury bonds and so on. And then there are geopolitical changes which are having an effect. Some cases, some countries are worried about sanctions. And then there's this geopolitical shift. So when I look at the supply demand issue, there's a supply demand issue for that debt. There's a lot of debt. It has to be bought, has to have a high enough interest rate. So a crisis, that's, you know, if we continue down this path in terms of what, what's likely over the next, you know, five and 10 years, then you, what you, you reach the point that that balancing act becomes very difficult. How will we know? And is it really a function of not having enough buyers for the federal debt? Is there any evidence of that so far? Um, we, we're right at the brink of starting to find out that. The amount of selling of government debt um, collapsed, right? We didn't issue government debt. Um, and now we're going to issue a lot of government debt. And so when one looks at, when we look at the buyers, there appears to be a shortage, a significant shortage of the buyers for that government debt. But we're now at the brink of being able to see what that supply demand pa um, picture looks like as we go over the next year and two. Given the challenges that we face, uh, fiscal challenges that you describe, uh, we need a political process that will help us get out of this. Do we have that? This goes to the second uh, issue that you always deal with, which is internal conflict. Well, the, the, the things that you see happen over, over and over again when you look at history is when you have a financial not good situation at the same time as you have large wealth gaps, you start to see the emergence of populism and we see extremism in both of the political parties, okay? We see that split. A populist is an individual or a leader or a political person who will win at all cost. That the rules of the game don't as much matter. And so we're in a, 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 a the, the January 6th type of incident and so on is very interesting. The political system in terms of primaries and, and the parties tends to create that sort of polarity. I think that, um, I think it's very clear that there is only one good outcome, if we can, and that's a strong bipartisan middle because either of the extremes is not going to be able to be dominant. You're, um, the small right the, um, uh, or, or even the small left. And, um, and as a result, we're seeing a fragmentation. Geographically, you're seeing people move to different areas, not just because of taxes, but of differences in values and so on. Um, and so you're seeing this separation. I think over the next um, two years, um, the real question is, can we maintain, can we have a strong bipartisan middle, or are we going to have that kind of fragmentation? Be, we have two thing, three things aligning that are concerning. Uh, on this uh, short-term debt cycle, I call it, you know, the seven-year cycle, we're about halfway through. In other words, interest rates are now at a level that they're probably going to stay at, but they're probably not going to rise much from here, and there's tightening. And the consequences of that are going to be a weaker economy going forward. 
doesn't have to be a big, big downturn because of the household sector, but it is a balance sheet kind of re uh, recession. And I think you're going to, that's, things are going to get worse in the economy. There's a financial issue at the same time as you have this internal conflict. So I think that that's going to make for um, a risky situation, particularly then when we deal with the third major influence, which is this conflict, this geopolitical conflict uh, in the world, particularly related to China, Russia, and uh, the implications that that has on uh, supply chains, production, and the like. Well, let's go exactly there, because you know China very well. You've spent a lot of time there. You've invested there over the years. Uh, what do you make of the situation with U.S. and China? You said some things that we really think we're heading in a bad direction right now. R um, right now, uh, there are uh, uh, irreconcilable differences on a number of topics. Um, Taiwan, Russia, um, uh, reverse CFIUS, chips, and so on. They're kind of at the edge. And that there's um, an inability to talk. So there's quite a bit of brinksmanship. And we are also heading into a political year here in which there's going to be more um, um, pressing, uh, pressure. Um, both sides are very worried about this. Um, so I think you're going to see restraint. I don't think it's going to lead to um, a terrible situation in terms of, but it is leading, uh, you're going to see restraint in, an, in a period of time where you're going to see more te tensions. Um, there's the Mike Gallagher's commission and so on, um, more pressure with chips and so on and so forth. I don't think that that's going to cross the line, but it is going to raise tension. You will see also um, more attempts, um, uh, Tony Blinken's going over, you'll see more attempts to try to smooth things out because both sides are afraid of where we are. In any case, while it'll be that kind of brinksmanship, most likely it w there is a building of self-sufficiency. Uh, in other words, efficiency was, not, was the game before. Everything was global. You produce it in wherever the cheapest place was, most cost-effective, and we became very intertwined with each other. Um, now in this global world, uh, there's the worry about being cut off, cut off in all sorts of things. And so you're having that dynamic play, uh, you know, a negative role um, in economics and inflation. In thinking about the U.S. relationship with China, which I think is probably the most important geopolitical economic relationship for the next generation, I would, I would venture to say, uh, many people have made much of the fact that China is going to overtake the United States in terms of the size of its economy, the strength of its economy. There are some questions about that now. Where are you on that question? And if, in fact, China is not as strong as we have thought it is, economically, I'm talking about now, how does that affect the relationship? Um, I, I, think we're, I think it's almost like splitting hairs. There are two great powers. And, well, you, you know, the, uh, the difference of overtake, um, if you take purchasing power parity, the size of GDP, they have slightly overtaken us. If you take the other, who knows? They're gonna, the main thing is they're comparable powers in many ways, um, having strengths. Of it. They can do a lot of, they have a lot of dependency with each other, and they can do a lot of harm. So the most important thing, I think, is how we take care of ourselves. Can we get strong? Can we raise productivity? Can we be politically and economically cohesive so that we can be effective and strong? Because, um, you know, you can't um, rule out China. Since I started to go to China, you know, 1984, uh, per capita income increased by 28 times. It's, it's, it's a power, and it's a smart power. So it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be like that. No, there's not a winner or a, or a loser. There are only either you, you're gonna have both winners or you're gonna have both losers. What is the route for the United States to come to a functioning relationship economically with China? Because that seems to be what people are gr grasping for. I mean, you could say going back to 2000 and the WTO, that was part of the theory that China would become more like the United States, more like the West. That didn't quite work out that way. And now I think we're not quite sure how to deal with them. What is the way to have a relationship that we're going to have different 
uh, systems. We're not going to agree on everything by any means, but we can really work with one, each other in a constructive way for the globe. Fear. <laughs> I have a saying, if you worry, you don't have to worry. And if you don't worry, you need to worry. Because <laughs> if you worry, you, w you will make sure that the thing you're worrying about doesn't happen. And right now, they're at, they're at the brink. And so um, the understanding of where the red lines are, and um, just like the Soviet Union, mutually assured destruction was the means by which we got through that. That notion of um, pushing each other um, will be the, you know, just do not cross certain red lines. You know, um, chips are oil. In World War II, um, the United States uh, shut off, uh, embargoed Chinese, uh, Japanese. Japanese oil, and they froze their assets, sanctions, their bonds. Um, it could be very analogous with chips and with, um, with bonds. Um, there's worried about sanctions. Those kinds of, there's a, there's a, there's a limit to being strong and then there's that issue. So I think restraint on both parties um, is going to be of paramount importance. One of the things that people uh, hope for, I would say, is some cooperation, fundamental cooperation between China and the United States when it comes to climate, to try to deal with climate issues. So your fourth element, as I recall, was acts of nature and climate. Uh, what can we do with China? And by the way, going back to your point, that first we have to start with our being strong, what we should be doing on our own about climate. Uh, the, the, there'll be probably, I would expect, some superficial uh, cosmetic um, attempts at uh, cooperation on climate. The other more contentious issues will remain simultaneously. Um, and yes, the climate issue was very interesting. When I did this study motivated by the first three of the last 500 years, I saw that acts of nature Droughts, floods, and pandemics toppled more civilizations, caused more deaths than any of the things I mentioned before. And so climate is certainly an issue, and um, we're going to see, it's not like we're going to have great surprises, though great technologies are coming, but the, the worst is, is still ahead of us. Um, and um, you, I think you know enough about that to say that um, this is not an easy or inexpensive uh, problem to handle. Fortunately, there have been uh, great advances in many sorts of technology, but it's a long and expensive way to go. It would not be easy or inexpensive if we all agreed on how to handle it. Uh, to some extent, this takes me back to your second issue, which is internal conflict. Because right now we see, for example, how many 17 states, something like that, are adopting legislation to restrict their pension plans for making investments based on ESG. Can we address climate as a nation? Put aside China and the rest of the world. Can we address it as a nation when we have that kind of division, political division, over even addressing the question of climate? Right. Um, I mean, my, I'm not, opti <laughs> not optimistic, particularly b because it's also very expensive. And so what do you do when there are so many expenses? There's the climate issue. There's the social issues, education, poverty, and in school districts, my, I, my wife works in some of the, to help out in some of the worst school districts. I'll give you an example. In Connecticut, which is always one, two, or three richest country, uh, states in the country, 22% of the high school students are either dropped out of high school or are, have absentee rates of greater than 25% and are failing classes. And there's poverty in all these. So we have so many, um, necessities, expenditures, and problems that we cannot agree on how to handle those problems. So it's, there's a climate component to it, but there's a, you know, a bigger, more fundamental component, which is why, I mean, I'm curious and I hope that we will see a strong bipartisan middle beat the extremes in the political situation, because it is difficult. Let's try to end on a hopeful note here and get to your fifth issue, which is technology or invention. You mentioned it earlier. I mean, you founded Bridgewater, and for anything I've read about Bridgewater, I mean, you put a great emphasis on the systems involved, the mechanics involved, the engine. Uh, it seems to me, without knowing about it, having done this for 25 years or so, 
that AI might apply to that fairly easily. Is that your sense? Where are we going with artificial intelligence? Yeah, I'm so excited because, as you say, for 25 years, I would always write down my investment principles, all my principles, and then I would convert them to algorithms, which became decision rules, which became systems, and everything would run, and they would, like setting up a computer chess game, it would play, I would play next to it, and we would then reconcile differences and we would learn together. Um, now what's happening with generative AI is that um, I can, one can, take all of that knowledge and have it there and then to go beyond that, to have it as a partner, a thought partner. Because the um, intelligence has capacities that the human mind doesn't have. We don't, you know, the ability to process so much and everything at the same time. So um, I'm extremely excited. I think that this is a, um, the greatest revolution, bigger than the internet revolution. Um, and, uh, but like technology, um, it really depends. The problem isn't with the technology. The problem is with the people who use the technology. Will that technology be used to raise humanity's living standard, or will that be used for war, in a sense, for hurting each other? And so, but any way we're gonna cut it, if you take those five, we're gonna go through a time war. If, if, if we take the next five to 10 years, in the next five to 10 years, it's like gonna go through a time war. We're gonna come out the other side, and you're gonna see a very completely different world. I'm gonna take that as hopeful. Okay, Ray Dalio, thank you so much. He's a luminary investor, but also he's the founder of Bridgewater. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Taking an active approach to investing means looking at asset management through a different lens, one with a clear focus on our clients. Throughout market cycles, teams of specialists at Principal Asset Management have applied local insights and global perspectives to optimize results. This clear point of view allows us to identify the most compelling opportunities now while positioning for what's next. Principal Asset Management, actively invested. Please welcome to the stage Principal Asset Management Chief Global Strategist Seema Shah with Bloomberg's Emily Gallagher. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Emily Gallagher. I'm our global head of FX, commodities, and economics product here at Bloomberg. And I'm thrilled to be joined here by Seema Shah, who is the chief global strategist of principal asset management. So welcome. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, so today will be the uh, sponsor spotlight. We're going to be talking about investment trends shaping asset management today. And the investment management industry has been through a ton of significant changes uh, recently. And I'm curious, what types of trends are you watching? And how do you think asset managers are adjusting? Well, I think in terms of from a macro perspective, firstly, because I think that just it feeds into how asset managers yeah. have to, to think through things. The first thing is, is you know, we've had this wonderful 10 years of easy monetary policy. Um, we've had high returns and low volatility. Well, unfortunately, it looks like that is, is firmly behind us. So now you're moving into a time where inflation is going to be a bit higher. We think QE is behind us. Um, the central banks are going to be having higher interest rates. So this really means lower returns, higher volatility. In the last 10 years, central banks have essentially done the work for investors. Right? They've made it very easy to make, it, to make strong re returns. But now, when you have an investment landscape which is more challenging with high volatility, we need to be a little bit better at our jobs. Right? We need to be a little bit more analytical. One of the things that we need to do is you know, identify some secular, secular challenges, secular changes, and um, figure out the asset classes that will give you that exposure. So one good example, of course, is you know, what we've been talking about all day, it's AI. Well, AI, right, you can get exposure to that, but I mean, if you haven't got it now, do you wanna be buying right now? No, but you have got other ways of getting exposure. So think about stuff like data centers, which are still riding that AI trend, but they've got better valuations. So there are ways of doing that, and that really takes active management. 
that takes the deeper analytical approach, looking beyond just your obvious asset classes, thinking about diversification. Um, the other part of it is, it's also thinking about public and private, right? As I said, this is gonna be a more difficult environment to make the returns. How are you gonna get your returns? Well, you need to think a little bit more exotically. Think about looking outside of the US, but also think about private markets, which I think for the next 10 years is gonna be where you're gonna get a little bit, bit more of a bang for your buck. Mm. Okay. Uh, and I meet with a lot of macro strategists in my role as looking after our economics product. And it seems like there's a consensus and, and there's a broad consensus that the U.S. will be entering into a recession this year. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think some of the, the risks are that we're not talking about, um, we're not discussing, and, and how do investors brace for that volatility? Well, okay, so the interesting thing is, is that you're right. So there is a lot of consensus about this U.S. slowdown. Um, and yet there's no conviction. Mm. So if, I, if you go to your Bloomberg terminals and you look at the economic forecast for the US, for example, you will see that there is absolutely no agreement in terms of timing, duration, and magnitude. There is absolutely no consensus. So on that, there is no conviction. Yeah. Another good example is, is the forecast for Europe, which is really interesting. This is Europe. This is the one that has continuously disappointed. They've struggled to have really strong positive growth. And yet if you go on your terminal, there is not one forecaster out there who has any negative quarters of growth next year. Right? So that, to me, is a bit of a risk on the horizon um, in terms of the things that people are not talking about. One of the other things that we see is with regards to the banking crisis. Uh, general consensus view that it has passed, the acute part of it, is behind us. And we can now just start to think about the impact on lending. Well, when I think about it, I think, well, wow, there, there's been three banking failures. There's 770 regional banks or so in the US. Are you telling me that only three of them have mismanaged their duration? <laughs> I don't know. That, that concerns me. So I think there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of potential volatility out there, especially when there is consensus but no conviction. And again, this is really diversification and active management. You have to be very, very careful in this kind of environment. So shifting gears a little bit from risk to opportunities, uh, what are some of the new opportunities that you see for asset managers uh, to capture growth globally, given the uh, dynamic nature of what's happening in the industry, uh, whether it's industry or, or macro transformations taking place? Well, um, so I mean, if you think about it again globally, right? So uh, we, we put together a valuation map for equities, for example looking at what percentage of time have various markets been cheaper than they are today. And you look at it, and the thing that's quite interesting is generally everything is fairly green, right? There's been a rally, of course, to date, but historically, a lot of the markets are cheap relative to their history. There's one which isn't, which is the US, right? So yes, the US has got the AI trend. That is incredibly important. It's something that you cannot ignore, but there are greater opportunities, I think, outside of the US for now. Um, one example is Brazil. It's rarely been cheaper than it is today. Uh, if you look to Japan, I mean, there's been a bit of a rally. It's lost a bit of its attractiveness, but there is still a vast difference between the US and Japan. Another example is, um, you know, you can, you can see, continue to see that with the macro environment, although we've had a complete synchronization of trends, I think, over the last 10 years, partly because of the central bank policy, now you're seeing that change. So there is a desynchronization going on now, right? Like it, there's synchronization before, now it's moving to desynchronization, where you have a number of the emerging markets, central banks in Asia, already poised to start cutting rates if they're not already doing so. And the other thing is, is that in the US, when we start to think about interest rate hikes or potential interest rate hikes, uh, it's concerning, it's a real worry. But if you think about it for Japan, well, that is great news. So to ignore the global opportunity set, I think is a big mistake. Um, we, at the moment, believe that parts of emerging markets, um, I'll give you an example, India continues to be very, very attractive uh, within Latin America. Brazil is an obvious one because of valuation. The other part of this is in terms of looking out over a longer term scale. So we talk, I talked about secular drivers uh, before. Well, one thing is, you know, for emerging markets, yes, there are challenges. Yes, it's a volatile asset class. But if you're going to look out, if you can look out over beyond a six-month horizon, well, then there's a lot of growing opportunities, the kind of the growing middle class. That was a conversation people were having two or three years ago. During COVID, people seem to have forgotten that, but it still continues to be the case. 
China is a worry for everyone today. Uh, if you're sitting here, and actually David Hunt made a really good, great point before, which is about having that home bias. Well, if you're sitting in the US or if you're sitting in London like I am, uh, and you think about China, maybe your first image is like, wow, you know, the reopening story has been really disappointing. You're not seeing the central bank introducing the stimulus that we may right. have expected. And yet, if you are in China and you're speaking to a lot of the analysts there, that they actually have a lot more of a constructive, a considerably more constructive perspective. Their view is that actually, if you've been listening to President Xi for the last three years, he has been talking about this idea of moving away from a boom bust cycle to something which is more stable, trying to move the economy away from leverage. So actually what they're building is a more stable economy, which maybe over the next six months could be disappointing, but actually over a 10 year horizon starts to look very attractive. And I, sorry, I keep giving examples, but this is probably one of my favorite ones, is um, we, talk, we talked about the office sector at, in, the, in one of the earlier sessions about office REITs really being destroyed. And it is, partly because, not just because of the banking crisis, but actually mainly so about the lack of return to office. Well, in London, it continues to be actually a bigger problem. So people really haven't returned to the office. In London, although it's coming back to a bit of activity, it still feels a little bit stagnant. So that suggests like it should be quite concerning and maybe sitting in the US, it sounds like, well, why would you have exposure to London? Well, actually the office REIT sector in London has already adjusted fairly significantly. So actually this is a fairly attractive opportunity. So I think having that deeper analysis of global markets um, is important at principle. What we've done recently is combine our asset management business with the pensions business. So we now, uh, with having that footprint in a lot of the emerging market countries and global developed markets, it gives you the opportunity to have that global investment perspective into local platforms and also put local products available for global investors. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. It's not just the US, maybe there's US exceptionalism, but you don't want to be have all your, bas your eggs in one basket. That's really useful. Thank you so much for those insights. Uh, and joining me today for the Principal Asset Manager Spotlight, uh, Sponsor Spotlight, where we discuss the investment trends. Uh, there will be a break now, uh, I am told, a networking break. Uh, I am told that we'll be back in this room at around 325. So thank you so much. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program will begin in five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Please welcome to the stage, Bloomberg's Michelle Lynn. Hi again, I'm Michelle Lynn, Global Head of Data Science and Insight for the Bloomberg Media Organization. I hope everyone had a chance to get some coffee, stretch their legs, look at the city, uh, city and the sepia tones. 
very interesting. <laughs> um, as we return from our networking breaks over the course of the summit, I have the wonderful opportunity of conducting a few polling questions that have been crafted by our participating sponsor, Southern Company. Southern Company is a leading energy provider serving nine million residential and commercial customers across the southeast and beyond through its family of companies. Before we hear from Brian Moynihan, Chairman and CEO of Bank of America, we want to hear from you. Um, whether you're virtual or in the room, we would love for you to participate in this little polling question. So please take out your phones, or maybe they're already out, um, and scan this QR code here. To access the poll, you could either scan the QR code or you could type in um, meet.ps slash Bloomberg Invest into your browser. I'll give you a moment to do that. Thank you. Okay, now click on the polling icon on the bottom right of the screen. Anybody see it? Okay, so the question Southern Company would like to ask you is where is your company or portfolio on the path to net zero emissions? Your options are net zero business model has been achieved, committed to reaching net zero by 2030, committed to reaching net zero by 2050, or other or not sure. Please cast your vote now. Again, the question is, where is your company or portfolio on the path to net zero emissions? All right, let's take a look at the results. So 42%, oh, 44 still, the results are still coming in. 44% are not sure. We have about a third, 32% are committed to reaching net zero by 2030. Over a quarter, 27% are committed to reaching net zero by 2050. And 6% net zero model has been achieved. Thank you for participating in this poll. Thank you to Southern Company for that great question and enjoy the rest of today's programming. Please welcome to the stage Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan with Bloomberg's David Weston. So, Brian, thank you so much for being here. It's great to be here. We must have been expecting some other people or something. <laughs> There's plenty of room if you want to invite some guests. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, two or three weeks ago, we were talking about the debt ceiling. We don't have to talk about that anymore. But maybe we can talk about the aftermath right. of what we went through there in Washington. And specifically, one of the things that's been covered on Bloomberg and elsewhere is, obviously, the government coffers were drawn down pretty substantially as they came right up to that so-called X date. And now they've got to issue a lot of T-bills. I saw one estimate like $850 million by the end of the summer. B billion. It, it, we wish it were a million. Oh, a billion, $850 billion, and, and, and maybe a trillion by the end of the year is what, is what I saw. Uh, the speculation is that might draw liquidity out of the marketplace. Are you seeing that at Bank of America yet? Yeah, it's too uh, strong because I think if you look, they've daily published their balances and they moved up a chunk, and uh, you guys covered this today, and it, because of tax payments coming in and you get uh, – estimated tax payments, et cetera, but they, they, their policy has been by their own design to get to have a trillion dollars of money funding through this that they have at all given times, so they fund to keep it level there. So they're going to have to push up and do that kind of funding level. You know, when I ask people, is this disruptive or not, you know, all the experts tell me yes and no, and yes <laughs> in the hand, it's a lot of issuance, but no, everybody knew it was coming, and so it may move sort of trading markets around, but fundamentally, the idea that the government was going to you know, run out of money was not something people were planning on. So we'll see. It, it, it's just another thing to worry about for the next six months. Does, does it put any kind of a crimp in your ability to lend? Uh, I mean, that money has to come from somewhere. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of money sitting at the Fed and the overnight repo facility and money funds that's just been put back. And it, so the dynamics of how this all moves around is interesting. I don't think, and in the, in the, in the worry would be it took deposits out of the banking system. But, you know, there's... I, I, I'm not sure people see that as a big issue. And by the way, if the Treasury Secretary, and I think they said today, they will do this on a non-disruptive basis because they don't, they just ran down to $39 billion. We're still able to pay the bills. So they, they don't need to get there tomorrow and they'll build it up over time. But their goal is to get back in a more regular way. The, the best news about this whole dialogue is the they've got an agreement that extends a period of time. So we shouldn't have to deal with this for a while, which is really critical because the United States has to be the beacon of stability, strength in the world. And at times when this discussions going on and you travel the world, everybody gets fixated on it. 
because the United States is the benchmark of benchmarks, and if it goes completely somehow accidentally, it's a real problem. And so they would get all fixated and all this sort of activity in the planning for it, what would happen to all our company. It, it just, and it would just be better if it didn't go on, but it's a political process and they have. Well, speaking of stability, we, we didn't look much like that for a little while there, right? Do people forget about that after it's over or are there lingering effects, do you think? Well, I think that, the f look, I, it, in my memory in 2011, it felt more serious at the time than it did this time because I think people had learned from the actual shutdown and some of the dynamics in the actual downgrade of the United States that you can't get that close. So I think that the sure, uh, the assurances of you know, the, both political parties plus the experts involved always was we're not going to let this. It may be messy. It's like a Greek tragedy. You always know what the end is going to be, but it's fun to see how they get there. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, they got there, and that's the important thing. But it's a political process. There, there's another serious question about how much debt the company, can, the country, can afford, and all that stuff. None of that's embedded in this as much as it is. You know, the issue at the moment was really getting the 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 idea that somehow they would not be able to pay their bills or have to shut down and or default off the table, and that was done. Perhaps a related I issue, actually, are the reserves required of your bank and other banks. Uh, there are reports, and I don't think it's unexpected to anybody, that there's going to be an increase in capital requirements. If that goes forward, will it have any effect on your ability to make loans? Yeah, that, so there, there are m multiple discussions which get sort of pushed together. There's the standards for the <coughs> Final finalization of Basel, mm -hmm. which is this broad set of things uh, that's going on. This stress test is going on that we forget about, but that's going on also, and that resulted in some surprises in the industry in terms of capital demands last year. And then there's, uh, um, and then there's the question of applying standards that apply to the GSIB banks, the biggest banks, in broader in the platform because of the size of some of the banks. And so all three of those things get mixed together a little bit, but. You know, in the end of the day, it, it's a fairly straightforward. If our capital ratios go up by 100 basis points, we basically, you know, simply put, um, can't make about $150 billion of loans. And it, because people say, well, you have more capital, you can make more loans. But if we took risk on that capital, we wouldn't have that capital ratio. So it has to be a riskless build of capital. Can't be out there taking risk. So the only thing you can really do is leave it in cash or buy treasury securities. And, and that's not a very productive use of, of, of money. So, um, and if you had it, 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 and that's the problem. And so every time capital goes up, there's a, there's a countervailing effect too that impacts lending. Is that a gating function here right now? Over the last couple of weeks, you've been seeing an effect. You know, some of your lending is slowing down anyway, just because the economy is slowing down. Is it a demand, for, is there demand enough for the loans that you can't make? That, that ebbs and flows all the time. So the loans, the loan demand is more product of customer activity, and so we, our team has a recession predicted uh, beginning uh, in the third quarter, fourth quarter, first quarter. Bank of America research team, which Candace Brown and Platt leads, is tremendous, and they have that. Um, that has moved out a little bit as a consumer and activity stayed stronger, uh, even in light of the fastest uh, Fed rate increase in a long time. And so, but it's still the prediction, and so I think companies having gone through you know, the inflation and then it sort of flattening out and thinking about the future, just being more careful because they realize that you know, some are able to move prices, some are able to do it, they're getting relief on the commodity side, on the price side, but uh, are they be able to hold price demands as final demand in the construction industry will be as strong a year from now as it is today and the housing, it, all this is on people's minds, so they tend to uh, uh, pull in. And so that means line usage is flattened back out. So line usage was here before the pandemic and then fell and moved up, and it was kind of moving up, you know, incrementally back to where the pandemic sort of flattened out the last couple of months, which means that you know, companies are just being a little more careful. So I, I see actually the, a survey was done in this room of the likelihood of a recession in Q1 of 2024, and it looks like, uh, what is that, 65% of the people agree with your research. Isn't that good, good to know you've got, <laughs> you've got a ratification there? Yeah, it, one thing we always have to be careful, if I, somebody educated me once that the forward projection recession by economists is always like 15 or 20 percent. So <laughs> anything above that means that they're convinced. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, so let's talk about something that's very much in the news these days, that's artificial intelligence, yeah. particularly generative yeah. artificial intelligence, large language models. Uh, you and I have talked in the past about Erica, yeah. uh, which is a form of, I think, machine learning you've been using for some years now, five years. We've never really talked about what that is. Yeah. So take us through what Erica is for Bank of America right now, and then we can talk about where it's going. So what Erica is is a product a capability that's in the uh, mobile banking app and other that you can go, go into and ty either type in or say, you know, pay my landscape or pay my 
you know, school tuition, whatever it is, you know, and it will then say, it, pay, and it'll say the name of the, per, uh, of the provider, uh, how much you want to pay, and then it'll go pay it. And it'll just run it through the bill payment system. So instead of going to bill payment, going down the list and doing all stuff, they do it. Or what's the routing number? What's my routing number? Because that's a topic that people call us and ask us about five million times a year they used to call us. <laughs> now they don't have to. The routing number is on the base of your check, and the routing number for all yeah, of you is exactly. the same. So <laughs> it, it's, it, it's not, a, but people call because, you know, frankly, judging by the age of the people laughing, we were taught somewhere how to write a check and how the numbers <laughs> worked and what was your account number. That's no longer in the system. So um, when somebody's doing ACH and stuff. So, so uh, really like seven or eight years ago, we said, let's build something that can do that kind of language processing, the LP part of uh, that thing, and, and, and then predict what the question was, use our data and our information, and, and come back with the answer to them. And so we started to do that, and the first thing we realized is the language that was out there for these natural language recognition type things was not written for banking. So what's my balance? Do you want to go to a yoga class? You know, <laughs> it, 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 think about it. it had, so the first thing I had to do is we went to uh, uh, outside and got them to write a banking language pro uh, program and, and things. And then we had to pair it with our data and our information. And so that's now five years old. And you know, 20 million people use it, and they use it 150, 200 million times. Took, we're just right, right across a billion interactions with it. We'll get another billion in another 12 to 18 months. It's growing that fast. Um, and it just saves a lot of time for the customer and client. And it's very, the experience is great. And yet people, I think, will start using it even more now because they're playing around with ChatGPT and doing other things that this was sort of foreign to them. They were, what is Erica like that? But what we've seen is it just continues to grow. And, you know, 30, 20 percent interactions year over year, 30 percent. They're just people going because people like it, use it more and more and more, and it can answer a query. Now, what the flip side of this is why have we deployed it when you hear all the worries you have about right. it? This is our data, this is our processing, this is our predictive language, uh, artificial intelligence tool, the virtual assistant feeding off of our Q, Q and A's and questions that we've edited to make sure they're right. So we don't have the problem is that we're dealing with everybody's data and everybody's answers and everybody trying to figure out what is it perfectly good going to apply. And so that controlled environment isn't the environment that these wonderful things are running on. At some point, they'll come together. In other words, why do we have a proprietary one when you can use it? But you've, in between then is the ability to make sure your data doesn't get pulled into places that shouldn't be making sure it works appropriately on your systems. And you're reading the articles in New York Times today and stuff, you know about in the healthcare industry, there's something written up, and all this, you know, all these pluses and minuses, the legal case everybody's written about, and all this stuff. It, it, you know, those are the risks, and even the people who really know this, you know, tell you this is three to five years of work to get those vagaries built a system. But we see it today. Now, you took that same stuff and you went and applied it to analyze who are the best customers to call based on our da data by people making inquiries to it for prospects in our business banking. It was called Banker Assist, and that is out there operating every day. So if a person has you know 100 prospects are looking at that in that line of business, and they can't call 100 all at once. So it tells them the best 10 based on who they cover, what they do, uh, the kinds of industries they cover, the activity in the industry. Well, and these are 50 million under revenue companies. So this is not huge companies. And doing searches of the outside environment and talking about it. So it, it, we use it in other places already. It, it, it's got high potential. It just we got to make sure we maintain. The appropriate customer experience, the appropriate control element around it to make it work. Well, talk about the control specifically, because one way to expand it is just get more usage of it, right. which you're doing right now. Uh, another way is to have it do more things. And we, we had a report actually on the Bloomberg this week about the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, coming out and warning banks, saying, watch this generative AI banks, because it can make some mistakes. Yep. How do you make sure that you can use it the right way and you don't go too far? Right. So that's the constraint on the openness of it, for lack of a better term, and by constraining it to you know, our data and our information and editing and looking at the answers it gives and constantly making sure. But that's easier when you're saying it's our customer base, our data, our systems, our information, and our transactions. I'm not trying to assess the whole, <laughs> yeah, everything out there, and that's a whole different question. So, and that's, but that's the lesson learned. It, but that environment doesn't do a lot of good for society. It does a lot of good for Bank of America customers and Bank of America. The question to make it good for society, it's got to have all of it in there. And that's the bridge from here to there is that question. So, you know, the simple answer is we, we, we monitor that. And we build it proprietarily so it would build around our, uh, this effectively the same thing a human would, do, would have done if asked the qu uh, question. And then, you know, we convert that and then we back test it. You have to always look at it. We don't, we underwrite with automated 
artificial intelligence and automated tools, but not in an open environment like this where the customer can keep that. It's, mm -hmm. it's much more controlled as to how that works. One of the hallmarks of your administration as, as CEO of Bank of America has been controlling the costs. Yeah. You've been very adamant about that and very diligent about it throughout. What leverage do you have at this point? Is AI a lever to help control costs, do you think? Yeah, it will be, and it will be another, I always think of these things in arcs, you know, so what can you do now that will pay back over time and keep paying back? And so um, if you start about big fundamental things we made, be before people knew what a cloud was, we built an internal cloud. What that did is took all the server environments which were inefficiently disposed of, and that's the theory of a cloud, and pushed them together and said, you may want you know, green servers, but you're gonna take the blue ones and because your software operate on them because you had somebody deciding that green ones are better than blue ones. So we pushed that in, and that, that did it. Then you went to the cloud, and then, so these arcs of movement are just, so then you went to the cloud with parts of your stuff, and the question is what can you do more, and each of that pays you back over and over again. And so, but the first answer was to go from 30 data centers to five or six, and then down to two or three, and then you have to have a certain amount of it. And that, that saved us you know, four or $500 million of run rate expense a year, to give you a sense. I mean, those are big moves. Um, and, all, and, and then now the public cloud and et cetera. If you think about it, so you have to think about all the costs that way. So in real estate, we had 120 odd million square feet of real estate. When the management team started in 2010, we're down to 60 to 65 or 70. And we still, with all the packing and stacking and it, work rules, even coming the pandemic got to about 80%. So there was a lot of room to go. And now with all the uh, work rules and stuff, you have a whole nother round to go. And so all that is, you just manage expenses by looking at all work that can go away and all the efficiency to go away and how you apply technology. And then you gotta get the customers used to it. So 70% um, of people our age bracket and above uh, <laughs> use uh, digital today. Um, that number is growing, the fastest growing segment we have. It's not surprising that millennials and, and Gen Z and et cetera have a higher representation, but the reality is, is it's not getting everybody use it, it's also getting everybody use it fully. So even with younger people who use it a lot, still will deposit their checks at the branch. You know, that difference is $5.50 uh, and a nickel, depending on branch, uh, hand it to a teller, put it in an ATM or do another thing. And, and so there's a migration, even with people you think are using it, they still, we still have a quarter of a billion dollars that will go out of the ATMs by tomorrow this time. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing. So how do you get used to it? So it's all those techniques, it's applied, applied. And will AI help that? Yes, because we have you know, 14,000 call agents. We have, where AI we think is near term helpful is in computer uh, development, programming development. And uh, you know, that open source coding and analyzing, you still have to test it, but you can get it written faster, make it, make it simple for people. And that we think has great applications sooner rather than later. When we talk about costs, what about headcount? I know you said that it's not so much you're laying off, but you're just not hiring as many as you were a year ago. Well, this goes back to, Economics, and I even talked to customers. So last May we hired thirty thousand people, uh, three thousand people. Excuse me. This May we hired you know six, seven hundred, and that's all because the turnover rate fell. Because last year we were in the middle of the Great Resignation, and now it's completely different. So we you know, we went from twelve percent turnover in a company, which is sort of the long term level we we're at pre pandemic, down to six, up to fifteen, and now back down, getting close to six. So we don't have to hire as many people yet. We keep manage the head count down. We'll be uh, we just had twenty five hundred wonderful interns start this week. So that. That'll make us about, by the time we cross the quarter end, about 215, but you take them out, we'll be 213, 213 and a half, or something like that, down from 216, 217 a, a year end, and we've peaked about 219,000, not 219. More broadly, do you think the job market is a bit softer than what the Fed realizes? Because a lot of their numbers are backward looking. Yeah, I think, I think if you talk to employers today in technology spaces, there's always specialized things like, uh, welders in certain businesses and high and manufacturing uh, help because explosion in the Midwest just haven't been out there. But in general, it's much less tight than it was in the spot market. And that's why the current rates are going down and all that stuff. You just see it in the amount of hires. And you know, so job postings are still high. I'm not sure CEOs that I talk to are pushing people to fill those as much as fill them when you have to. And that, that has a dampening effect on the labor market that won't show up in the aggregate numbers. It, employment's still at you know 3.7% unemployment. It's still very mm -hmm. strong. And so the big debate, when you, if you want to drive your economists crazy, say how can you have an unemploymentless recession? Yeah. And you know they can't quite get there. And that's kind of the interesting question. And so even the highest predictors of 
uh, unemployment don't even get to 5%, which is hard to square. One last one, another hallmark uh, uh, for you has been responsible growth for Bank of America. From, from the day you took over, that's what you said you were pursuing. And you've also been uh, fairly um, explicit about ESG investing and how that fits. There's been some political turmoil about that in the country now for with some of the states now, including some affecting Bank of America. How do you put together your desire for responsible growth on the one hand with taking into account things like environmental and, and social and governance? Well, as we look out, we, we, the oldest part of the company has been around for 230 years now. They're almost been pushing beyond that. And so, you know, our industry is a product of the communities that operates in it. So we make it pretty simple. We, we think of who we have to do a great job. We have to do a great job for our customers. We have to do a great job for our teammates because we have to be the best place for teammates to work so we have the talent. We have to do a great job for our shareholders. We just had record operating profits in the first quarter. And we have to do a great job for our communities because, frankly, a bank reflects the economy. And so if the communities aren't strong, we're not going to be strong. So that's how we run the company. And Responsible Growth really talks about that a little differently. But that's how we run the company. And and that's, but we have, to, it's the genius of the end, profits and purpose, not one or the other. And, you know, Jim Collins wrote about that in 1996 is the theory behind, you know, this is the thought process behind it. That's all good stuff. And the answer is sort of what's wrong with that? You know, thinking about how to, how do I do a great job for my customers? How do I do a great job for my team? How do I do a great job for our shareholders? How do we do a great job for our communities? What, you know, and that's, so. You know, when you think about the energy and stuff, you know, go out to North Dakota with Senator Kramer. We talked to people. They got a net zero commitment at the state level and the, everything, and they got all this innovation to do carbon capture storage. Our job is to help lean into that and make that happen. Well, we have energy for everybody and good, cheap energy for everybody and energy for people in the global south that don't have it. You know, th these are interesting questions, but th the end of the day is private sector will drive this. And the money's there, and the talent's there, and we got to drive it because, in the end of the day, we can make it happen and have good growth and, frankly, from the United States' perspective, dominate the market. Brian, thank you so much. Always great to talk to you. Brian Moynihan is the chair and CEO of Bank of America. Please welcome to the stage author, educator, and Bloomberg Opinion contributor, Kyla Scanlon. Okay, let me make sure my slides are up here. Okay, cool. So, hey everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the Young Investor's Guide to Markets, but I want to talk a little bit more than just that. Um, so today I want to talk about the difference between data and reality, storytelling, and hope. <laughs> so if you don't know me, um, I'm Kyla. I work with Bloomberg Opinion. I've done some work with the Financial Times, New York Magazine, and my whole goal is to help humanize finance, to humanize the economy, um, and hopefully that's what we'll do in this presentation today. Um, so the difference between data and reality, what is going on? I feel like that's a question that all of us have been asking recently, what is going on with markets, what's going on with the economy, and how can we make sense of everything that is happening? So when we think about the gap between data and reality, there's a gap between expectations, theory, and reality, right? Like we have this idea in our head how we expect things to be, then there's a gap between how things are supposed to be, the theory of it, and then how things actually are. And I actually have a screenshot of a tweet because I think this tweet really encapsulates this idea well. Mario games teach us that even if something is essentially the same, psychologically it can be completely different. And when we think about the economy and we think about the stock market, that line there is really important. Things can feel the same, or things are the same, but psychologically they can feel completely different than each other. And when we look at things like survey data, right, um, so the jobs reports or different sentiment indicators, the data can be really volatile. And when we have volatile data, that can make markets more volatile, that can make emotions more volatile, and that can ultimately make policy like that the Federal Reserve sets and other central banks more volatile too. And I promise I'll tie together all these thoughts in a second. 
Um, and there was a survey that was released pretty recently going back to that expectations, theory, and reality of the number of Americans who feel good about their finances versus the finances of the overall economy. So a lot of people, 73% of people, feel great about their own personal situation. But when they look around at the world around them, they're like, this kind of sucks. Everybody is doing pretty bad except for me. Uh, so people are feeling pretty good about their own situation, but bad about the situation that they exist in, the world that they exist in. Um, and this is a pretty important delineation for how we think about policy, for how we think about the economy, and for how we think about the stock market. This is a quote from the debt ceiling, the debacle that we all just lived through for, I think, the 79th time. Because um, when we think about this gap between expectations, theory, and reality, a lot of times policy is really important to play into that, right? And this person who uh, I think was anonymous said that they're only measuring the success, of the, the success of the debt ceiling based on how much we lost. And so when we think about policy like that, when you're measures, measuring success only on how much you lost, that's going to really impact how people feel about the economy, the stock market, et cetera. Um, and then there's other metrics too. So going back to that idea of expectations, theory, and reality, the labor market disconnect, it's really, it's really difficult to track available jobs. It's really figure, er, difficult to figure out what numbers make sense and what we should actually be looking at. And then there's companies fluffing numbers. So corporate America's earnings quality, the worst in three decades. And that goes back to that expectation. And I promise I'll tie it all together. Expectations, theory, and reality. Uh, companies are, you know, their numbers are saying one thing and maybe the reality of how the stock is doing, how the company is actually doing is completely different. Um, and of course, when we talk about companies and performance, we have to talk about inflation too. Um, so this is a tweet from Nick, who is a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, uh, talking about you know, this underlying theory of inflation. Is inflation coming from companies price gouging? Is inflation coming from outsized consumer demand? It all ties back into that expectations, theory, and reality thesis. Um, corporations are people too. I think this is also an important line, this idea that a society in which it's easier to protect shareholder rights than civil rights, um, because going back to Nick's point, are, are corporations price gouging? Where is this inflation coming from? Um, we have to have a big conversation about what it means to actually be like a person in, in the economy. And I, this is like a, an interesting line, um, because what, do, what, do, what does that mean? Um, and then this, I think, is the final slide in this section. Uh, because when we, you know, I, I feel like I've been sort of talking, obviously, about the expectations, theory, and reality, and a lot of that dives into narrative, right? A lot of that dives, dives into the story that we're telling about the stock market, the story that we're telling about the economy, and whether that ties back into people's actual lived experiences. Because when we think about the narrative of the stock market, a lot of it is based on the idea of appearances of appearances, where we're molding reality to whatever narrative the stock market wants it to have that day. I'm sure we've all seen the headlines where it's like, an oil rig blows up and the stock market goes up. And that's like a weird thing to read about and it's a weird thing to feel. So this is the short-term garbage raccoonifications of markets where we get really focused on the short term within markets, within the economy, that we often forget about the long term. We forget about what actually matters, right? Um, and the short term garbage raccoonification of markets is ultimately really net harmful um, and can tie back to that idea of expectations, theory, and reality. Um, so the data that we look at, so going back to that, the slides about the jobs report, inflation, et cetera, the, da the data that we look at isn't always representative of the reality that we exist in. I'm sure all of us have seen that, even if it's just like the jobs report, where we have people on Twitter being like, the jobs report isn't real. Um, uh, there's a lot of ways to slice and dice the data that we see, and what's really important is how people feel about it, and the expectations that they ultimately have about it as well. Um, so this next part is going to be about storytelling. Um, so the art of storytelling, and I promise this slide has a point too. I'm sure this is like, like what's it doing at a finance conference? Uh, but there's something in storytelling called ritual banality avoidance. And that's the idea that when you're writing a story, you don't make it really easy on the reader. Like you don't just make two characters fall in love. You have to set the expectations for the reader as they're reading the story. So by the time the two characters do fall in love, they're like, oh, that was, that's, I had to work for that. Like I had to read through that. I had to not make assumptions. You have to create expectations as a writer that then your readers can follow. Um, and markets are storytellers, right? Like we all just lived through the debt ceiling debacle. 
where the debt limit breach begins to worry investors. But when you think about the debt limit itself, right, like the debt ceiling, for however you feel about it, it's ultimately a story. <laughs> uh, it's not something that necessarily needs to exist. It's, it's creating expectations, it's creating the storyline, it's creating this narrative that ultimately we all have to prescribe to. And when you look at this, this is credit default swaps, right? Um, that's a story. That's a storyline that the market is telling people about this debt limit breach and the worries that, that investors are having. Um, and then I want to like zoom out a little bit here. So we're talking about the markets, we're talking about the economy, and I think it's really important to zoom out to the meta level. Uh, what stories are we telling as a capital S society? So this is a tweet about the Super Mario Bros. movie. It was like a huge, huge hit, um, but it was based in nostalgia, right? Like it was based in this revision to the past. Uh, and when we, as a society, capital S society, and when we get really stuck in that loop of always repeating the same exact stories, um, in the same movies and doing the same things all the time, we have stagnation. It becomes really difficult to progress. And going back to that idea of expectations, theory, and reality, expectations become stagnant, and th therefore we sort of become stagnant. So it's really important to tell good stories. Um, and going back to debt ceiling too, it's all super important to tell good stories about what we're doing. Um, and the reason that Super Mario Bros and the idea of nostalgia is so valuable is because our attention is really valuable. We're very expensive. Our eyeballs are very expensive. Uh, ads are a big deal. And our eyeballs are commodities. Um, and a lot of the things that we end up paying attention to ends up being monetized distraction, right? Um, so when we think about nostalgia in Super Mario Bros, it's a lot easier to repeat those things rather than trying to come up with new and innovative things. Um, and I, this gets into the next aspect of hope and just storytelling in general, expectations, theory, and reality. Um, there's doomerism. So when we think about our eyeballs being commodities, it's very, very profitable to tell people bad things, <laughs> to make people afraid. Because if you're like, hey, the world's going to end, subscribe to my newsletter, people are going to do that. Uh, and there's this concept of doomerism that I think is just fascinating. I'm sure all of you have seen, run into it where people are telling you the world is going to end. It's this big combination of entertainment and brain stuff, uh, right? Like our brains love <laughs> being afraid. It's just how we're built. And then community, um, you know, people are seeking out leaders. People are seeking out community. We're, you know, we're lonely on, on net net. And then there's aspects of nihilism to that too. And then right on the screen, I have things that are bad, right? Like there are elements of doomerism that are completely warranted. But then on screen, I also have things that are in green that are good. Um, so with doomerism, it's this really tough balance. And the important thing to remember with it is that our eyeballs are commodities um, and people are trying to set certain expectations to get you to sort of manifest a certain reality. And then the biggest thing to combat doomerism and these, uh, the negativity is to be optimistic, right? Like that sounds so silly and so easy, but it pays more both in money and in life. And we owe it to ourselves and those around us to be optimistic, to be forward looking, to be excited about all the cool things that we get to experience. And that is the easiest way to combat doomerism and to tell better stories. And of course, going back to the very first slide, you know, expectations, theory and reality, we are lonely and we do tell stories that make us lonelier. This is a graph of media sentiment and you can see that the news headlines that we're reading, as I think this is very commonly known, are negative. Um, and the thing that we can do to sort of combat all of this, right, like to combat the negativity and, and headlines, which are almost unavoidable, I mean, look at the sky outside, right? Uh, you, you have to be curious. And I think this article from The Defector is really good where we have you know, billionaires who, it's really cool to go up into outer space, but there's also an element of curiosity that we can begin to encourage on a local level, allowing people to go after their passions. And that goes into the next thing, uh, meaning. Uh, this was a piece in Harper's The Age of the Crisis of Work, where meaning isn't always going to be attached to work, right? Like we have to be able to provide tools to people where they can find meaning outside of their workplace um, because work from home, uh, it, it's all changing. And I think there has to be a way that we allow people to be curious, to have meaning outside of traditional structures as it's always quote unquote been done. Um, and then I think this is just an important thing too, this idea of words versus concepts uh, where a lot of people get confused about a word, uh, they'll get angry at a headline, uh, not maybe understand the underlying concept that is trying to be told and then uh, narrative, so going back to like, just sort of tying everything together, because I know it sounds a little disparate. Um, 
we have to tell better stories because we ultimately are stories. Like humans have forever been sitting around campfires uh, and telling each other stories. And so I think that's just an important thing to remember is that the stories that we tell, the expectations that we set, the theories that we subscribe to end up dri driving the reality that we exist in because we're all a part of the marketplace of ideas. Like this is, uh, I think, super important to remember. You know, existing in the past is easier than engaging in the present. Nostalgia is going to drive us. We all love to like, you know, have memories, but we have to remember that it's important to look forward. Um, we've also commoditized ourselves a certain bit to the point where we are what we consume. And then I think this is important too, we've acetized our feelings to get them value on the sociological marketplace. Um, and this is a, I'm gonna skip this because I'm out of time. <laughs> but this is, I think, the important thing to remember too, uh, the hope function, so sort of tying together this, I guess, wide ranging presentation, the idea of hope, right? Like. Like that is the thing to combat doomerism. That is the thing to tie together expectation theory and reality. And I know that sounds like very uh, like naive, right? To be like, oh, we just need to have more hope. But I think the way that we think about hope is really important too, especially in context of markets, especially in context of the economy, the context of um, society at large, is that hope has to be future facing and we have to tell better stories about what we're looking towards. Um, we have to be endlessly curious and encourage those around us to be curious as well. Um, and realize that like hope is defeatable. It's not going to be this perfect thing and uh, that is A-OK. -okay. Uh, but yeah, so that, uh, this is also a quote I like. I really like quotes. Um, if you read my newsletter, I, I have a bunch of them in there. Uh, so we cannot constrain anyone who is unwilling to follow the new direction of the question. We can only extend the field of the vision of the asker, loosen his prejudices, guide his gaze in a new direction, but all of this can only be achieved only with his consent. So I think that's the other thing too, is like community and realizing that you have to connect to those around you and be curious. But yeah, thank you. <laughs>
you were an independent financial advisor, teacher, came together realizing you could be the bigger of the sum of your parts from a global perspective. Who, whose voices are you raising and to whom? Who are you from the demographics of people who are logging into you, inspiring the most, do you think? Yeah, I think we inspire uh, numerous amounts of people. I mean, I think what's helped us as far as the collaboration part was realizing that we didn't know everything. Mm -hmm. And being humble students of, of a lot of different you know, asset classes. And so one of the things we found was that let's highlight people who are doing things that can help the everyday person, whether it's that your CPA, whether uh, that's your accountant, whether it's your tax professional, whether it's your real estate broker, these people can help you right now. Mm -hmm. And they had a lot of value. And so rather than thinking we can only aspire to be a couple of things, let's make these people so valuable that they become superstars in their own right. And that's helped us along the way, right? And so when we had an opportunity to highlight these people, now they're giving information to us, but they're giving information to a whole community of people who never thought that they would find it. Because one of the things being inside the educational system, you realize, these things aren't taught. Yes. Like, we didn't know how to buy a house when we left high school. No. Right? We didn't know what it was to pay taxes. We didn't even know what it was to fill out a resume. But all these things are valuable in our lives. And so when we had the opportunity to highlight these people and show value to them, then their economy grew. And by their economy growing, ours did as well. Because people saw us as the platform that was highlighting the everyday person. And now that everyday person can be successful in their business as well. With that sort of scale, though, millions of people consuming your content comes great responsibility. And how, I mean, Russia, there's someone who's studied finance, who understands the ways in which you, you know, things need to be factually accurate. How do you check that? How do you ensure that the people that you're hi highlighting, amplifying, don't get carried away with what ultimately was a mean stock frenzy, crypto scams, some of them? Yeah, for sure. I think you have to be, you know, careful is, is the word I like to use. You know, I have a background in finance. He has a background in education. We didn't go to school for media. We, didn't, we don't know how to start a media company. We did it in real time and we've grown tremendously fast. So we're still learning on the fly. So, um, but as you said, you know, when you have a large following, you do have a responsibility. So for us, it's a matter of, you know, using common sense a lot of the times as well, right? So we never pitched a get rich quick scheme. Mm. It's long-term wealth. It's about having discipline. It's about you know being patient. These are principles that we teach. It's not the most sexy as far as you know the headlines are concerned, but it's better to err on the side of caution yeah. as opposed to you know just go with whatever whims is flying on social media. So I think that we have done a good job of doing that and um, educating that and preaching that, and the people that we bring on kind of fit in that mold. And then of course you know as our relationships have grown, it makes it a lot easier to have communication with Mark Cuban and Mike Novogratz and different people like that, you know, that obviously helps because mm. you don't really need to vet, you know, we have Robert Smith on and different things yeah. of that nature. These are people that are already proven in their, in their field. Um, but we would still like to give the up and coming entrepreneurs an opportunity to speak as well. Mm. We never want to shut the door to them because they're important. So these are the people that's really driving the economy and these are the people that the general public needs to see yes. because they have a better chance of becoming them than Mark Cuban. Even though Mark is a great guy, you know, the average person is not going to be Mark Cuban, but they can be, you know, a restaurateur, they can be a CPA, mm -hmm. they can be a real estate investor. So I think it's important that we have a healthy balance of all of those kind of things and the celebrities as well. You know, those, those are always beneficial conversations. Well, to that point, Troy, like, it is sexy what you do. You were just saying it's not <laughs> sexy, but <laughs> when you. you've got Diddy on one side and you've got some, you know, the P Steve Harvey, the interview you do with him. I mean, he sat there with a great, beautiful cigar and backgrounds. <laughs> and you know, how do you ensure that people see this as aspirational without, without ultimately losing their head about what is realistic and what should be seen as aspirational? What should be seen as actually real value? Because you guys have real moral values. And how do you ensure that the cult of celebrity doesn't sort of dumb that down in some way? I think having that mixture, like you said, highlighting that everyday entrepreneur, which it, it becomes something that's attainable, right? Like I can follow these steps, I can follow these blueprints. I think for a long time, we've seen success in our communities mm. and we just kind of saw it happen, but we really didn't have the how to. And I think what we've done is we've created that ladder, right? So if these, there's this level of success that's up here, right? And the common focus here, who is that? bridge in between to get the message across. And so what we were able to do is 
kind of create a language that people could understand and make it very digestible, very high content topics. We're now explaining in a way that it could be understood and not only understood, but people could execute on the information. We always live by the, you know, the slogan, the information is going to be on us, the application is on you. And so when people trusted that the information was good and they used it and they applied it and they saw real returns from it, they came back for more. But not only did they not come back for more, they told a friend. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's about. It's like that's how you build the community. It's like, okay, I have this information. Now what do I do with it? I did something with it. Let me give it to the next person, give it to the next person, give it to the next person. So when you're talking about scaling to 1.3 million, this is the pathway. And it's not from, hey, we got Steve Harvey. Because Steve Harvey's story is incredible. How many Steve Harveys are there, right? How many restaurateurs can there be? How many CPAs can there be, right? How many teachers can there be? How many people who create live events? How many people who create logistics companies can there be? is a, a better percentage of them being in those careers, but it, first they have to see it, right? In order to, to be something, you know, you kind of have to see it first. And so we put it forefront so everybody can see it, but they also have tangible steps to becoming as well. And I think it's also about, it's, it's, Earn Your Leisure is a luxury brand. So when we do things, it's curated completely different than anybody has ever seen in finance. So when we do an event at Art Basel, or we do an event at New York Fashion Week, or we sell out Royal Albert Hall, or we sell out Madison Square Garden, or we're doing events at South by Southwest, and it feels like a musical concert, and it's a vibe, and thousands of people are there. That's important because we want to shake up finance. Mm -hmm. I was a financial advisor for 12 years. I went to all these conferences, and the vast majority of them was boring. So. No offense. Yeah. <laughs> no offense taken. No, that side of the room didn't laugh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's laughing. Okay, go ahead. Not the Bloomberg one. <laughs> we got it going on. We've got yeah. <laughs> the other ones. But, you know, it's important that, you know, we call it edutainment, a mix of education and entertainment. Yeah. You can have fun at the same time. It's important to do it tastefully. We don't want to, you know, water it down and make it, like, really too cheesy, commercial. But um, it was really important for us to kind of curate those moments where it just becomes, like, culturally important. That well, tell us about InvestFest, because... That is the epitome of a cultural moment, right? It, yeah, for sure. Yes. Um, so InvestFest, you know, looking at the landscape, we're big music fans. So music festivals have become extremely popular, right? You got Coachella. You got a lot of these different musical festivals. Um, and I really like the aspect of musical festivals. But it's just entertainment. That's it. So we were saying, well, what if we can take the best parts of a musical festival but have a finance spin on it. So came with InvestFest. So the idea of InvestFest is, is built just like a music festival. You got two different stages, a main stage, a smaller stage. We have a vendor marketplace, which 400 small vendors and big companies there, and there's a DJ, and there's a podcast stage in there. Food trucks lined up outside, uh, like a food truck village inside as well, where we have 20 food trucks. It's in Atlanta and uh, Georgia World Congress Center. So the first year we started, we had 4,500 people. Last year, we had 14,000 people, Steve Harvey, Tyler Perry, a few people, uh, Don Peebles. This year, 20,000 people in Atlanta. So we have Diddy as the headliner. We have Robert Smith, and then Rich Paul, Mike Novogratz, Kathy Wood. So it was just a very unique vibe that we wanted to create where it's a festival type of feel, mm -hmm. but built around education and three days of learning and just make it fun. Yeah. You know, just make it fun. So that was something that I don't think anybody really still to this day has kind of been able to top that. And um, that's an event. You're going to be there this yeah, year. We, so we got a special coming. surprise here. I, yeah. I, I mean, cannot wait for, like, the music element to meet the finance element. But, I, but the fun is important, right? And I just want to – I don't have a magic pole with me, but I just want to get some audience participation. Who, who learned basic financial education at school? One. I mean, that says, <laughs> that says it all, right? Did anyone have it in it? What, you are an educator. Yeah. Why are you now, and I know you're both about to go to a school close to here yeah. to think about sort of the ways in which people are learning. Why wasn't it, why isn't it enough part of the standard education system? That's not always making it fun, but it's certainly making it necessary. Yeah, I mean, it's an age-old question as to why it isn't. And rather than continuously ask the question, we said, let's come up with a solution. Yeah. Right. We can be the solution. And so, again, being inside of that system, you realize what is not being taught. And not, for me personally, it felt complicit. 
I'm being paid and I know that these kids aren't gonna have the things that they need to survive in the future. And so what was the best way to learn, right? I have to reach people where they're at. And mm. one of the things I would tell people is, you know, in order to teach a kid or teach anyone, they have to allow you to be taught, right? So how do I reach them? Well, I knew music was the, the great barrier. It's the language that everybody speaks. Yeah. And so I, we listen to music and try to find pieces of music that I can teach financial lessons from. And so whether it was Beyonce saying, pay me in equity, let me reverse all the debt, there goes a lesson. Let's talk about equity. When, when Jay-Z was telling us, you know, all we had was sports and entertainment, well, let's debunk that. This is now a hypothesis for me. How do we prove it's not? And that led into a lesson to teaching about the wealthiest people uh, on the continent that, that come from Africa and come from our community. So it was like, all right, how many times can I do that? Over and over, I'm finding pieces of, of language inside of music that I can decode. And so that became the relatability. And once that became fun to learn, now kids are hearing music different. But now they're hearing finance different. And so that's when we talk about edutainment. Let's take what, where they're at. Let's take where everybody's at, music. Most people listen to that. Let's find the pieces inside where we can use and teach finance from it and make it something that's really, really entertaining. I think the problem with the education system is that it's failing the vast majority of people. And we're all blessed. Even to be in this room is a blessing. I was a financial advisor, so I used to be in these rooms all the time. But the vast majority of people are not being educated properly when it comes to finance on a variety of different things. So the problem with that is that it's not sustainable for the country because it's like, all right, if we keep neglecting 90% of the population, you're going to start to see a decline happen over the course of time. So either we address the problem or the society is going to suffer mm. because the people at the top can do well, but if the vast majority of the people are not doing well, it's only a matter of time before that catches up with you. But it's a global problem. I wasn't taught financial literacy at school and you're going to app you found that there's communities around the world that need to hear your message yeah i think you're exactly right and that's part of the global expansion right we became popular here in, in america for teaching financial education and, and kind of democratizing it but we've traveled around the world we went to kingston jamaica mm. right? my, my family's from there who's earning your leisure there it didn't exist we went to uh, lagos nigeria same thing we went to cairo egypt same thing We've been to the United Kingdom, and every time we go to places, they're saying, we're listening to what you guys have to say, and we're trying to implement it to what we have. But tax codes are different. Laws are different. Yeah. So who becomes the satellite for the, the, those places that we travel? And we're looking at it like, you know what? This is an opportunity here, right? For the lack of education that has been presented for generations and generations, we now have an opportunity to change that for everybody. Why isn't private sector getting it more? Why, why are finance events, maybe I haven't been to one for a while, Maybe I haven't been to the right one for a while, but why, <laughs> why aren't they cooler? Why aren't they meeting people where they are? It's just a disconnect. The people aren't cool. So it's hard to have a cool event if you're not cool. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, 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 not this room. That. Not <laughs> this room. Respectful. We're here, so this has got to be cool. Super cool. <laughs> Super cool. Super cool. But are they? Just give them benefit of the doubt. Are they getting cooler? <laughs> <laughs> like my Novogratz, you've deemed cool. Like yeah, admittedly, yeah, yeah. he's on this like sort of avant-garde on, 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 on the yeah, Mike, Mike's a tent a on the <laughs> circumference <laughs> of finance with crypto. But, but I think I think you also have to want to be cool, right? Like it's it's purposely done to reach a large. There's group. a market failure. Well, you have to see opportunity in that market as well. So if you don't see the opportunity, then it's not even in your interest to even try. Mm. reach the opportunity but being that nobody really tries to reach that group of people that's an opportunity that we seize and we're starting to see it more certainly social we were just hearing from kayla we've got another uh financial influencer in the house that certainly millennials those like younger are being targeted we've got one minute left i just want to do a quick kind of quick fire on your le what was what was your biggest money mistake for example biggest money mistake uh i was making I think $2,400 a month as a teacher assistant, and I wanted to get a new car, BMW 525. I'll never forget it. <laughs> they probably had it as well. Um, they were like, hey, payments are going to be $590 a month. And I'm thinking to myself, I make it $2,400. Okay, let's do it. Um, and that turned out to be one of my biggest financial mistakes. But I had to learn from it, right? Mm -hmm. Like financing versus leasing, uh, living within your means. All these lessons came from that. So. It was, at the time, I thought it was a great decision. I've learned a lot from that um, based on managing money, like I said, and other issues. Richard, one money aspiration you've got, one thing you wanna? 
you're excited about in terms of investing right now? Um, I'm most excited about investing. Or building in your company. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a good question. Um, education, I think, is important. So for me, educating myself, but also educating my son and yeah. just watching his growth and watching. What advice, what one piece of advice would you have for your son right now in investing? It's interesting because I don't really give him too much advice, but he just watches me. So I'm, I'm watching him talk to his cousin, and he's like, well, I own Tesla. And she's like, who are you talking about? You own Tesla. And he's like, <laughs> he's like I have stock in Tesla, so I'm an owner of Tesla. So, it's, you know, I didn't have that conversation when I was a kid. Yeah. So he's picking it. He's understanding it. So that's exciting for me to just see, like, you know, him. He's not bragging about his clothes. He's bragging about owning stock. You know, so what, what kid is really doing that? So I think that, you know, me just kind of just learning myself and educating him at the same time, I feel like, you know, that's something that I'm extremely excited about. Guys, thanks for giving us a healthy dose of humble <laughs> pie. <laughs> we love it. We love what you're building. Thank you very much indeed. Pro Millings. Please welcome to the stage J.P. Morgan's Global Head of Mergers and Acquisitions, Anu Ayegar, and Freshfield's Partner and Co-Head of U.S. Corporate and M&A, Ethan Klingsberg, with Bloomberg's Ed Hammond. Hello, everybody. Uh, Anu, Ethan, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I think I've done four or five of these kind of panels over the years at Bloomberg, and this is the first one where I can get up here and honestly say it's not a good M&A market. It's, <laughs> a, uh, it's, it's a tough time. It's a tough time to feel optimistic about it, but I think we're going to try and get to some of that uh, in this discussion. But look, lots of things holding back M&A at the moment, lots of things that have proved to be quite significant headwinds uh, for the last sort of nine, to, nine months to a year. Regulation is, for me, the most interesting piece of that. So, Anu, I'll start with you. We're in this environment now where you have a ton of regulation, a ton of fairly novel regulation that companies are grappling with as it relates to M&A. Are you seeing anything to make you feel that clients are getting better at navigating that or getting more comfortable with the environment as it stands? Yeah, you're right. This is a tough market, so you need people with courage. And uh, you need people with experience through cycles. Um, because that is what most uh, clients are looking for to say, this is a new environment, whether that is regulation or any aspect of it. And how is it that we deal with something that we don't know? How do we deal with the unknown? And that's a little bit of what the regulatory environment is, is dealing with the unknown. So it used to be that uh, you would ask a law firm and they would come into the boardroom and you'd say, well, what are the chances of this deal getting approved? And now the approach is no longer that. It's a bit more saying, what makes strategic sense for us? We know that whatever is the path that you pursue will have regulatory hurdles. And so how is it that we prepare for that? So that, that itself is a shift in approach. And so how do you prepare? You gotta think about one, when you go knocking on the door of the counterparty, one of the questions they're gonna ask is how much work have you done? Why should I believe that you can get this deal to the finish line? And so if you're the one who's doing the knocking, then prepare. If you're one on the receiving end, know how to ask the right questions. And the next part of it is, how do you actually negotiate a contract with enough flexibility for you to run the company for the very long, unpredictable time period between signing and closing? How do you protect your franchise such that if the deal does not close, you don't have the empty shell of a company. And if you are a buyer, how much are you willing to litigate? Because the level of litigation, I'm sure Ethan will talk about it, has increased about four times. And so it's uh, some of the traditional things we talked about, hello high water, or there's a high enough break fee so that you feel good about that. Some of those are no longer enough. Right. And instead, what you need is real commitment from both parties to say, we're going to fight it. 
and we're going to play to win. Ethan, from where you stand, <coughs> is that is that the case that companies are basically, as they go into transactions, assuming we are going to have to fight the FTC or we are going to have to fight the DOJ? And that being the case, what does it mean for the way they think about the deal? Does it change the price? Does it change the way they assume they're going to be able to absorb the asset? You know, a couple of years ago, boards would have been quite uh, freaked out by the idea that all of a sudden they, you're telling you have to litigate against maybe multiple governments right. in order to get the deal through. Uh, at this point, as Anu says, that's part of the game. If you're going to be in the M&A game and that's the way you're going to improve your company in a non-organic way, that's, that's part of the playbook. And so I spend <laughs> just as much time as an M&A lawyer with my antitrust litigators as I do with my merger clearance guys who are the guys who file the documents. And often I'm sending the antitrust litigators to the meetings with the regulators as opposed to sending just the merger clearance folks. So yeah, that's a big part of the strategy now. It's a brave new world where you have yeah. to show up to a pitch meeting with your antitrust litigators to convince companies that it's time to dance. But look, a, bi a big sort of part of the regulator's ambition here, at least when I think about the FTC and the CMA, similarly in the UK, is they want to stop people thinking about deals by actually having this chilling effect. And right. it seems to be working. I mean, isn't this exactly what they were supposed to do? They slow down M&A because they make people think, actually, we just can't be bothered with the fight. Well, on the one hand, I think there's been a real, the game has been upped on the side of the merging parties. It is true there's a number of deals that no one knows about because they're not happening. But when companies see a deal that really is going to be critical to their strategic rationale going forward, the game has been up. And the idea, there's been a whole wave of deals I've worked on where we've done what we call fix it first. So we don't even wait for the suggestion. We just go in, sometimes even before we make a filing, and divest problematic assets. There's been uh, a wave of situations where we coordinate with uh, the way we're handling it with CMA, where we don't also we don't give timing uh, agreements as much anymore, because there used to be this thing where oh you're talking to the agency, <coughs> and they say well just give us a timing agreement and extend the process out more, and maybe we'll reach a uh, understanding on how to get this done. They've advertised the heads of the the antitrust heads at the U.S. agencies have said we're not interested in. We don't want to understand. We don't want a settlement. They don't want settlements. They think that they don't work. So why do, should we give timing agreements? So that if you can do that, that goes to Anu's point. It, once you get rid of timing agreements, you accelerate the time between signing and closing, yep. and you can get right to the heart of it and get to an Article Three judge, many of whom don't view antitrust laws the same ways as the current occupants of the US agencies. And then there's also, you have to play in Europe as well. And you have to play this whole triangulation of the commission, CMA, and the US agencies off each other. So when I think about uh, you know, regulation and, and indeed the other things that are sort of addling the, the M&A market generally, I think it's a perfect time for private equity. They have <coughs> vast amounts of unspent capital, you have um, low valuations, which obviously they talked about for years as being the thing they wanted to see before they came into the market. Yet we haven't seen the wave of LBOs I think a lot of us expected. And Anu, I'll ask you about it first. Like, why is that? What is? What are you hearing from private equity clients in terms of what's going to tip them over and get them into the market in a meaningful way? Yeah. So the private equity, the dry powder available is more than two trillion. That's the amount of money available to deploy and buy assets. But what is it that you need? You need the availability of assets. You need the seller to have the right view and value. You need financing. You need to have a path to exit. I need to have courage of conviction. And these five things are all shaky. <laughs> so one, the assets that are proactively coming to market, not very high. I was talking to a bunch of private equity uh, people in, uh, at, a, at a round table, and each one was giving statistics of the number of deals that they have seen quarter by quarter. Mm -hmm. And um, this past three months is probably one of the lowest pipeline of deals proactively coming to them. So firstly, availability is not there. Second, value expectations, there continues to be a mismatch. You're talking about the public equity market valuations have, but 
give me a company who's happy with their stock price. Right. So you have to have a seller who is willing to sell at a price so that it continues to be a meaningful valuation mismatch. It sometimes can be bridged with creative structuring, but not always. Mm -hmm. Debt financing is more expensive, available for the deals that are happening, but yes, more expensive, that, that affects the calculus on valuation. When you think about exit, you have two challenges. How do you know what is the equity market valuation that you're gonna exit at? And second, if you're thinking about a strategic deal, the regulatory environment, right, right. which we just talked about, the bar has gotten higher, yeah. right? So I can't bet on either option or I'm putting a whole bunch of risk adjustment. And I'd say the biggest thing is courage of conviction. To, um, and there is this just, uh, you know, we often say m and is a confidence game as much as anything else. And so when people don't feel confident, they just do less m and That goes for public company boards as well as investment committees. So what needs to change for that to happen? I think the uh, better assets coming to market, which we are beginning to see, mm -hmm. equity markets showing some robustness, and generally having a bit more certainty and confidence. So psychologically, I think the debt ceiling getting through it helps. Having some clarity on interest rates, I think, helps. So more number of uncertainty that you take out, you have more courage. But Ethan, doesn't that drive it away from the private equity buyers? Because as those things start to line up again, we're going to see valuations go back up, which means it's right. going to be harder for the sponsors to play in the, certainly in the public markets. I mean, private market valuations are more sticky and so have come down less anyway. Um, but yeah, that, that, it just seems interesting. Like, why wait? Why, you have all this money to spend. You do have the availability of financing. I, I mean, the direct lenders are constantly telling you they're, they're there yeah. and they have money and they want to do stuff. So it's, it's You have about a dozen guys or so who are contrarian and who are actually investing a lot. And yeah. I think these will be some of the best deals because right. this is a buyer's market. And I think if you have a strategic who has money or a sponsor who has money. And conviction. And if you don't do a deal in 23, I think you're going to kick yourself. Yeah, it is. I think one of the key ingredients for having trouble, though, is on the debt financing side, because that really is the special sauce of private equity, <coughs> and that is expensive. If you're using the direct lenders, it's frankly exhausting. When we uh, represented Coupa in the sale there, I mean, we had 23 pri uh, direct lenders come together. Uh, they don't step up the way you do with you know two or three commercial banks and it, it's hard it's uncertain you don't know that they're there till the end uh, you know and then you have things where we're, we're a number of deals where we're having extraordinary equity checks being written uh, like in the Qualtrics deal 12 and a half billion for all equity so I think the pure on the equity side it's a little bit commoditized but building out that rest of the capital structure I think still has a lot of challenges and it's expensive. If, the, if it becomes a little more certain, there's more banks involved and the bond market can be available, the high yield bond market, then the banks will become more involved and it, it, everything will start to flow a lot better, uh, I believe. There's still a lot of companies that have had tremendous stock shifts in the last several months and those guys are, as far as we know the gap on valuation, I think time is not on their side. Right. And time is on the side of private equity, right? So those companies are ripe for sales. And a lot of them, the reason their stock price has gone down is simply they're spending a lot of money on R&D, a lot of money on marketing, and they're gonna have to for the next four or five years. And then they'll go get to a point where I think their margins will be able to expand. So that could be a very, that works very nicely for the private equity formula. I think we're gonna see a lot more private equity take privates in the next six months uh, based on those kind of companies that have nice cash flow, a lot of them software type companies uh, that have nice cash flow and just need to get through a period before their margins are gonna expand. And a period that's probably better out of the glare of. Yeah, better out of the glare. Mm -hmm. Away from the, the way activists. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the IPO market has obviously also been fairly challenged through this period. I know I wonder if there are sort of decent targets that companies can look at that are pre-IPO, mm -hmm. maybe like to be out there in the public market, need some kind of financing, but just can't get there because there's just not the appetite. 
No, I think those are all good hunting grounds for, for deals, right? So like I said, if you're a buyer, you should be looking at every place uh, and trying to find uh, negotiated deals. The company is about 400 plus companies went public in 2021, but are not fully exited, right? So you still have a controlling shareholder and the stock price is meaningfully. There's 300 plus DSPAC transactions. Some of them are really good companies <coughs> and are trading at a deep discount. Some of them are bankrupt. <laughs> yeah, some <laughs> of them are. A lot of them are not really good companies. Yeah, uh, <laughs> companies which are waiting to IPO. Um, and now you see, again, beginning of conversations in, uh, in all these pockets, but still, I'd say, largely domestic. Right. Cross-border is uh, still very muted. So one kind of transaction that was rife really through the last few years and does seem to still be happening is the corporate clarity deals where you're seeing companies instead of doing whole company transactions spinning off a division breaking themselves up into multiple divisions and, and being standalone in the public markets it, shareholders don't seem to like it they didn't love it before they still don't seem to love it now i wonder why clients still see this as a sort of a useful thing to be doing with the uh, the business i think I, i'm not sure shareholders don't like it i think the sh uh, stock price of the company that announced the corporate clarity transaction has not re-rated up the same way it has in the past. So usually there is on average a 5% or so a share price increase. Sometimes it's a lot more than that. In the more recent time, you haven't seen that. But it's a hard thing to figure out because the entire market is down. Right. So if you had not done that, I mean, you can do a lot of corporate finance brain damage to try to f figure out what the right answer is. But the driver of why a, a company thinks about it, because focus, um, having the right shareholder base for each part of your business, being able to use your currency for transaction, having the right equity research for that company, and separating higher growth businesses from lower growth businesses. Those theses still seem to hold. And another big driver of it is frankly, I feel like we keep going back to your first question, regulation is because mm -hmm. you could take one of these pieces and maybe in 2021 or whatever, we'd have sold them. Yep. But now you're like, you know, I'm gonna spin it because I don't know whether, I don't you know don't how long it's gonna. two years fighting regulators just to sell it. Instead, at least I'll spend two years doing something where I control my own destiny. Yep. I mean, part, part of the problem is we're separating low growth from growth. A lot of the growth companies or just aren't getting yeah. any much bang for their buck. And so it's not necessarily that there's not still logic in doing the separation. It's just it's not hyper logical. Right. <laughs> I mean, it used to be because the difference in multiples is not as great. I think there's more excitement. And I, this is, I think, for the next half of the year, we're going to see more, I think, mergers of equals, where we have stock combinations, including cross-border, I think, because it's just there's a logic to those deals where you have synergies. Uh, I think you know you have to be thoughtful about regulatory. I was going to say synergies is the word regulators hate right now because they uh, say, well, then there must be a reason you're getting together because it's going to squeeze other competitors. Yeah, but you can find some complementary ones, and also, as I said, you got to be ready to go to war from the get-go. And so those are deals, you know, especially when you don't feel like there's a great uh, runway over the next seven, eight, ten months. You know, like, why don't we do something for the shareholders? You know, so half the board may have to step down, and we don't know what's going to happen to management. But there are great ways to deliver value to shareholders, and I, I think there's been enough stagnation that there's a there's going to be a push to do those kind of deals. Because the big driver is still the need for scale. Right. Yeah. Right. Because with that money, because uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know why synergies has become a bad word because you do actually have to invest a ton in a company to address your supply chain concerns. Yeah. You have to invest to digitize at a pace that you never thought you would have to. Where is that gonna come from, right? It's not like cash flows and growth are gangbusters. So, and so those benefits of scale are there. So I, I completely agree with Ethan that I think the combination of equity markets where both the stock valuations are challenged where debt is more expensive. I mean, this is a case study for why you should do MOEs. Yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe we'll get some big ones in the second half of the year. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so just before we end, I want to turn to activism, which, you know, 
from where I sit, and maybe this is unfair, but it seems like it's gotten a, a little less interesting. <laughs> Um, or, 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 or activists look a little less smart when the market isn't going up and up and up. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, we're seeing some campaigns, um, not particularly novel ideas, but with some success nonetheless. And what are activists doing when they're getting on the boards of companies? What are they able to do that is in any way different from what the existing boards are doing as it relates to m and <laughs> breakups, anything that, you know, is, as we've just been talking about, is challenging in this market? I mean, uh, for the... When you're not at the mega caps, you know, their home run is to put the company in play, right? So they try and do that. No company wants to, nobody wants to buy a company brokered by uh, some activist hedge fund, but they're trying to put the company in play. Sometimes they have operational ideas, almost always they're, sometimes they're decent ideas, but the guys on the inside have such an informational advantage that they usually have already thought that through, and sometimes they're go rowing in the same direction. A lot of times I have to get clients over the hump of saying, let's give the guy some credit. Who cares? It's the good idea that we were thinking about doing anyway. And then at the, at the large caps, as we've seen, there's been this big push for cost cutting. Okay, brilliant idea. Uh, but they've, you know, that's, uh, that, that's really where the game is. So it's cost cutting, some operational ideas, which are usually not super well informed, and then I see trying to put, put companies in play who, uh, who could be candidates for sales, especially a private equity. Um, it's not, I don't think they're really, I, I think there's mostly, my clients are thinking like activists anyway for the last five years, and they're, so they're not waiting for the activists to get on the board to think this stuff through, and they're mostly, uh, there's a whole, been a whole sea change uh, really on this, and so, you know, the, 12 celebrity activists are not the only ones who have ideas about uh, how to move these uh, valuations up. Yeah, I think we have a twin things. Activism has become an asset class like many other asset managers with more than 100 billion plus AUM. So that has totally changed the dynamics of that. They, that whole asset class doesn't think similarly, doesn't act similarly, doesn't have the same motivations. Right. On the other side, the bigger change I think is the boards in corporate America have changed dramatically in the last decades. And so it is no longer easy to, because the boards are pretty smart. Right. And they're very actively engaged. They, there's real kind of check and balance uh, at most places. And so I think the combination of the two is, um, it's not that easy to make money as an activist. Nice note to end on, <laughs> Anu, Ethan. Thank you so much for the conversation. And thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>TV and Bloomberg Radio. I've been looking forward to the interviewing John for a couple of weeks now. And uh, actually, um, John, you've proven to be a very popular guest. I've had so many people write in with questions uh, and some comments. So hopefully I can do them justice today. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago on Bloomberg Television um, and BNN uh, with my buddy John Ehrlichman. And you made news in that discussion because of your interest in emerging markets. You've been focused on that now for a couple of years. Um, and uh, not just in broader Asia, but particularly in, in China, India, and Brazil. And I asked you if that uh, would change at all. Um, it's become a very political issue. And uh, your, your comment was that, no, you're there uh, because you see a future in, in those investments and in that market. Um, tell us how important it is to you and, and what kind of size we're talking about. Yeah, and uh, we do continue to invest in emerging markets and just for people's benefit. So CPP Investments is a pension plan based in Canada. We have around 570 billion of, of assets under management. And we made the decision years ago that it was important to be a global investor. That you know the Canadian economy is, is not that big. And we knew that we were gonna have a sizable amount of capital to deploy and we needed to build the relationship 
key infrastructure to invest in the biggest economies in the world. Started out in the US and Europe and started to build our capabilities into the emerging markets and focusing on the bigger emerging markets, China, India, and uh, Brazil and some other Latin American countries. And built up now, I think about 20% of the portfolio into emerging markets, which is where we're very comfortable uh, where we are. But you know, it's certainly gotten more complicated and it's certainly gotten more complicated and the world's changed over the past five years. And we do believe it's important to continue to invest in China. We have a 9% of the portfolio uh, in China and just have a view that as a global investor, um, we need to understand the world's second largest economy. We need to um, understand the role that, that the second largest economy has. Um, and so we've kind of made the decision that we still need to be uh, investing in China. But we spent a lot of time thinking about how to do it. And well, I just, we've seen others, British Columbia Investment Management said it was halting direct investments in China. Ontario Teachers Pension Plan cited regulatory changes um, in China for its decision to pause private asset deals in that country. So others, um, you know, in Canada, uh, not just, you know, uh, American investors are pulling out. What gives you the conviction to stay? Yeah, and, and what gives us the conviction is that it, it is a big market. Um, it does present interesting opportunities. We actually have a pretty good track record of investing in, in, in China. But I'll get back to the how. I mean, the how is really important. And we spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about how to do it. And that portfolio is really built asset by asset, thinking about what assets we want exposure to, what companies we want exposure to, what sectors you want exposure to, and making sure we're comfortable with uh, every asset that we have uh, in the portfolio. Our portfolio is predominantly public markets. Um, we do have some private, we have some real estate, some private equity, but it is predominantly public. And the teams continue to look. Um, and the other question we ask ourselves all the time is how much? And at the end of the day, we're a global investor. We need to get paid for the risk. If the risk change, changes, we need to get a better return. And so we're always asking ourselves, are we getting compensated for the risk? And if we're not, then we'll, we'll adjust our portfolio. It's interesting, uh, the majority of your portfolio is public, but um, when I was looking into CPP and, and, and researching your career, um, a lot of, there were a lot of comments about how private investments and specifically private credit was the future as to where retirement savings, um, it, the investment process for retirement savings needs to go. Uh, and I actually, you know, in the last six months, I've heard more about private credit than I have in the previous 20 years in my career here at Bloomberg. It's really exploded. Um, are you still as focused on private credit as you were you know, before you took over at, at the top job at CPP? Yeah, I used to run our, our credit department. So obviously, I'm very constructive on, uh, on credit. And I agree. I mean, just the, the world is right now really excited about uh, private credit. And I don't want to throw cold water on it, but the world is very excited. And, and I've heard more about private credit and, and had more inbounds from other institutional investors on private credit and how we're thinking about private credit. Uh, we're the majority owner of Antares, which is a US-based direct lender. So you know, a lot of exposure into- Big one. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's been a fantastic uh, investment and a lot of exposure into, into the sector. Um, but there's a lot of money in private credit right now. And look at the, the activity and talking to the teams. There are opportunities. But a lot of the historical opportunities in private credit were sponsor opportunities. And we really haven't seen the M&A activity come back to where it was. So when an opportunity does come to market, there's a fair amount of capital that'll, that'll move in, um, and chase it. And I anticipate that you know, we'll start to see the M&A market get more active um, when you actually start to see probably credit get a little bit more affordable. I mean, I, I'm not just not sure the model works when the debt stack costs over 10%. And in time, we will need the broadly syndicated loan market to come back. We'll need the high yield market to come back. There'll be plenty of room for the private credit. But I think in the steady state, that's really where you need to be is have both the public credit and the private credit markets uh, functioning. But you're not as interested in it right now. I mean, when I've talked to people over the last couple weeks, I say, hey, I'm interviewing John Graham. Th they were like, oh, you should ask him, you know, when private credit is going to get unstuck, right? Because for at least a year now, um, we've been in a situation where 
sellers aren't willing to let go of assets at the prices. I, it, it's a very opaque market. There's not really a secondary market. So um, are you not as interested now as, as you yeah. were in your previous job? <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're still interested for yeah. sure. And, and it's really what's the opportunity set and what are the opportunities in the market? And there are opportunities for sure. Um, our bread and butter at CVP Investments was the sponsor market and really helping and investing in the, the actual uh, transactions. And that, there's, that just hasn't been as active. And part of it is, again, if the debt stack is too expensive, there's not gonna be a huge amount of, of uh, transactions. Now there's another part of the market of more special situations or transitional capital or rescue capital or, um, and that, you know, that certainly people are, are interested in that. Um, it, it hasn't historically been a big focus for us. We've been more in the, in the sponsor side. Um, and I just say there that you know, that's not a place that you wanna probably be a tourist in if to get into really the, the special situation side. I mean, that's a very, there's some very capable funds out there and um, we'd probably look to partner with them. How do you see the, the rate situation right now? Um, you know, when I came in this morning to plan for my one o'clock, I do a program with, with BNN. Um, and we were expecting the Bank of Canada to be on hold and my producers were saying, you know, this is a good story because the Bank of Canada is one of the few central banks that seems to precede the Fed. Everybody else is a follower. So when they came out with a surprise hike, you know, the markets went haywire. I looked over the 10 year and it was up 13 basis points, the US 10 year, right? Yeah. Um, what do you make of the rate situation in particular from, from the Canadian perspective after what happened this morning? I've been of the view that the central banks are gonna get inflation back to target and, and do not want to almost tame inflation, that they wanna tame inflation. And in Canada, we had inflation coming down and then essentially stalling out. <coughs> and TIFF and the Bank of Canada decided that they needed to, to hike rates again. Um, so in, in, in some ways, I think it's actually consistent with what they've been saying, that they're, they're, they will get inflation back to, back to target. The markets seem to, well, the markets for a long time didn't seem to believe central banks, and I still, if you look at the WERP function on the Bloomberg, uh, we're pricing in, I think, two cuts before the end of the year for the Fed. Um, even though Jerome Powell comes out time and time again and almost explicitly says, we're not gonna cut rates this year. Why do you, yeah. think, why do you think a market that, you know, don't fight the Fed is one of the oldest adages in investment, and yet everyone's fighting the Fed this year? And when I talk to other investors, other institutional investors, and, and you ask for their view on, on rates, and what I hear, consistently is we think rates will be higher for longer. But that's not what the market actually says is happening, right? That they think there'll be a cut. Um, so there's definitely a disconnect in what people are saying and what the markets are pricing in. Our portfolio, we actually have viewed it that rates will be higher for longer. And as a long-term uh, institutional investor and thinking about returns over the long run, we're actually comfortable with where rates are today. It was a painful path to get here, but with um, positive real rates, we're in a better place right now. I was gonna ask you about that. So, I mean, um, you're in, a, in an incredibly important position for the people of Canada. You know, you have, how many people have their retirement savings with you? Yeah, 21 million. 21 million. So you've got to generate returns, yeah. which has been uh, very difficult without going out on the risk spectrum until, until recently. Are you in a much better position now? Well, I would say <laughs> this is, it's, it's a good question. And like many people, you know, I, I would think we view that returns over the next 10 years will, will probably be subdued compared to the past 10, 20 years. And, but I think where we are today is a little bit better than where we were a year ago. Um, but we have you know, positive real rates, we have nominal rates higher. We're in, a, we're in a better place today than we were a year ago. Well, but in, in the past couple, few years, you've had to take risks to yeah. generate returns. And now you have more risk-free return than you had in the last decade. Yeah, yield, you? you have yield, right? You yeah. Yield in, in government bonds, which we haven't had for a while. And I think about the past 20 years and we had just so many tailwinds into the markets, right? We had really the secular decline in rates. We had globalization, um, pretty benign inflation, really benign geopolitical environment, really all constructive and putting a lot of tailwinds into risk assets and across the board, right, into risk assets. We sit here today and rates are higher. Um, the geopolitical environment is, is no longer benign. Inflation is, is not something that uh, people are ignoring. 
and look at anticipated growth rates over the next few years. And, and growth can hide a lot of sins in the economy and look at growth rates over the next three, four years. So you think about, as an investor, um, how are you gonna drive returns over the next five, 10 years? So how will you? Yeah, <laughs> the, well, that's why I'm here. It's <laughs> the, uh, the really a few things that we're focused on. One is diversification. We've spent the last 10 years building out our capabilities across asset classes and uh, geographies and continue to believe in the value of diversification. Important to have our capital invested in different countries around the world and in different asset classes around the world. We are also an active investor. And we have um, built the organization uh, to outperform the passive alternative as uh, pension plans do. And so every dollar we spend is trying to drive alpha into the portfolio. And I say alpha will not walk in the front door. You have to actually go find it. And so right now we expect kind of the beta returns to be a little bit lower than they have been historically. And it's really gonna come down to um, alpha and, and trying to add alpha into the portfolio. There's certain places though you're not willing to go. I mean, we talked about emerging markets and uh, I can't remember who coined the term BRICS, Jim O'Neill I think, right? But there was an R mm. in that term. And you're about to be the I and the C when you look internationally. Yes, yeah. You don't invest in Russia, even before the invasion of Ukraine. Why Correct. was that? Yeah, we, uh, we'd made the decision about 10 years ago that uh, we wouldn't invest in Russia. And we wouldn't invest in Russia from a governance perspective. And we weren't making a big statement other than it's a big world. We have limited resources. And we're going to prioritize other large countries. So we didn't uh, do direct investments in Russia. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, we had no direct investments in Russia to, to deal with in the portfolio, which was you know, a, a great place to be. And sometimes the best decisions you make are what you decide not to do. And the other kind of pitfall we avoided last year was, was crypto. And we spent a tremendous amount of time trying to understand crypto. Um, we had a lot of our colleagues who were really enthusiastic, but we'd never taken that leap of doing direct investments in, in crypto, which I think saved us a, a, lot of, a lot of time through the back half of last year. Um, even though you had the legal ETFs to do it. You know? It's funny to me what you're allowed to do in Canada that you're not allowed to do in America. I think about <laughs> weed, I think about crypto, um, <clears throat> but we won't uh, talk about that. The, the interesting thing is that uh, you, you didn't go into Russia, and I would think that it's a, it was a value judgment. Um, not in terms of valuations, but in terms of ethical values, right? It, was, it, was it all related to you know, the lack of the rule of law, the problems uh, the, in investing in a country that had you know, annexed Crimea already? Yeah, and this was long before that. I mean, we're talking 10 years ago, um, before the, the annex of Crimea. And it, it certainly was through a governance lens. You know, and, and I know ESG is a very politicized term, but it was that's certainly was through going. a, yeah, I, know, I, I figured that's where you're going. It was certainly through a, uh, a governance lens of, um, you know, from a risk adjusted return, we're just not gonna get compensated for the risks here. And plus again, you know, we saw better opportunities in other places. So, um, you know, this morning when I came in, we had a bunch of protesters outside. Uh, it was kind of an ESG thing. They were angry that TIA, I think, uh, owns fossil fuel assets. How do you, how do you uh, look at ESG, which there's been an amazing backlash on this side of the border um, over the last year, but it was, it seemed like something that was gonna drive the investment environment, it still may, yeah. um, in the years pre preceding that. It's been interesting to watch, and it's been interesting to watch the, the backlash, and maybe I'll just share a little bit about CBP Investments on that we were created, and we were actually created through an act of parliament but there's, people often ask me, what are, what's the secret to your success? And I think the organization's been very successful. We have a 10% return over 10 years, so 10% CAGR, and the portfolio is 570 billion. And the two components that I think are most, uh, the two key uh, kind of contributors to our success is first, we have political independence. We have no government involvement in our investment decision making. We operate completely independent of, of governments. And two, we have a single fiduciary mandate. We are there to maximize return without undue risk of loss, taking into account the factors that impact the plan. And we do it in the best interest of the 21 million Canadian contributors and beneficiaries. We are there to contribute to financial security and retirement at a time when people may be in their most vulnerable part of their life. And that, that's what we're there to do. Um, and as we think about 
the return of the portfolio. Um, we do think non-financial considerations such as ESG actually drive value. Uh, governance, right? We should invest in companies that have board of directors. That's, there, there's, we think on the S side, companies that respect human rights, respect um, you know, the environment. Uh, e, I think there's actually a tremendous uh, investment opportunity as the economy tries to transition to net zero. And we've looked at e ESG and said, based on who we are, what we're trying to accomplish, let's calibrate this to who we are. And so I think most investors incorporate ESG into their investment decision making. We certainly do, but we calibrate it for who we are and what we're solving for. Um, we don't buy a product. And I think it's very hard to buy a product called ESG, but we certainly embed it into how we make decisions. Let me finally ask you about the CAGR that you, you mentioned. I was looking over the numbers and um, in a lot of quarters you were much higher that I was tracking, 11, 11.3%. Mm. Um, is this decade going to be worse, you think, than the last decade? Are, they gonna, are those numbers going to be lower? It's a, the, and, and that's what I was alluding to earlier. I mean, I think we, we certainly benefited um, over the past 10 years from some of these secular tailwinds. And as, as we look, we still see you know, interesting opportunity. But I think our, we, we would expect our, the returns over the next decade to get back to more longer term um, averages. We think probably the last decade was actually a little bit above average. All right, John, thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. John Graham from the CPP. Thanks, thanks so much. I'm just going to do some closing remarks here. Appreciate you all joining us here at, at Bloomberg Invest. Um, the program, of course, continues tomorrow, as I'm sure you know. And I want to thank all of our speakers, our moderators, for the, the program that we've had today, which has been really amazing. I want to thank also our sponsors, U.S. presenting sponsor, sponsor Invesco, QQQ. Actually, I looked over the last five years, 10 years, and 15 years, the Qs have outperformed every single growth fund manager that, that we track, and we track them all. Our presenting sponsors, Allspring Global Investment, uh, Neom Principal Asset Management, and our participating sponsors, Southern Company, uh, as well as the Glen Rothis Single Malt Scotch. And this is what I'm pretty excited about um, for making this event possible. If you want more information about our sponsors, you can uh, click the resources tab on the event uh, website. And we're not done yet. We hope that you can join us in person or virtually for another day of uh, Bloomberg Invest. Where's the camera there? Um, we have a great lineup tomorrow. Goldman Sachs, John Waldron's going to join, join us. Universe's Nassim Taleb and TCW's CEO, Katie Koch. And for those of you who are with us in person, you can join us for uh, networking, refreshments, and light bites uh, outside these doors. Proudly sponsored by the Glen, Ro Glen Rothis Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. The Glen Rothis has been producing some of Speyside's finest single malt Scotch Whiskey for more than a century. And today, you will have the opportunity, I saw them pouring some snifters out there, uh, to try their winner of the best Scotch in 2020's Ultimate Spirits Challenge as you exit the room. And by the way, if you have registered to attend the Odd Lots live taping uh, tonight, proudly sponsored by the Principal Asset, Man by Principal Asset Management this evening, please make sure that you arrive downtown no later than 6 45 p.m. because they're going to close the doors promptly at 7 p.m. Joe and Tracy are not going to allow anyone in after that. So if you have any questions, please uh, make your way to the principal asset management's branded column outside these doors and uh, someone from Bloomberg will assist. Thank you very much and uh, breathe well. <laughs> <laughs>